Chapter One of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Virginia Neville. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedeker. Book One At the Pythian Festival. Chapter One Dryas Wins the Prize. Dryas, the young Delphian, finished his song. As he did so, he leaped impulsively to the sheer edge of the temple platform, leaning forward in the very attitude of the archer god. The song was to Apollo. For a moment, he seemed to be the young Apollo himself. The final note was scarce heard for the surge of applause which met it. The people pelted the boy with flowers, snatched off their own garlands to throw to him until he stood ankle deep in the bloom. He was blushing, shy, now that his song was finished. Awestruck, too, for he heard everywhere the shout, The prize! The prize! Thus ended the first day of the Pythian festival at Delphi. The crowds poured down through the precinct, a very tumult of color and motion. White-robed priests, purple-cloaked kings, sybarites in cloth of gold, young athletes beautiful as the sunlight in which they moved, and upon every man's head, rich or poor, his crown of flowers. How freely they talked, how happily gave themselves to laughter. The truce of God was upon them, that peace which Apollo imposed upon the passionate, warring Greeks at festival time. Delphi itself, forbidding among its beetling cliffs, seemed to lose sternness at this festival. Out on the far-seen hillsides were the booths and bright-colored tents of the visitors, the flash and glitter of things brought for sale. Even yet, crowds of pilgrims were arriving, swarming up the steep winding roads as the bees were fabled of old to have swarmed thither to build the first temple in Delphi. Dryas, his father, Nicander, and his brother, Lycophron, came down through the stirring precinct, perhaps the happiest hearts of all the multitude. The prize at Delphi. It was an immortal honor. The noblest poets of Greece would write hymns in his praise. Dryas's whole town would bask in the honor of it. Dryas's statue in bronze would be set up near the precinct gate, and in future years his sons and sons' sons would recount the victory. Neighbors, kinsfolk, strangers halted them on their homeward way. No man in Hellas was too exalted to pause in humility and delight to greet the young victor with the crown yet fresh upon his head. But it was to the father, Nicander, rather than to Dryas, that they addressed themselves, lingering to catch if it were but a reflection of the surprised joy in that father face. Nicander walked holding his boy's hand or touching his shoulder as he presented him to some famous man. You liked it, he would say, his sensitive face flushing almost as dry as his own. You liked the song? Yes, I too enjoyed it, that stern opening, that Dorian mode. It was as new in my hearing as in yours. The dear lad kept it so. Andreas's answering look showed the father's praise to be the most precious of all. It was no usual affection which bound these two together. And now Pindar, the greatest poet, met them, outstretching both his hands. Nicander, Dryas, Kairos, bless you both. You are tasting the heady joy of victory. Eating victory, rather, put in the elder brother, Lycophron, with a rough laugh. Feasting on it in courses, I should say. At his father's hurt look, he stopped and laid his hand upon the father's shoulder. Tut, he said, I meant no harm. Then he turned to the poet. Pindar, I hope you are coming to us tonight, speaking of feasts, a symposium in Dryas's honor. Pindar frowned at the young man's forwardness, but assented, then smiled again as he turned to Dryas. It was almost as good as your father's victor song years ago. Oh, better, much better, urged Nicander. At which Pindar moved onward, laughing, shaking his head. A lovable man, Pindar. They arrived finally at their own door. All the slaves were there bowing and curtsying, Medon, the old pedagogue, at their head. 
He peered up eagerly to see if the boy really wore the laurel crown, and, at sight of it, trembled visibly with joy. Little Dryas, little Dryas, he crooned, all love. Nicander must needs stop to rehearse all his happiness to the old servant, and who so glad to hear as Medon. All Dryas's songs have been good, Nicander finished. But, oh, this one today is in a new class. Do you know what the rascal did, Medon? Brought out an utterly new poem, different from any I ever heard. Imagine my amazement when he started out, and my delight. Yes, master, yes, assented Medon. As they talked, they had been moving slowly through the Andron and now entered the women's court. Melantho, the mother, hearing them enter, came running down the stair to fold her son in her arms. Balte, the old nurse, hobbled up. Nerea, Clito, and other slave girls came and kissed the hem of his robe. But Nicander missed one member of the household. Where is Eleutheria? he asked. Then he caught sight of her standing in the far corner of the court. His daughter, tall, delicately flushed with that air between shyness and pride which is common to all new flowering things. Daughter, said Nicander, we have come home with the crown. She bowed her dark head, fingering her distaff with its tangled threads. Come, my dear, said Nicander, snapping his fingers to hasten her. Come, greet your brother Victor. Then she looked up a face full of some strange, startling emotion. No, she half whispered. No? What on earth do you mean? I cannot, she spoke sharply. I cannot praise him. You are ill, said Nicander, going to her. Indeed, he feared some fever had deprived her of her wits. No, I am not ill. Then what madness is this? What nonsense! Nicander could hardly believe in this sudden quarrel darkening the brightness of his day of joy. Dryas crossed over to her. He was ever the peacemaker. What has happened, Theria? he began gently. Her great eyes looked fearfully at him. You know perfectly well what has happened. How dare you ask? Nicander was now thoroughly angry. Theria, he said, Greet your brother at once or go to your room. Your whims are unbearable. Theria began Dryas again, but at his urging voice her anger took flame. I won't praise you, she cried wildly. You know the song is mine, mine. I made it myself. Great gods, laughed Lycophron. Here's a pother for you. No pother at all, spoke Dryas quickly. Who'll believe her? Nobody, nobody, my son, sounded Nicander's deep voice. Now, Theria, go. I shall punish you myself for this. Here, Melantho lifted horrified hands. What jealousy, Theria! Shame on you! Shame! Theria had already reached the stairfoot, but at this word she faced them again. I am not jealous. I can prove that I made it, she said, her voice suddenly clear. I can sing my song. As at sacrilege, Nicander answered. Indeed, you will do no such thing. Do you suppose I would allow that perfect creation to be caricatured by you? Father, she heard me sing it, thus Dryas, pale with the hurt Theria had given. She has a perfect memory. My dear boy, do you suppose the matter needs argument? Oh, let her try. Why not? came the heavy voice of Lycophron. Then we can finish the scene with a good laugh anyway. You will not laugh at me, cried out Theria. By Hermes, you will not laugh. The look in her face, suddenly visionary and unafraid, found response in an unexpected quarter. Oh, let her try, Lycophron spoke in a different tone. Give the poor child a chance. Surely you need no proof, said the father. 
Be damned if I don't, responded the elder brother. Then have your proof. It will need few moments. Nicander swiftly took the lyre from Dryas's slave and gave it into Theria's hand. The girl received it with an almost hungry eagerness, as though the song within her burned for expression. Every vestige of anger died from her. Something from within seemed to sweep her up into a mobile erectness, holding her delicately steady as a flame is held aloft. She struck a deep chord from the lyre upon her hip and sang. To their astonishment, it was not Dryas's song, though haunted ever and again with bits of the Dryas melody. She tossed the melody from grave to gay with ease, and in the changes swayed softly. Wherefore, O muse, dipping from highest heaven, down through the ambient air, comest thou to me in my thick-walled shadowy chamber, to lay on my lips the honey of sweet song. I am a woman, a spinner. Not for such is the glory of singing. Not for such the happiness free in the sunshine of Pythian contests in song. In answer, the muse, inexorable goddess, drew with yet stronger chords my will and my spirit. Sing, she commanded, sing. At this point, the rhythm, with an increasing purposeful tread, marched into the very tune of Dryas. The ancient story of Apollo slaying the python snake and winning the place of the oracle from which to speak to men. The song was greatly enhanced by its prelude. Fair, fair, on the mountains, the feet of Apollo striding. Swift is our god and stern. Dark. Dark in the valley, the snake coiling and sliding, lone mid the Delphic fern. Ha, old dragoness, dost thou possess it? Oracle meet for the voice of a god? Nay, for our archer god comes to redress it. Already are trod the dear paths of Delphi by feet mysterious, divine. Apollo, we shall be thine. Coils of the python lie over the place of Loxias' grace. The heartening word is choked in the depth unheard. Dark, dark is Delphi, dark is the dell. There in the murk the birds of ill omen softly, horribly fly, and like waters of hell, Castile streams from her gorge and is lost in Castile's well. That gleam in the gorge, that glint in Phadriades' cleft. Like a golden spool in the weft, like a golden bird which flits among solemn crags of the ghostly place. Before the god cometh, cometh his grace. Ha! Flash of silver bright as a bolt from the sky, a piercing cry, and straight to the heart of the monster the arrows of Loxias fly. Writhe, O monster, lifting on high, now thou must die. And now from Castile's gorge, like the beauty of day, steppeth the god with bow bent broad to the fray, drawing with lifted arm the shaft to the tip. Paean, Paean the pure, Thou art here, thou art sure, immortally tall, fair tressed, crowned with bay. God of the far-born voice, so dost thou capture with valiance the place of thy choice, Delphi murmuring golden. Hail to thee, God of day. To the end she sang it not with Dryas's sensitive handling, but with a dramatic power, possessive, from within, making it inalienably her own. Then she seemed to waken. She looked around. Her father stood with bowed head and hidden face. Melantho was weeping. Lycophron motioned a slave to shut the door lest someone come upon them, and Dryas sat gazing at the ground with an expression of misery and defeat which scattered the last vestige of Theria's creative joy. 
Suddenly, she would have given worlds not to have sung. All kept silence as if they were all guilty. And like a guilty thing, Theria gave the lyre back to the slave and went up the stair. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Virginia Neville. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedeker. Chapter two. Parental Justice. Theria was gone, yet in the room the awkward silence held. Then, by some hidden sympathy, Nicander's hand beckoned to Dryas, and Dryas himself started forward at the same moment. I wanted, faltered Dryas, oh, I wanted you to be proud. I would have been proud anyway, said Nicander loyally. Dryas began to sob. "'Son, why did you deceive me? There was no need. I would never have told the judges.' "'I don't care for the judges. It was you, you!' With sorrowful affection, Nicander kissed him, then went slowly up the stair to Theria's room. He found her pacing up and down the narrow place. She was talking aloud. "'To take away my song! It wasn't fair!' No, to take away my song. Nicander spoke passionately. Theria, this was the happiest day of my life, and you have made it the most sorrowful. Father, she cried. Father. She stood instantly still. Tears were running down her face. Oh, I was sorry the minute I had done it. There was no use to tell, and it only gave pain to everyone. Wistfully, she tried to take his hand. Like most children, she had never told him how intensely she loved him. I cannot understand, Theria, why you would give your song to Dryas and then, at a crucial moment, snatch it back again. Dryas has done wrong, but your wrong is sheer cruelty. But, father, she began. Then she stopped. She had done enough harm for one day. She could not tell him that she had never given the song, but that Dryas had taken it against her will. Dryas had come to her one morning with a song of his own. Theria knew at once that it would never win the prize. They had talked it over, trying to mend it. That afternoon, her own song had flashed upon her. It was, as such flashes are apt to be, the culmination of long striving and dreaming and for days afterward she had worked and perfected it. Then, a week before the Pythian festival, she had taken the song to Dryas and had sung it for him. Of course, she was willing to give it to him. It did not occur to her but that Dryas would share with her the honor of it, at least in their own home. This Dryas had refused to do. They had quarreled, and, at the end, Dryas had flatly told her that since she taught him the song, he would take it for his own, whether she willed or no. He had thought she would never dare to tell, but now she had told, and the result was this misery. Theria, said her father wearily, how did it ever occur to you to write a song? It was just as I told in the singing, father. I was spinning alone in the spinning room, and the muse struck across my mind. She would not let me go. The words hurried before I could catch up with them. A new chord waited for every chord I struck. Nicander was for a moment awed. He believed in the muse. No mere poetic figment was she. She was an accepted goddess, and even thus was she wont to act. But you must have studied and worked, he said. You must have had help. Medon has helped me a little. He taught me the scales, and I have taken your book rolls and made him show me how to read. Do not be angry with Medon. He is only a slave, and I commanded him. It was really myself did it. I worked very hard. Suddenly it seemed to her that some invisible door, which ever for her, a girl, had always stood ajar, had quietly and irrevocably closed. 
She had the instinct to turn this way and that for escape, but there was no escape. What shall I do? she moaned. Oh, what shall I do? It seemed as though her father, so intelligent, so quick to help all comers to the oracle, surely he would know some help for her. My dear Theria, said Nicander, there is much for you to do here at home. You have everything. Why are you unhappy? She bowed her head without answer. There was so much to say that she could say nothing at all. Theria, he went on kindly. I must tell you that only yesterday, by your mother's advice, I did something for you. I see now how necessary it was. Her lips parted as if in fear. I have offered you in marriage, said Nicander, to Timon for his eldest son, Theris. Timon has accepted. I am delighted with the alliance, and I shall have the betrothal very soon. With a low cry, the girl crouched upon the floor, clasping his knees. Oh, no, father, no, she pleaded. You are not so angry with me as that. Don't send me away. Don't send me away. He took her hands gently and lifted her, put his arm about her pitifully trembling shoulders. What a strange child. What a strange, foolish child. All maidens look forward to marriage. It is their right. But not I, father, not I. You must do so. Of course it will be strange at first. Brides are often timid, but you are not lacking in courage. Theria, your constant dwelling upon thoughts which are for men makes you cold toward what is your business in life, which is marriage and childbearing. You are mature in things not for you, and in all the rest an undeveloped child. This brutal statement was a nearer reading of Theria's character than Nicander himself guessed. An unevenness of development was hers, a kind of mental hobbledehoy which is not infrequent in high-bred youngsters. Nay, more than this, an actual shrinking purity was the concomitant of her poetic gift. Other girls of Delphi discussed the facts of marriage with primitive frankness and looked forward to marriage as the one event to break monotony. Theria never spoke of it and thought of it almost with horror. The strange house, the strange man, the mysteries from which she hid her eyes. Shall we add to this terrific pride of youth that she held it a certainty that no family equaled the Nicanders? To mate even with another Delphian was a downward step. This pride was in her stubborn answer. Father, I cannot. I cannot. Nonsense, smiled Nicander. Of course you will. He is a good man, Timon's son. Have I seen him? Daughter, of course you have not. She wrung her hands in sudden wildness. I won't marry, she cried. I won't go away from the house I love to one I have never known. I won't belong to Theris, whom I have never seen. I will only belong to you, you, you. Theria, my dear child, began Nicander, but she was quite beside herself. She stamped the floor with her foot. I won't marry Theris. I won't. I won't, she raged. At the end of the interview, Nicander brought out a small whip, which was used for child slaves. With this, he whipped his daughter. Greek fathers had this right, even with grown sons, but Nicander had never used it. At last, when she stood tall and tearless, and he stood trembling in spite of effort to keep steady, he said, Daughter, this is not for your present act alone. It is for your year-long disobedience. I believe now that you will obey. She stood like a straight reed, so still, so horror-struck. And in that stillness, her father left her. An hour later, Theria was roused from her apathy by the sound of beautiful music. It was in the street, and she curiously stole forward to her father's room to look out of the little window there. She was in time to see Dryas borne along the way on the shoulders of his friends. The full moon of the festival made the street as bright as day, and the torches of the procession twinkled like jewels in the white light. 
Pindar walked in the procession, chanting a strophe in Dryas's honor. A chorus of youths followed, singing the antistrophe, and behind these a boy played the cymbals, upon which the glitter of sound met the lovely glitter of the moonlight. Leaning out of the window, Theria suddenly exulted. It is my song Pindar is praising. All those words are for me, and it is Pindar, Pindar. In a burst of joyous music, they passed within the house door below her, and Theria heard the pleasant confusion as they took their seats at the board and the scurry of the slaves beginning to serve them. Then, after a time, came a faint tuning of a lyre, a pause, and Dryas started once more to sing his song, her song. He faltered. Oh, would her rumpus of the afternoon make him fail? She was in a panic. Family pride, family affection were strong in the Nicander household. But after a little flickering, Dryas's flame burned bright. He even imitated his sister's dramatic singing of the afternoon. Theria could not hear Pindar's exclamation of wonder that the lad should sing the song this evening with an entirely new meaning. She heard only the hand clappings, the mingled voices, the chitter of the silver cups, cups treasured many a year by successive Nicander housewives. A wave of loneliness swept over her, a wave of fear, remembering her father's purpose. And shrinking back from the window, she made her way through the darkness to her room and bed. End of chapter 2「a slender, vivid, flashing little girl, whom yet the rich traditions of her line filled to the brim with dreams. Such had been Theria in her childhood. The town in which she was born had not grown haphazard, had not been founded for trade nor for its nearness to some natural wealth. Its central life was the god, the god of light and of enlightenment, of beauty and judicial fairness. Apollo was its source of happiness and its livelihood as well. He molded the daily life. The focus of all Delphi was the shrine where, from a windy cleft beneath the temple, Apollo spoke, answering the wistful questions of men. And of such an idealizing force, it is true that while it affects the community as a whole, it gives to certain individuals a heaped-up gift— such a gift was upon this child, peculiar to her in Nicander's house. Delphi had imprinted that expression on her baby face, that unmistakable look of spiritual life which had been the life of her father's for at least four hundred years. So many traditions, so many prides, upliftings, adventures, poetries, and faiths entering into the heart of a little girl. Nicander's sons were just hardy, playful Greek boys. Theria was a Delphian. One spring morning, when all Delphi was joyous with an awakening sky and earth, it happened that Theria was seven years old. She came tripping down the stairway of the inner court, fresh washed from the hands of her nurse, fresh dressed in a single garment which did not reach her knees. Now be good. The old nurse had admonished her as she gave the last touch to her dark curls. Your twin brother is playing that sweet down in the ola. Don't you go down now and stir him up with your mischievous ways. And here in the court, sure enough, Dryas was playing that sweet. He had made a circle of pebbles and stones and was marching around and around it chanting some childish made-up thing perfectly absorbed, unseen. Sunbeams slanted across the court, leaving him in a sort of magic, refracted light, 
Small rain pools here and there among the warm pavement flags gave back the blue or wrinkled suddenly from the unseen breeze. In the corner, the old, old tiny altar, upon which many generations of Nicanders had sacrificed, breathed yet the smoke of the morning rite. The place smelt sweet of wood smoke. Now Theria was aware of a shadow moving across the court, and looking up saw an eagle swoop down the sunlit air. In after years, Theria, a woman and far away, was to recall this scene cut clear and deep by the love she bore her home. But now she tripped recklessly down the unbalustered stair and scattered Dryas's circle of stones with her foot. Let's play, she announced. Am playing threshing floor, responded Dryas, breathless from circling. You don't play threshing floor now, that's past. The threshing floor was an ancient circular platform in the precinct of Apollo. Every four years, a sacred drama of the python snake was performed upon it, and this year little Dryas had seen it. I tell you, said the disturbing Theria, you fetch more stones, we'll make the village and the road that goes by to the oracle. The oracle was the treasury of beauty and wonder in all Hellas. But to Delphic children, it was just a dear bright place within high walls and the scene of their holidays. Dryas did not answer, but he stopped his play and trotted off toward the outer room, which led to the front door for the pebbles. Theria waited impatiently while he brought in skirtful after skirtful of stones. Then she began to make her village, a stone for each well-known house a line of little stones to show the road which passed their own door and ran windingly along the mountain slope. Theria set her miniature precinct in the sunny part of the court. To her, the sunlight always and inevitably rested on that temple place, where fane after fane and shrine after shrine mounted the hillside up to the matchless Apollo temple itself, set like a jewel of red, and peacock blue and gold against the shining cliffs. The sacred way, murmured Drius happily as he made the path between the temples. Here it turns, and oh, here's the sparkly stone for the Thenian treasury. The Nidian treasury, corrected Theria. It's the Nidian treasury at the turn. No, Thenian. No, don't you remember the pretty marble ladies who hold up the porch? Still Dryas maintained his Athenian treasury. Shoo, you've never been there, he said, and I've been there lots of times. I go every day, announced the little girl. At this evident whopper, Dryas's rosy mouth fell open in dismay. Never have you been there. You are only a girl. I go there every day, repeated Theria. Quarrel was eminent, was averted only by Dryas scrambling to his feet to seek old Menden as judge. Never mind, Menden, I'll show you how I go. And taking her twin brother's hand with an air of great bestowing, Theria led him up the stairs and forward to her father's bedchamber, to its one window. Out this she leaned so far that only her chubby legs remained within. Sure enough, so leaning she could see beyond the shoulder of a cliff a spur of farther hill, and there, in a bath of light, the golden tip-edge of a little temple, and on a higher level a single pillar bearing the sphinx of lofty wings. I see it every day, she announced again, only a little piece said Dryas contemptuously. When I see that I see all, repeated the child enthusiast, Menden has told me all. Dryas opened his lips to answer, but thought better of it. There he was a most determined little person when once she had made up her mind. They went back to the aula. Here ruin met them. Balte, the old nurse, was sweeping up their shrine of Apollo in great indignation. Whatever made you litter up the aula like this, she complained. 
rubble, and rubbish when the rain washed all so clean last night. Never ye mind, I'll be rid of one of ye after today. Dryas did not notice this speech, but Theria looked up in alarm. Which one? she asked. Never ye mind, there, I should not have spoken. Why shouldn't you spoken? Such caution was unusual in Balte. The threat sounded real. Theria caught Balte's skirt. Is something going to happen? There, don't you worry, darling. It won't be you, said the old nurse as she hurried away. Dryas had rescued enough stones to recommence his threshing floor. To tell truth, he had preferred this all along. Theria sat beside him watching his play. The something was not going to happen to herself. Then surely it would happen to Dryas. Her heart began to yearn over her brother with that frightened tenderness which children know. She leaned over and kissed him. Dryas wiped off the kiss in frank disgust. Don't, he said. She remembered the eagle. There was no bird so sure of omen as an eagle. Dryas, she said softly, I'll tell you a story now. No, please. Yet Theria lingered. Dreadful it was that she could do nothing for her brother when the eagle would soon be carrying him away. I wish you would let me, she said faintly. I'll give you all my honey cake at noon, if you will. To such a bribe, Dryas consented, squatting down in a chubby heap beside his pebbles. It's about baby Hermes, Theria began. First he was born, and when he was three hours old, he got out of his cradle and walked straight up Parnassus Mountain to the very top. He couldn't, objected her auditor. But God legs is strong. Priestess got a baby three months old, and it can't walk yet. It's worse than a puppy. Priestess is a slave. Slave's legs is different. But even a god, he couldn't do it. And though Theria knew her story was correct, she did not press the point. And little Hermes found some cows, she went on. Oh, beautiful wild cows with sharpy, sharp horns. All the cows were white and were eating white flowers that grow in the meadows up against the sky. Clouds, suggested Dryas. Yes, clouds were their food, went on Theria, who knew the tale by rote. For they were the herd of Apollo, and the little baby called the cows, and they left their white flowers and came. For who can resist the call of a god? And Hermes, swift of foot, three hours old foot, interposed Dryas, leaped down the path, and all the cows they followed him. And when he came to the deep forest, he sacrificed the cows to his father Zeus, and the smoke went up through the trees to heaven and smelt very sweet. Then Hermes found a tortoise, and out of the tortoise and the cow's pretty horns, he made a lyre. Oh, the first, first lyre that was ever made. And the baby Hermes began to play on the lyre. Twink, twink, twinky, twink, twink. Oh, God music, as pretty as father plays or Pindar when he... Here, here, came an unexpected voice. It's very well to compare Pindar to Hermes, but your father is another matter. The children scrambled to their feet with faces of delight. It was rare to see their father at this hour, and father always brought gaiety. End of section three. Chapter four of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Eleutheria looks out of a window. Nicander was a tall, slender man, a remarkable uniting of sensitiveness and force. Twelve generations of his forebears had been priests of Delphi, statesmen of wide outlook and ministers to the souls of men. 
Nicander was a resultant type. He sat down on a stone bench, lifting Dryas to his knee, but Theria crept into the hollow of his arm. Her fears took flight like scattered birds. No harm could come to Dryas now that her father was there. And what day, think you, is this? he asked. Birthdays were not so important in those days, and the children did not know. It is Dryas's birthday, he told them. Then my birthday, too, exclaimed Theria, for though she was taller and seemed older than her brother, she was his twin. Yes, yours, too. Quite unconscious of his act, Nicander bent and kissed the little girl. So bending, his face was the mature model for her own. And because it is the seventh birthday, it is to be the first day of school. Mendon will take you, Dryas. He will be pedagogue. And here's your little lyre. Father bought it today of the old lyre maker. See what a pretty picture is here beneath the strings. And for you, my daughter, what you have wanted so long. He drew from behind the bench the ropes and seat of a swing. But I wanted a lyre, too, said Theria with wide, blank eyes. A lyre for a little girl. Oh, no, kitten. Besides, did you not ask for a swing? But, oh, father, it is the lyre I want. Theria must not be envious, said her father seriously. That would be a new fault in my little girl. But her wide, astonished eyes disturbed him and again he kissed the child before he hurried out. Dryas, with little cluckings of delight, plucked at his toy. But Theria stood very still. Since she was to have no lyre, was it also true that she was not to go to school? She seemed in the presence of a calamity which had been approaching since all the days she had been alive, and now was come. With the vagueness of her seven years, yet very deeply, she knew that not going to school meant the parting of the ways between her and Dryas, the closing away from her of precious things. Yet strangely enough, in her surface, childish self, she did not believe it at all. Father had not said she could not go. Besides, she had always got what she wanted if she persisted. She knew from her big brother, Lycophron, what the school was like a room or portico up near the precinct, the master teaching Homer all the day long, wonderful stories which one could not forget, boys playing their lyres merrily, then hanging them upon the wall to go out and leap and race in contest in the sunshine. Lycophron had gone to school since the beginning of the world. Theria did not associate Balte's warning with this matter at all. I go to school today, she began to say softly to herself, that I must hurry. With a certain anxiety, she crossed the court to Lycophron's room. Yes, there on the chest were his extra stylus and tablets, and hanging on the wall a small lyre, which, in a temper, he had broken. Theria climbed the chest and got it, and in possession of these things, confidence came to her. She was perfectly sure now that she should go to school. She began to hum briskly to herself. She went back into the court to be near Dryas, lest when Medin came he forget her. Dryas was prancing about, hugging his lyre. He was not slow to taunt her. I, I'm going to school. You can't go, you can't go. I can. Father said I could. I heard him. When did he say it? I don't know when, but I heard him. Daughter, you are going to school. You are seven years old. Everybody goes to school then. He didn't give you the lyre. He gave it to me, Glory Dryas. I've a lyre too, foolish one. She held it out. I, what a broken thing. It's like a Franz. It's none of yours. If I had a lyre, I'd play it, not hug it, retorted Theria. Here Medin came to the aula with sandals on. To Theri it was a thunderclap. She watched him steadily as he crossed to them, then with loving gesture slipped her hand into his. 
But, said the slave, my darling is not going today. It's Dryas who must go, poor Dryas. Oh, no, you didn't understand, she reasoned with him. Father wants me to go. She pushed back her curls with a nervous little gesture and looked brightly up at him. Medin dreaded a battle with Theria. The child had a storm-like temper. To be sure, it broke seldom, but it was always on some bright day like this and nearly always had to do with going out of the house, a privilege rare for little girls. Most girls did not expect to go out. Theria always expected it, like a boy, and fought for it like a boy, too. Something told him she was going to fight now. He must do his best. Midden will buy you a hoop in the market, a hoop, mind you, with bells, if you will be good. I don't want that. How tight she held his hand and how black were the childish eyes gazing up at him. I'll tell you, Medin, you can give the hoop to Dryas. School will be hard for Dryas. It's going to be so easy for me. But my dear little mistress, you cannot go. There are no girls at the school. Medin felt the hand tighten sharply in his. The child was looking off at a distance. Then, with complete change, she slipped her hand out of his. Yes, you and Dries go, she said. She ran quickly up the stair to the woman's apartments, no doubt to cry alone, and Medin, seizing his opportunity, fairly fled with his charge from the house. Medin carried the little boy's lyre, and very peacefully they walked along the road toward the precinct. They had gone some distance when Medin heard running steps behind him, and turning, saw to his amazement, Theria as if on wings, her black hair streaming behind, her chubby arms clasping a lyre. I'm going, she cried. I will, I will. And then it was that Medin had to carry back along the road a strange, wild creature that fought and kicked and bit and clutched at his hair. The neighbors, hearing the cries, ran out of their houses and shook their heads at Nicander's terrible child. Poor Medin was like to drop into the earth for shame. Yet amid all the tumult, he kept thinking of a mountain stream which had been dammed back but which one day broke through and rushed away, a mighty flood. Nicander's alarmed family, wife, slaves, and all, met them at the door. Now for what do the gods punish me, cried poor Melantho, that I should have such a child? Look at her eyes. She is beside herself. Balte, hold her. But as Medin set down the little ranging tumult, old Balte let her escape. Up the stairs she flew, her voice like a clarion. Leave her be, dear mistress, pleaded wise old Balte. Remember, she is a twin child, and it does grieve her sore to be separate from her twin. In the farthest room of the house, Theria found refuge and slammed the door. Here she threw herself face downward and beat the floor with her fists. Yes, and kicked, too, as her childish grief surged to and fro within her. Her strength spent itself at last, and she fell to sobbing, suffering now as she had not done amid the curious enjoyment of loud woe. Her thoughts now were not of the school nor of Dryas, but of her father, the strange horror that her father should have done this and not seemed to care. Always before this had he mended hurts, not made them. Facing this mystery, her dearest faith tottered. Yet after a while, even this dread grew faint. Thoughts faded into fancies. Then she fell asleep. She must have slept a long while, for she awoke strangely quiet. Her refuge place was a storeroom. Chests stood about, full of things used only at festivals. There were also great earthen jars of grain and wine. The room was stone-floored, stone-walled, but its far end was hewn into a native rock. The Candor's house, standing on a side hill, was two-storied in front, but here at the back melted to the roof in the hillside. This room had a little low window, the only other window in the house besides that in Nicander's room. 
To this window, the little girl crept and leaned her two elbows on the ledge, her chin in her hands. The window showed her only the side lane which led up between the houses to lose itself in the hill above. This lane was wider than most of the lanes in Delphi, for it had been chosen by one of the mountain streams for a bed, and now in the springtime the foaming waters dashed downward between the house walls beside the footpath. There was no sound in the lane save the happy speaking of the waters. An amber light lay over all, as if the sun were setting, and in this rich light everything stood distinct, ferns, rocks, and the tiny flowers on the mossy roof of Cousin Fano's house across the lane. Every little wave, as it lifted in the stream, turned golden, and as it dived under again seemed to peep at Theria and laugh. Presently a child came down from the upper hills into the lane, what could so small a child have been doing up there alone in that wilderness of crags? But what a lovely child he was, what brave erect little shoulders and rounded legs, and what a mischievous dream-haunted face. How fearlessly he leaped along. He was only a baby. Oh, why should he not leap? Wings were on his heels, and two golden wings in his cap. Hermes, and no other. To Theria, it was not strange that Hermes should thus stroll down Nicander's lane. Not strange, but it made her very glad. Now the dear Hermes child paused by the stream, laid his tortoise lyre to his arm, and began to play. Theria had never heard such music. It was clear like the amber light, and filled her with a joy that was to glisten softly down all her years. Yet it was very faint, that music. She had to strain her ears to hear. Presently, under its rhythm, the stream grew more turbulent. The waves dashed higher and turned to foaming white. And suddenly, from each white wave where it tossed in swift succession, there swam out into the air nymphs white as the foam, slender as flowers, immortally fair. Theria knew it was right for them to come. Nymphs were always the nursemaids of infant gods. Little Hermes must not wander alone, god though he be. How delicately they kissed him, bending over him, then rising, circling up and away as if carried by the breeze. Hermes was safe now no matter how rough the way. Suddenly a step sounded in the lane, clump, clump, coming nearer. The nymphs and Hermes stopped still, listing as hares do in the path. Then instantly, thus poised, they vanished. Lentils, good lentils, who buy? came the call of Laba, the market woman, so tired with her day's work, tramping home to her poor scrabby farm in the hills. Theria watched her. Poor Laba, she could not see the gods. Laba climbed the hill and was lost to view. Theria looked again. Yes, at once, as though bursting out of invisible pods, they came again. And with them, the music so elfin clear. The nymphs formed a circle and dance, with feet which did not touch the rocks, around their baby god. Sometimes they circled above the stream, sometimes swept near under Theria's very window. So they danced and danced. Balte, searching anxiously through the house for her nursling, found her at length in the far shadowy room. She was sitting by the window, her head resting on the window ledge over which was strewn loose her night-dark hair. She was sound asleep. And I only wish, said Balte afterward to Medin, you could have seen the smile on her face. You wouldn't have thought this very morning she was like a whole crew of maenads. End of chapter 4「
Fortunate was it, then, that the house was rich in memories. Rich otherwise it was not. No earnest Greek beautified his own house when he could beautify instead the house and temple of his deathless gods. So the walls of Nicander's house were of plain stucco, its floors warm flags. To be sure the furniture, handed down from olden days, was beautiful. The bedsteads were chastely carved, their coverings were of homemade purple, and Melantho's chair, in which she sat to spin, was of exquisite shape and balance. The tables in the men's orla, where Nicander feasted his guests, were of teak wood brought from afar by some travelled merchant to the Pythian feast. The vases in every room and put to all possible uses were of a grace and workmanship which only the Greeks knew. They were of the ordinary make, which every one afforded, from the Delphi pottery below the hill. Upon them were painted pictures of the heroes and the gods, Theria's charming picture books which sometimes told whole stories. The plain old house had been built upon, lived in, and loved by a dozen generations of Nicanders. It had absorbed within itself the beauty of their daily life, and seemed to give it forth again, a sort of fragrance to be sensed the moment you crossed the threshold. The Nicanders were one of those quiet families of exceeding excellence and high-mindedness which always exist in great numbers in the background of an age of genius. Time had harmonized the house. The lines of wall and ceiling were no longer plumb and level. The grey stucco had been stained lavender, yellow, faint rose by lichen growths. No threshold in the house but was worn deep by the tread of feet now passed beyond. In front of the little altar to Hestia, the stone floor was hollowed like a bowl, where father and son, father and son, had stood to offer reverent sacrifice to the goddess of the hearth. In this atmosphere, Theria had been born, and in it her spirit grew, keeping itself alive within the straightened prescribed round. But through the house were also wafted deep draughts of life from the oracle, that mysterious shrine which seems to us like some myth, but which to the Greek was business real. The manner of divination at Delphi was peculiar in that it gave the priests an opportunity to mould a divine answer without at the same time losing faith in its divineness. The priestess, or pythoness, was a simple girl comprehending nothing of the knowledge which she must impart. In preparation for the day of oracle, she was subjected to three days of rite. She fasted, drank of the sacred spring, walked through laurel smoke, and with her perfect faith in these rites, she must often have been in the ecstatic state before mounting the tripod. Then in the shadowy aditum, beneath the temple, she was placed upon the golden tripod, the high perilous seat as it was called. The cold wind blew out of the cleft below her, and in ecstasy she spoke words she knew not. It is undoubted that in her state of suspended consciousness she often reflected, as in a mirror, the knowledge and judgments of the priests. Her marvellous answers often filled priests and questioners alike with awe. The priests afterwards were allowed to recast the answers into verse and to remould them, but in spite of the liberty which they occasionally felt obliged to use in the recasting, the priests sincerely believed that the responses were genuinely from the god. It was this mingling of faith and liberty which gave Delphi her power, a power which was for the most part grandly used. At the dawn of Hellas, from this eerie mountain glen, the authority began to be exercised. It continued down through all the glory of Hellas, and for centuries after her decline. Strong and real indeed must have been the religious impetus which could outlast the race. This was the oracle which Theria's kin had served with singleness of heart. Her father, Nicander, served it now. Priest, yes, but priest in the joyous free fashion of the Greek. In performance of his priestly duties to the oracle, Nicander had travelled far, studying the coasts of the Aegean, Mediterranean, and Euxine seas, wherever lay the colonies of Delphi's founding. He had mingled with the barbarians, or unhellenic peoples, and had even learned some of their languages, a sort of knowledge unknown in Greece. 
in Thrace he had sojourned with the rude tent-dwellers, in Egypt he had visited the stately temples of Isis and Osiris, and had seen the great sphinx which so grimly faced the desert. In Persia he had visited the court of Xerxes, and despised its luxury. He had returned to Delphi broadened and sweetened by his experiences. Among the narrow one-city men of Greece, the Delphian was not provincial. Nicander was a member of that council presided over by Delphi, called Amphictyon, which for hundreds of years had held the only international law that Hellas recognised. The Amphictyony earnestly tried to keep peace between the passionate cities which were its members. Nicander personally had great influence in this council, and used that influence for the constant uplifting of the policy of the oracle. Nicander brought with him into his home the very breath of the oracle. He spent little time at home, but when he did come his children ran to him, for no one could tell such wonder stories as Nicander, stories of shipwreck on savage coasts, of mountains that flamed and smoked, of the great statue Memnon, which stood in Egypt and sang when the sun rose. But for the most part Nicander's tales were tales of Delphi. Delphi was so rich in tradition that Nicander needed never go far afield for his stories. It was from her father that Theria heard of the beautiful coming of her own ancestors to Delphi, men brought by Apollo himself to be his worshippers. They were in a ship on a trading voyage, Nicander would relate. Those ancestors of ours, bold young men, unafraid of the sea, for they were Cretan islanders. When suddenly there leaped out of the waves a dolphin, golden and bright, and lay on their deck. At once the wind changed, speeding them toward the west. They tried to shift their sails, but not one whit could they shift their course. The men were sore afraid, for they knew they were in the hands of God. The dolphin god, Theria would murmur, with wide eyes. Yes, the Delphian, her father made the age-old pun, and they saw the immortal creature shimmer with rainbow colours never ceasing, so the strong wind blew them against their will, first westward, then northward, into our own lovely gulf, and to our port of Crissa. Here the ship stopped, held by immortal hands. Then at once the dolphin disappeared, and in his stead stood a young man, strong and beautiful, with golden locks outsprayed upon the winds and eyes, whose light was as the dawn of day. Theria would clap her hands, softly, saying, And he leaped upon the shore, our dear Apollo, and beckoned the men with his hand. She knew the tale by heart. Nicander would continue smiling, and Apollo, lightly stepping, playing upon his heavenly lyre, led the Cretans hither, right by the place where our house now stands, and up to the place of golden tripods yonder. This is to be yours, he told the Cretans, here shall ye serve my oracle. Then the Cretans looked about him. They saw the sterile cliffs and rocky hillsides on which nothing would grow, and they asked in apprehension, How can we live in this place, O Lord Apollo? There will be no grain grow, no cattle find fodder. Here we cannot fish. The children laughed at this. Fish, O foolish, foolish Cretans! Yes, foolish Cretans, so Apollo called them. Do ye so love to delve in the earth and sweat? Do you so love to be buffeted by salt water and bitter winds? A secret I will tell you. Sit ye here, attend my worship, and all the nations of the earth shall bring you gifts. My altars shall smoke with the fat of lambs, my temples glow with golden things. But your duty shall be to guard my temple and to receive kindly in my name the tribes of men who gather here. But if any of you ill-treat the stranger, if you do violence or speak harsh words, then shall others be your masters and make you slaves for ever. But we will never be slaves, Theria would inquire anxiously. We will never do those wicked deeds and be slaved? No, never. Nicander would kiss the child who cuddled so close in his arms, and then with yet more fondness kiss his son, Gyas. Such was the ennobling tradition which the little girl Theria treasured in her heart, but she knew, too, that the Delphi god had not always been master of his shrine. 
story upon story faith upon faith went back into the misty past where the chaste belief in apollo was underlaid with grotesque stories of gaia mother earth and dragons it was from her nurse balte that she heard these older tales though they were sternly and fearfully believed by all delphinians balte one afternoon found the little girl sitting by nicander's front window gazing outward in silence it was a place of wild prospect the house was one of the few which stood above the main road and so steep was the incline that the roofs across the way seemed but little higher than the road itself Theria could look over them and over the roofs in sharp downward succession into the violet depths of Pleistos Gorge and then up to the fir-clad mountain beyond. A storm of clear-edged cloud was sweeping along the slope with flashes and mutterings. She watched wistfully its swiftness and its strength. Balte came from behind and kissed her. Now and why aren't ye down in the Ola plain with Clite and Neria? It's always I find you by yourself at the window. It isn't right for little girls to be seen from the street. But Theria was full of questions. Balte, what does the glen find when it goes down into the shadows? It always seems to stoop down and down. The river, do you mean, darling? But I can't see the river. I've tried so many days. No, the glen is too deep to see the Pleistos. Balte, did you ever go across the river to the other mountain, far far over where father zeus has driven his clouds no child not i whatever would i be doing there i'd like to go said the child don't ye never do you see that little rift like all black in the mountainside among the firs yes balte well down in that rift is the cave of lamia a woman the upper part of her but all the rest a snake in the olden time she did come hitherward and ravaged the country. What's ravid? Oh, knocking down the houses and eating the folk. So at last, to quiet her, they did take a boy, oh, a nice likely young boy of the village, and leave him for her in that cave. What for? To eat. Every day a boy. By this time Theria's eyes were wide, and she reached furtively and caught Balte's skirt. But then there came the hero, Eurymelos, and he walked right into the cave, he did, and he caught Lamia and pulled her out and cast her down the cliff, and she fell down, down, a-bumping and banging her head all the way, right into the river Pleistos. "'Pie and be praised,' breathed the girl. "'Yes, but them kind don't stay killed,' said Balte uncomfortingly. "'Look at the other one, the python now.' Apollo killed her long since, but every fourth year the sacred boy has to go up there in the precinct and kill her again. But, Balte, that's only a play to make a holy memory to the god. Theria felt sure of this, for not long ago her cousin had been the sacred boy in the play, and she had heard mother say that if Dryas continued to do so well in school, and if he grew graceful and fair, he might some day be the boy of the Strepterian drama. She somehow felt sure that Dryas could not kill a real python. But Balte shook her head. Don't tell me, she said stoutly. You haven't seen her. I have. I've seen the switch of the python's tail and heard her teeth grind the while she dies. And when she is dead, don't they perform all the purifications just as when old mistress died in the house? She's real, I tell you. Theria was more than half convinced. Yet even the python and the boy-eating Lamia did not so strike terror to the childish Theria as did the strange rites which through winter months occupied the Delphians. There were no tales of the past, but rites of Dionysus, which Theria herself could see. In the winter came Dionysus, a powerful god, to take possession of the precinct while Apollo should be away in the north. Then Theban women, a large company, arrived in Delphi to greet him. Theria saw them pass and knew that a like company from Athens was arriving at the other end of the village. A society of Delphian ladies never else seen publicly came crowding out of their houses into the highway. From her favoured window Theria saw these also, her own kinswomen, whom she knew well, no longer sedate and kind and neat, 
but with hair disordered, clad in strange spotted fawn skins over their chitons. They came leaping, shouting, whirling around in a sort of frenzy, as though unable to wait for the rites which they were about to perform. They were no longer themselves. They were possessed by the strange god Dionysus. They were no longer called women, but bachantes. They were being swept along by a terrible joy from which the child shrank in shame, though she could not understand. On one such evening, Theria watched them, saw the chill, dusky street aflare with their torches, saw how the eyes of the Bashantes caught the light, staring like the eyes of panthers. Then, in a frenzied, noisy rout, they rushed away. Theria sat by her window, quivering, while the cold yellow light died out on glen and mountain. Then, quickly, she left the window and stole down to the orla, where she sat close to the Hestia fire. One of those first evenings of frost it was, when instinctively men draw near to their hearth, and wish to have about them the home faces and the comfortable voices of home. Yet the little girl knew that her aunt Eunomia, her pretty cousin, Clodera, and the rest were speeding half-naked up Parnassus, there in the bitter uplands and the wild to rage madly to and fro at the will of the god. Lycophron burst into the room, rosy with the cold, rude as fourteen-year-olds could make him. "'Did you see the women?' he shouted. "'By the gods, I could hardly get home for them. Free at last. That's what they are, having the time of their lives. Dionysus is only an excuse. Hey, Theria, you are always wanting to get out. Why don't you join?' Lycophron did not see his father, who had just come down the stair. "'Lycophron,' said the father sternly, how do you dare such insolence? Let me never hear such from you again. And Lycophron disappeared more suddenly than he had come. Nicander drew near the fire, absently warming his hands. Even at this early time he was disturbed over his eldest son. Are they gone? queried the little girl. The Bashantis? Yes, my child. As I came up the street I saw far up on the mountain their Bacchic fires gleaming through the dust. It is cold for the night of Bromius. Theria knew of what he was thinking. A little great-great aunt of hers who had died on a night like this, in the cold of the Parnassian rocks. A tiny room next to Theria's own had belonged to her, and she was said to visit it on Bromius night, a white, chattering figure trying in vain to warm herself amid the purple covering of the couch. Theria stole to her father's side, slipped her hand in his, and drew him down to whisper, "'Father, must I be a Bacante some day?' "'God forbid,' spoke Nicander, then added piously, "'unless the god demand you, Theria. "'But he will not demand me. "'Oh, father, he will not.' "'Again she was in the hollow of his arm, "'and again she felt safe even from the god Dionysus himself. "'No, my daughter,' he said, "'looking into the same little face, "'I do not believe he will.' End of chapter 5「Six of the Perilous Seat – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – The Perilous Seat – by Caroline Dale Snedeker The Guests So throughout the winter months Dionysus – that god who came from far Asia into Greece, held sway in Delphi. Apollo had gone on his distant, mysterious journey to the land of the Hyperboreans, those happy, luxurious folk who live on the farther side of the north wind. Theria felt keenly this absence of her god, more keenly perhaps than she would have felt the absence of any person in the household. For with Apollo's going the oracle was silenced, no pilgrims came to consult it. The pure, ordered songs of Apollo, the throbbing lyre, the announcing trumpets were stilled. Instead sounded the nervous wailing of Dionysus' pipes. On quiet evenings Theria could hear them, and Volte told her of the furious satyr dancers in the precinct. And now the absence of Apollo brought the rains and the cold. Yes, in the winter Theria missed her god. When, therefore, in the spring, Rod Apollo returned, 
the whole heart of the little girl went forth to him in love. Theria knew well how her god must look. Every vase and killix in the house bore pictures of Apollo, and long ago her child mind had selected from among the beautiful youths she had seen come by on pilgrimage, one who seemed to her like the god himself. Always at the word Apollo, Theria saw again that fresh-hearted happy boy moving, flushed and expectant, toward the precinct, and on his face that same look of dear surprise, youth's first response to life. Apollo always arrived at Delphi on his birthday, the seventh of Bucius. Then the whole precinct and the town awoke to greet him with song and festival. In Nicander's house slaves ran to and fro on busy errands, for of a surety guests would be coming from the ends of the earth. The purples and the woven curtains came forth from Theria's familiar storeroom, and all the house glowed with the patterns and pictures of tapestries. What joy to the little girl that busyness and commotion! Past the house on the high road now came throngs of pilgrims, more of them every day. At these times no forbiddings or punishments could keep Theria away from the window. Here came the men from Corinth, Thebes, Argos, and the islands of the sea, rich men on horseback with trains of slaves, poor men whose anxious faces showed plain their question to the god. Even the wolves bring gifts to Delphi, was the saying, and some of these, with their heavy mountain faces and clothes of skin, seemed wild and wolf-like to the little girl. Now would pass a delegation from some distant Delphian colony bearing the tithe-gift to the mother fane, for Apollo was founder of cities. It was he who had first led the colonists to their distant lands over the misty deep. Sculptors came accompanying their statues, Poets brought their songs. Now would pass an Ionian gentleman in long purple cloak, laughing, gesturing. Now a quiet young philosopher whose large-eyed, vivid face showed his spirit quest. Philosophers were well known in Delphi and more welcome than kings. How eagerly the visitors talked as they came along. They had arrived after long journeying to within sight of their goal. The broad Doric speech, the melodious attic, the barbarous dialects mixed with the speech of Scythes, Cycles, and Gauls, all these she heard. Among the passers-by were sure to be some who would stop and enter Nicander's door, guests of the priestly house. Often these were men of high renown, but quite as often they would be poor in threadbare garments, who had come to the oracle in bitter need. To these Nicander's ministry was almost un-Greek in its overflowing sympathy. An inherited skill of kindness was his, and his poet quality of insight was of no peculiar race or date. Many a troubled white came forth from Nicander's presence, serene to face the god. In the centre of Nicander's, as in every Greek house, there was a fast-closed door. Behind this door lived the women. They might, when only the family was in the house, come through this door but they had no business or occupation on its outer side. At the appearance of a guest, the women must quickly disappear. This door was at once Theria's greatest grief and greatest delight. Grief that it must constrain her at all, delight in it that she could steal through it and catch glimpses of her father's guests. Often, though she was punished for this, Theria always did it. Who would not take punishment for a glimpse of Aeschylus, Cimon, Parmenides or Pindar. Back to your room, quick, daughter, Nicander would command whenever he noticed her. But often Nicander would be absorbed in his guest, and the room would be confused with serving slaves. Nicander would not even see Theria's little figure crouched by a pillar. Of all the guests, the Theban poet Pindar was the one whom Theria loved best. Indeed, all children loved Pindar, not a child in Delphi, but would lift up eager hands to that radiant smile as Pindar passed. There was in him an almost aggressive joy, the same vitality which makes a child leap and run and shout. All this was in his adult nature. It shone out of the clear deeps which were his eyes and trembled on his full Greek lips. He seemed always just to have taken a deep breath as if joying in the very air about him. 
His rather large mouth and his nose were both well built for breathing. Splendor was his, splendor of imagination. His whole being exulted in response to spiritual beauty unseen by other men. All Delphi adored him. They had a strangely spiritual custom concerning him. Wherever Pindar might be in bodily comings or goings, the keeper of the Apollo temple, when closing the shining doors at sunset hour, was wont to call aloud, Let Pindar the poet go in to the supper of the god. Theria was a very little girl when she first saw Pindar. She was awakened by a sweet commotion of music, and getting up from her bed she trotted down into the front orla. The fateful door had been left open, and she stole through, a diminutive figure in her short chiton. She went direct to Pindar. The poet laid his lyre upon the table and lifted the child to his knee. "'There, there, I awakened you, little one,' he said tenderly. "'No,' she answered, "'the music called me.' "'Called you, did it? And so you had to come?' She did not answer, but gazed up at him, unwinking, her tiny hands folding and unfolding in her utter joy at being so near to him. She was unaware of the others sitting at the feast. "'Where do you get it?' she asked. "'Get what? The lyre? Oh, the lyre-maker in Athens.' She shook her curls. No, the song. Does it come out of the air? Perhaps so, little one. Apollo gives it, surely. Oh, will he give one to me? She asked, her hands clasping suddenly close to her breast. If I make a prayer to him and a sacrifice, a big, big sacrifice like father's, a sheep, and burn it all up with leaping flame till it smells so good, so good. Her baby nose sniffed deliciously, and all the men laughed. "'And where will you get your big sheep?' teased one. "'Nay, do not spoil her hope,' spoke Pindar quickly. He drew the lyre toward her, and instantly her chubby hand reached out to touch the strings, sounding them lovingly, softly. Pindar watched her, absorbed. "'The God will give you your song, darling. Apollo's answer is already in your eyes and fingers.' "'Do you think so, Pindar?' asked Nikanda, amused. "'Yet even so, the child must not stop our feast. "'Medon, will you carry her back to her nurse?' "'Nikanda expected that she would cry and struggle, "'but she leaned over and kissed the lyre, "'then went away with Medon, quite satisfied. "'Ever from that time, Theria awakened at the first sound of Pindar's lyre. "'She would steal down as near as she dared. "'If the door were shut, she would press her ear against it "'in her eagerness to hear.' If it were open, she would crouch in its shadow. The slaves passing to and fro with the feast never told. Theria was a favourite with them. It was Pindar's habit to bring his songs to Nikander when they were glowing new. Nikander, a poet who had never written himself forth, had the keenest sense of poetic values, and Pindar was glad of his judgments. Sometimes an ode would be sung again and again before both pronounced it right. Then Pindar would go out into the Delphic starlight, humming the altered, perfected refrain. Hearken, for once more we plough the field, of Aphrodite of the glancing eyes. Or, in any wise to slake my thirst for song, the ancient glory of thy forefathers summoneth me. Or he would address his own songs, calling them, My lords of lute, my feathered arrows of sweet song, my golden pillars of sweet song. These were the familiars of Theria's childhood, entered into the fabric of her mind. Pindar, as he strode singing away, little wrecked of the girl listener drinking at his fountain, and transmuted in all her being by his supreme expression. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of the Perilous Seat – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. What Gifts the Guests Brought. It was through a guest that Theria first came to visualize those distant colonies of the West, which gave so many gifts to Delphi and played so important a part in Delphi's life. 
He was a simple-seeming guest, this young man from far away, Alia in Italy. But child though Theria was, she could not but note his face. It shone with an almost startling quietness, a robust and heavenly calm. The soul of the man had been dipped deep and deep again in abstract thought. Earthly things were washed away. The Parmenidian countenance of peace was soon to be recognized throughout Hellas, for even the disciples of Parmenides acquired this same look. Yes, he said, smiling as though it were an ordinary happening. We were nearly shipwrecked off Corsera, four days of storm. I thought my earthly term was come, but I knew that I would at once rise from the sea and begin my long progress toward the eternal source. Would you have been glad, asked the amazed Nicander, to go on pilgrimage to Hades? No, no, laughed Parmenides. Too much to do here. Elian needs me. The city is now in my hands to govern quite as I will. I govern by philosophy. And, Nicander, we are happy in Elia. We are a little city and on a faraway coast. Yet even Athens has not our justice and calm. Constantly I keep before the minds of our citizens the importance of right, the unimportance of this world's goods. They know they are in the hands of the one. I could not worship the one, said Nicander seriously. I think what a lonely God, and only one, sitting soul and wordless in Olympus, with no other God to speak to, to deal with, or to love, or even to quarrel with, he added whimsically. But the gods themselves worship my God. They know the one who is above them and controls. Moira, asked Nicander in a low voice, inexorable fate? No, Nicander, not fate but love, creating all things, healing all things, love, the first, the source. Parmenides, eyes shone with eerie light. He was fairly launched now. He began to recite his philosophy. It was, as it was all literary expressions in those days, a poem. Nicander listened entranced, laying it away in his retentive Greek memory, which would give him back whole cantos of it almost entire. Theria, crouched in the door corner, wrapped in a dark cloak, was content to listen to the rhythm. Of the poem she understood not a word. Then she grew weary of her stolen pleasure, but she dared not move from her hiding place. Presently, Balte began to call her through the house. Little mistress, little mistress, your mother asks for you. Little mistress, she is ill and needs you. For strange to say, in Melantho's frequent headaches, it was Theria's little magnetic hands which helped most of all. Apollo has blessed the child with this healing touch, old Balte was wont to say. But now Balte called in vain, and at last, fearing that her charge might be in forbidden quarters, she left off her call. But the interminable poem went on. It mingled at last in Theria's ears into a soft humming. Torches were brought, and the evening meal. Priest and philosopher lingered in ardent converse. That friction of mind upon mind, which the Greek men of that day so loved, and which, with its sparkle and contagion of wit, made the Greek look with contempt upon the mere written page. Nicander, strolling dreamily to bed at midnight, stumbled upon the heap wrapped in its dark cloak and lifted his daughter in his arms. Strange, he murmured, this continual disobedience. What can draw her hither, I wonder? The childish face, sleeping upon his arm, reminded him of his mother, a resemblance he had not noted before, and very tenderly he carried her to her bed where Balte was waiting. It was from a guest also that Theria heard the first whisper of the war, that steadily approaching war which was yet so far off that only the wise felt its dread. 
Theria was older at this time and understood more of what she heard. Her father one day entered, suddenly bringing with him a stranger whose personality started her interest. Unreminting energy, that was the keynote of the man. He talked continually. Theria heard him even before he entered, the clear voice of the orator. His strange Attic dialect, his swift words made him a little difficult for her to understand. Fair he was, tall, blue-eyed, strong, something un-Greek about him. Nicander did not even see Theria this time. He was too absorbed in Themistocles. Their talk was first about the new play at Athens. Themistocles had just heard the first great drama. His heart was afire with the excitement of it. It is new, utterly new and powerful, he exclaimed. Prometheus, it is called. Aeschylus has outdone himself. The very gods come down upon the stage and actors. We have never had such actors, Nicander. But it is the greatness of the play which creates them. The greatness of the play. The lines, pleaded Nicander, tell me the lines. And with ready memory, Themistocles began. He gestured swiftly with his hands. Flashing hands, Therian named them. He puzzled her. Surely he was not Athenian, not quite moderate and serene, and his cloak with its border of purple and gold was a little too conspicuous of beauty. In the midst of a scene, he broke off. But here we talk of the play, he said, when I want to talk of dear Athens. Nicander, the Athenians are blind, every one of them blind. Gracious, laughed Nicander, no one else thinks so. They will not believe that the Persian will come again. Oh, they boast, we conquered them at Marathon, that deed is done. But the deed is not done, Nicander. You know the Persian will return. Ye of Delphi, are you so unaware? He seized Nicander's hand, and Nicander sobered instantly. Indeed, we are not unaware, he answered. Oh, Nicander, the trophies of the Militiades will not let me rest. Such trophies must be won again. May the gods let me win them. Nicander did not reply, but Theria saw him search the man's face, as if anxiously measuring him for some great need. Have you news, Themistocles? Fresh news? No, only straws, but plenty of them. I keep a clever slave down at the Piraeus, who has no other business than to listen to the stories of the ship merchants and traders. Sailors know the way of the winds. The winds of the future, they push in at every shore. The great king, they tell us, is now warring against Egypt, but our turn is next. Oh, it is surely the next, Nicander. The armies which Darius brought against us seven years agone were but a handful to those which his son Xerxes will bring. I believe that, said Nicander. I and the Delphinian council will believe it too. Good, exclaimed the Athenian. It is not good. Do you know, Themistocles, what this belief breeds in the council? Fear, only fear. Hellas cannot withstand the Persian. That is what they are whispering here in Delphi. Hellas is doomed. Themistocles' face took on a horror which startled the listening girl. Nicander, he cried, you will not allow Delphi to shirk. The oracle must stand by Athens. I will stand by Athens and by all Hellas, said Nicander solemnly. I believe Apollo will defend his own. Themistocles now began to talk of the silver mines of Laurium and how he had been trying to persuade the Athenians to forego their yearly gift of silver in order to build ships for fighting against the little island of Aegina. Will so many ships be needed? queried Nicander with sharp insight. Themistocles leaned toward him, laughing softly, triumphantly. For the war with Aegina, he said low-toned. Believe me, for that war the ships will not be used, but when the Persian comes, he will find certain ships in our harbor that will give him pause. 
Remember that, Nicander. So that you may give credit to Themistocles, who saw before the event. All too soon, Themistocles took his departure. Afterward, Theria heard the slaves gossiping about the man. He brought with him a purple tent, they said, and furniture and many slaves, even for his short visit. Themistocles lived like a prince in Delphi. End of chapter 7「8 of the Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Dryas Takes a Robber. There was no use mincing matters. Lycophron, the eldest son of Nicander, was not satisfactory. Handsome in person, he had nevertheless always been slow to learn and swift in evil doing, the bane of his Delphic schoolmasters. At fourteen years, his features had coarsened, his eyes grown less intelligent. Now, at eighteen, that phase was past, and he was clever in a fashion which Nicander vainly tried to think creditable. Nicander wanted to keep close to his boy in study and sports. Lycophron was his firstborn. Some day Lycophron would be priest in Nicander's stead, would take his chair in the Amphictyonic council. Yet try as he might, Nicander could never look forward to this succession without shame. Lycophron now began to demand money for horses and a chariot for the Olympian Games. Nicander could ill afford so expensive a winning. He had hoped that his eldest son would win the crown for leaping or running, some act which would be reflected back in manly beauty and strength. Yet Nicander managed to give Lycophron money for his horses. He loved his eldest with a sensitive, intimate love. But now came Dryas. Dryas, from the first week of school, had shown himself a promising son of the ancient house, and Nicander's joy in him was beautiful to see. Always when Dryas returned from school, Nicander would contrive to be in the aula to greet him, to hear the latest Doric melody the boy had learned, to correct the faults or recite with him the passage of Homer, which had been the lesson of the day. Sometimes Nicander would linger along the road, meet Dryas, and, dismissing the pedagogue, would himself conduct the boy home. Dryas was not always strong. Nicander summoned for him the best physicians from Athens, and on his ill days would sit beside him patiently trying to ease the child. At such times Theria helped, knowing by that curious instinct of hers what to do, and when the pain was eased, Dryas would draw her face down and kiss her. Nicander was almost jealous of the love that Dryas gave to his twin sister. As he grew taller, however, Dryas grew also well and strong. One winter evening, Dryas and his slave boy were returning from the gymnasium, old Medin, his pedagogue, being lame and at home. All afternoon, Dryas had been exercising. Then, in the gymnasium, he had stood under the pouring fountain, a chilly bath, and the slave boy had rubbed him to a glow. He was full of life and of a sense of waxing strength. Dreams of Olympian contests were in his heart, as they were in the heart of every boy of Greece. Come, said he to the slave, let's go out the eastern road. You have the bow, maybe we'll bring down a hare. It will grow dark soon, ventured the slave, and your father will be coming to meet you. It won't be dark, answered Dryas. Come, I say. So together they walked eastward on the hill road. They passed the row of outer temples and the hillside tombs. Sure enough, against all hope, a hare leaped across the road. Dryas shot it, and the slave fetched and slung it over his shoulder. Then they started back to town. Twilight had fallen when they repassed the graves. The boys shrank close to each other. Both slave and free were afraid of the spirits which hovered there. As they came to the roadside temples, they saw a man dart quickly around a corner. What was that? 
asked Dryas sharply. I don't know, answered the slave. Dryas, with wide eyes of fear, backed behind a rock. If he's stealing from the gods, we ought to stop him, spoke the slave. See, we have our bow. At this word, Dryas, ashamed of his fear, came out from hiding. Stay by me, he pleaded, and the slave advanced first. These small temples, being outside the precinct wall, were poorly guarded. The boys crept nearer and rounded the corner just in time to see the man with some silver cups in his arms running down the hill. The boys gave chase. The man circled around so as to come up the hill again. The upper heights were always a fastness for robbers. The boys still followed, and above the road overtook the man. Dryas, with a cry half like a sob, leaped upon him, while the slave at the same time tripped his heels. The fellow went down like a log, screaming in panic. The boys quickly possessed themselves of the cups. The slave, with his own leather belt, tied the man's hands, and together the boys pulled the man down the road, he not resisting at all. They pushed him along toward town. At the edge of the village, Nicander met them. In all his life, Nicander never forgot that shock. First the fear, then the joy, as he realized that Dryas, spite of bleeding face and disheveled hair, was safe and that he had done a brave deed. Father, it is a robber, Dryas was saying excitedly. I caught him by the outer temples. See, he had the silver temple cups. My son, said Nicander, my son. At the sound of Nicander's voice, the man fell down again, howling like an animal in fear, and strangely, Dryas too broke into hysterical weeping. Don't let them kill him, father, don't let them kill the man. But he has committed sacrilege. Oh, no, no, if they kill him, I'll die too. Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, he would haunt me. Nonsense, Dryas. Here the man tried to get upon his feet, but tumbled down again. Pitiful, Hermes, cried Nicander. The wretch is starving. Dryas, still sobbing, caught nervously at the man's bonds and pulled them off. Here, son, said Nicander, give him a drachma. The poor creature snatched the money and, seeing the look of relenting in Nicander's face, sprang up the hill with sudden life. He was quickly lost among the crags. The incident soon got abroad in Delphi. The boys at school made a hero of Dryas. They had always liked him. Nicander, however, could not help recurring to Dryas's curious, passionate weeping. He told himself that it was natural. The young boy should be pitiful. But the weeping had not seemed to be pity. Something selfish, almost craven, was in it. And a look in the slave boy's face made Nicander think that the slave had done as much or more of the deed than Dryas himself. Nicander pushed these thoughts from him when Dryas's praise came in from every side. Nicander gladly forgot them. For from this time the Delphians began to take notice of Nicander's younger son. His beauty was growing every day. He had a voice high, clear, unearthly sometimes, and he played the lyre with firm touch while he sang. He was only fourteen years old. One day, as the priests broke up their council after the giving of the oracle, the old Acaritus, president of the priests, detained Nicander. He told him that his boy Dryas had been chosen the laurel-bearer for the next Streptarian feast. It was the greatest honor the Delphians could give to a young Delphian boy. Then Nicander went home feeling that his cup of joy was full. End of chapter 8「of the Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Laurel from Tempe. Theria's joy, too, was full. The tie between Dryas and herself was very strong, and his happiness closely touched her. 
But oh, the further marvel, there he was to go up to the precinct to see the sacred rite. She was older now. Had she not already dedicated her girlhood toys to Artemis? Soon she would be a woman, and for women there were certain rare occasions when they might visit the temple place. The new white himation which she was to wear she hung on a peg in her room. Gazing at this, fingering it, she could almost realize that she was about to go to the precinct. The joy caught strongly at her throat. Every day she begged her mother to name over each temple that she was to see, each treasury, each statue that flanked the sacred way until Melantho clapped hands over her ears and ordered her out of the room. Therian never moved quietly about the house. She always ran or skipped. Now as she ran, she sang aloud or leaping into her swing in the court. She swept upward like a swallow until she could see high over the balcony into the second story rooms. The whole house felt the contagion of her joy. I'm to attend little mistress, boasted Naria in the kitchen. By Hermes, the best of the festival will be to see her face going into the gates. The Streptarian was a festival which, like the Pythia, came every fourth year. At the Streptarian was performed the sacred drama, Apollo killing the Python the very same which Dryas had acted in a play when a baby, and now he was to act it in earnest. Midway in the precinct was built a temporary hut called the Palace of the Snake, and the snake would be there, a marvel of contrivance, his ugly dragon head with open mouth and teeth resting on the threshold. Dryas, arrayed as the boy Apollo, must in mimic dance, and gesture fight with the dragon. A chorus of boys carrying torches would sing the story. Then after the struggle, Apollo must lift his silver bow and shoot the dragon. It would die with great writhings and agony, a joy to the crowd. Presently, all the actors would come in solemn, silent procession down the sacred way. They would pass out of the gate of the precinct, through the village, and away on the western road. Thus would begin a long journey, which would take from moon to moon. Symbolically, the actors would journey to the land of the Hyperboreans, beyond the north wind. Actually, they would trace an ancient way of pilgrimage, the Pythian way, to the Vale of Tempe. At Tempe, Dryas, as the sacred boy, would gather boughs from a certain famous laurel tree and bring them home to be woven into crowns for the Pythian victors. For the Pythian festival and games always fell in the same year, a few weeks later than the Streptarian. All this was to be Dryas' adventure. He would return to tell of its wonders. He was a dear, companionable boy. Therian knew he would tell her the whole of it. On the morning of the Streptarian, she awoke before daybreak and lay in that ecstasy of anticipation which only youth time knows. Presently dawned the light and showed her her white dress still hanging ghostly on its peg. She arose and went out into the court balcony. Here she met Dryas. He too had awakened early with the joy of the day. Good luck, she greeted him, the luck of Loxias. And he answered piously, Apollo bless you. Between them, they roused the whole family. At sunrise, Dryas must be clothed in his ceremonial robes. He stood in the court near the Hestia hearth, where all the family could see him, where the slaves could gather proudly to look on. They brought forth the temple Hamatian, yellow with its border of gold, an ancient precious thing. Dreamily, sensitively, Dryas suffered them to put it on him, to unplate his long hair that it might flow over his shoulders in the manner of Apollo. Already he felt upon him the sacred character of the god he was to personate. The candor advanced to place the golden laurel crown on Dryas's head. He came slowly, unlike himself, and in the ceremony spoke only the necessary words, no more. 
he made sacrifice upon the hearth and then, stumbling a little, stepped back. It was time to go. The whole family were to walk behind Dryas up to the precinct. Darius stood hand in hand with her mother. Her eyes were like stars. Son, said Nicander in a low voice, I cannot go with you now. I will come up in a few moments with Medin. The priests will meet you at the gate. Father, but why? A troubled look crossed the boy's rapt face. I am not quite well, just for a moment. I'll be with you soon, my son. There he had darted out and touched his hand. Never mind, daughter, he said. Make haste, all of you. Obediently, the family formed in a sort of procession and left the house. Oh, the golden sunshine of that early morning, the sweet, cool air with the blessing of the stars still upon it. Theria took thirsty drafts of it as she went along. The cliffs towered nobly about as if in prayer, and along their face the mists, white spirits, new risen from the veil, came shouldering, sinking, lifting, dreamily alive. So tall are the cliffs at Delphi that they meet the blue and cut off from sight the snowy peak of Parnassus, which is back above them. Now the procession turned the shoulder of a cliff. The precinct burst into view. The precinct, a golden and many-hued Elysium, lying on the slope above the road within its quadrate wall. It slanted against the hillside in the sunshine. There you could see the bright little fanes, the golden tripods, the zigzag of the sacred way dividing it in the midst, and the great Apollo temple at the top. The precinct seemed to spread itself generously before her sight, all of it at once, as though knowing how dearly she loved it. Above the precinct were the cliffs again soaring terribly to the sky. Now the procession was stopping. It was before the great bronze doors. The doors were opening, showing a glimpse of the wonder place within. Here a company of priests with the old president or Hoseus, received them. They greeted Dryas then. But where is Nicander? they asked. He said he would join us, answered Dryas. He should be with us by now. We will wait for him, said the old Hoseus. And so they waited, moments, a half hour, and still Nicander did not arrive. The priest began to stir impatiently. Dryas looked around with anxious eyes. Theria slipped back among the slaves. Balte, she said, he does not come. Hissed, little mistress, we must not speak in this place. But Balte, perhaps he is ill. Menden is there, and Philo. Theria suddenly recalled that her father's hand, when she touched it, had been cold as ice. How curiously he had stumbled as he turned from the crowning. An ill omen that. Theria had a sure instinct concerning illness. She knew that her father was in trouble. All the joy of the festival and of the out-of-doors folded its wings in her heart. She could think only of her father. Now she was dimly aware that the old Hoseus had let open the gates and bade Dryas enter. She caught Balte's hand. I'm going back home, she said. Balte, come quickly. But, little mistress, what a crazy notion is this? I'll be back for the festival. Oh, I'll be back in time. But I must meet father. But, little mistress. Balte, come at once. And Balte, who never before had obeyed her little girl, came without a word. They hurried back along the road. Nicander did not meet them on the way. Theria was the more terrified. Entering the house, she heard music the music of the physician. She ran to her father's room. He lay gasping upon the bed, his fine face drawn like an old, old man's. His eyes, haunted with pain, turned toward Theria, but he did not speak. Perhaps he could not. The physician in the corner sang nervously the healing ode of Apollo. Medin was clasping his hands. Oh, missy, missy, he moaned. The doctor gave the medicine and it did no good. Now he's playing the music. When he does that, it's the end, the end. 
The room was suffocating. Air, thought Theria. Father must have air. She stamped her foot at the physician. Stop that wailing, she commanded. Stop it at once. The physician was glad enough to obey her. If Nicander died, it could be the daughter's fault. Then swiftly, businesslike, Theria had them carry her father, bed and all, into the street and sent Balte for hot water, which she applied. She was trembling in the very childishness of grief. Sometimes she flung herself upon her father, kissing him, begging him to live. But nevertheless, she kept on with her simple remedies, remedies she had used before. At last, so gradually that she could not tell when it began, the pain abated. The candor's eyes grew clear, and his breath came even once more. Daughter, he spoke at last, my darling girl. And Balte, putting down the steaming pot of water, gave a shout of joy. Meanwhile, up in the precinct, the festival was going forward, but Theria had forgotten it. At length, Nicander was strong enough to be carried back into the aula, where he fell asleep. Then it was that Theria heard the sound of pipes and shouting in the street. Instinctively, she ran upstairs to the window. The sacred drama was over. Here came the actors, now a happy, laughing rout. It was the custom that the Tempe procession lead the city in haste so as to outdistance all evil. First Dryas came running in the beautiful leaps which Greek racers used. His hair was streaming in the wind. He held aloft his silver bow in triumph and great joy. Then came the swift boy chorus with backward burning torches and beauty of fluttering garments. Then the sacred women having an awkward time of it to keep the boys in sight and the crowd laughing at them and shouting, Good luck for the journey! The luck of Loxias. So shouting, laughing, the picture of joyous life, they disappeared down the road. Ah, there was the last gleam of Dryas's silver bow. At least, thought Theria, when Dryas comes back, he will have a father to greet him instead of, instead. Then with tender happiness, or was it the bitterness of missing her one festival, she hid her face weeping. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of the Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. A Boy Called Sophocles. One hot summer morning, Melantho and her daughter were sitting in the upper room spinning. Or rather, it was Melantho who was sitting. Theria was pacing to and fro at her task, stretching out the thread with free gesture, her fingers twisting, twisting like fluttering wings. Melantho noted how tall the girl had grown. Her awkwardness, too, is passing, she mused as Theria turned, sweeping the thin folds of her chiton against her supple limbs. So might Iris have looked, the slender goddess messenger, running to the divine threshold with news for the blessed gods. But Melantho had no thought of goddesses. She will soon be old enough for a husband, was Melantho's thought. I must speak to Nicander about it. Theria sighed and paced again. Theria, said her mother, if you would sit down, you would not be so tired. Tired, spoke the girl frowning. Great Hermes, why should I be tired, except from this eternal sitting? There's no breath in this room. Theria, you grow more impatient every day. Do you suppose your father can ever get you a husband if you frown like that? At the word husband, the girl gave her mother a startled, puzzled look. She said nothing. Melantho's thoughts ran in given channels. Her next was of vegetables and fish, which Medin must purchase this morning. Daughter, she said, go down and fetch Medin to me. Quick as thought, 
Daria dropped her spindle into the basket of snowy wool and sped away. The morning was full of sunshine. Theria caroled like a lark as she tripped down the stair. Housed though she was, Theria never seemed housed. Perhaps the effect upon generation after generation of her forefathers living out of doors. The strengthening, sweetening effect upon mind and body had entered into her and made her part of the open air. Through the inner court she ran and burst out the open door into the outer court of the men. Here, pure amazement stopped her motion. In the outer court stood the most beautiful boy Theria had ever beheld. He had laid aside his himation for the heat and stood in his short chiton, slender, delicately erect, gazing about his new surroundings with shy yet interested eyes. His hair, honey-colored, was cut short and filleted as if for a holiday. He himself was bronzed by the sun, as all high-born boys should be. At sight of Theria, he smiled. Forgive me, lady, he said. My father left me here to wait for him. Oh, said Theria, I thought perhaps a god had done that. At which speech he blushed and became a little lovelier. She came toward him. She was not shy, for the boy was younger than she. Besides, she was too delighted with his beauty to be shy. Whence are you? she queried. From Colonos. The grove near Athens? Yes, the shady sacred grove, the most beautiful place in the world. More beautiful than Delphi? she smiled. I think so, lady. It is your home, said Theria gently. Therefore you love it. My father came to consult the oracle, explained the boy. He questions about his ship, which comes not back to us. He is now with your father in the precinct. For you are Nicander's daughter, are you not? Yes, his only daughter, she answered with pride. How modestly the boy questioned. His respect toward her was something new in Theria's experience. Both her brothers were brotherly contemptuous. But this stranger was talking with her. To Theria, this experience was nothing short of an adventure. She felt it so. Mind and soul sprang up, vivid and intense. She began to ask her usual eager questions. How did you come to Delphi? Was it a long journey? Oh, was it by sea? No lady, by land, through Boeotia and over the mountains. How many days? Three days. We did not hurry. Yesterday at sunset, we came to the triple way, where Oedipus met his father. Yes, he answered, where he killed his father. Of course, you know the story. Oh, lady, such a lovely place it is, up there where the mountains pierce the sky. The road runs among the clouds. Where the clouds broke, I could catch glimpses far beneath of the blue valley and the sun setting. Far down, I heard the tinkle of goat bells, the herds hidden below the clouds. I seemed to be in the home of the gods. And do you know what I did? I let the others walk onward, and I stood there alone. The three roads went this way and that from the place of my feet. Then I seemed to see approaching along one road old Laius and his men, and by the other road Oedipus, young and proud, fulfilling his curse. But before they met, I fled. Oh, I could not bear to think that he would kill his father all unknowing. What if it had been my own dear father and myself? The curse of Oedipus, that terrible curse, swept down over me with whirlwind wings. The boy put up his hand to his head in a whimsical yet solemn smile. It touched me, he said, and when I ran up to my dear father and clasped his hand, I was weeping. I would not tell them why, yet I am telling you. I wish I had been there, breathed Theria. I wish you had, echoed the boy, and suddenly the boy's gentle reverence gave Theria joy utterly new, a sense at once of humbleness and power. Come, she said childishly, seizing his hand. There's a swing in the other aula. Let's swing on it. Busily she hied him thither, but the boy would not swing. 
It's for girls. I'll push you, he said. Soon the court rang with their voices and merry laughter. The boy ran under, and Theria flew like a tall nymph in great dips and soarings. Now her black tresses streamed behind. Now they flung over her face a dusky veil. After a while, the boy stopped, breathless, and the swing died. Guess who came with us all the way, he said suddenly. I cannot guess. Pindar, he told her joyously. That's what made the journey so wonderful. All those three days I heard his divine talk with my father. Never shall I forget it. All about Hellas and the Persians and the war that is coming. I hope it won't come too soon before I can fight. Pindar is ours, said Theria with Delphic pride. There is a chair set in the temple just for him. He sits there and the god gives him song. Tell me, did you hear him sing? Often and often, boasted the boy, when we would stop by the road to sup and pour wine to the blessed gods, then a slave would bring Pindar's lyre. A fine old one it is, always fresh-stringed. He would sweep it with his hand, and the thing would tremble as if alive. Do you think my hand is like Pindar's? he asked, stretching out his right hand. Slender and brown it was, expressive as his face. No, said the girl honestly, but it is a player's hand. I'm going to be a poet some day, ran on the boy. I wish I might be a poet, said Theria. You, but you are a girl, for you will be the house and children and the loom. I hate the house, cried Theria. What, the home of your fathers? How can you? The boy was shocked. Oh, I don't mean the home. I mean the house walls that keep me in. Sometimes I want to scream and struggle as though I were tied down hand and foot. But nothing ties you down. Do you call nothing to stay all day twisting a miserable thread like this? Darius spun with her fingers. When there is so much, oh, so much in the world. But do women feel that way, he asked. They always seem contented in the house. Would you be content? By the gods, no. But are we not like you, we girls? We are strong. We like to run and breathe the air. Look at my arm, how ugly white. It has never seen the sun. She flashed out her fair arm, free of its drapery. That is not ugly, said the boy gently. It is, it is, white as a Persian's. No, it is Greek, maintained the boy. By the gods, I'd like to see you running brown and free like Artemis in the wood. You don't think I am foolish to want to run and leap. No, no, no. Theria's eyes widened with delight. You don't think me foolish to read my father's books? Books! Here the boy was puzzled. Why should you read books? Poems are to sing, not to read. Oh, I sing them too, laughed Theria. Far back in the storeroom, when nobody can hear, I sing them. I have to make up the tunes. I wish I could hear you. Oh, I wish I could hear you. That anyone should care for what she did. No praise could be sweeter. No joy. So absorbed were they both that they did not hear the voices calling through the house. Sophocles, Sophocles. Until the searchers had entered the open door, that door which should always be closed. Eleutheria, came her father's voice, sterner than she had ever heard it. The meaning of this by Hermes I must know. The two turned in confusion. Whatever made you think you could bring a stranger here into the inner court? How long have you been together? There he answered none of his questions. She faced him, her eyes black lakes of astonishment. So intense a mood could not break at once. I have done no wrong, she asserted. How can you think I have done wrong? But you have. You are almost a woman. You cannot receive my guess. My guess he is, this Thophocles, she answered with frightened face but steady voice. We have been talking together about Homer and Pindar. Surely that is no harm. Where is our wrong? 
A low exclamation came from the corner of the room. Pindar himself was there with Sophocles' father. The boy spoke blushing. I am the one to blame. I came in here to push the swing, not thinking. There is no blame, repeated the girl passionately. Don't call it blame. Had Nicander been an ordinary Greek father, Theria would undoubtedly have received her whipping at this time. Go to your room, daughter, said Nicander quietly. I cannot talk with you here. And Theria fled in an agony of shame. Pindar's voice broke the silence. By the deep vested graces, Nicander, but I think we have broken into a pretty dialogue. What I had heard some of it. The boy, redder still, hid behind his father. Nicander shook his head in whimsical despair. What am I to do with a daughter like that? I never know what she will do next. She's perfectly good, I assure you. She only breaks rules like a colt. She's your image, laughed Pindar. Your own face faced you when she spoke. Hi, and your spirit, too. By Artemis, did you mark how she fled up the stairs with head held high? She's a twin, you know, said Nicander. The boy is more beautiful. Ay, I know your Dryas. The coming beauty, they say, and perhaps the coming singer. Nicander's face flushed with pleasure. The lyrists tell me so, he assented. Thus Eros brushed his wings across Theria's fancy and flew away. No business of his was this, but youth was here, fearful impressibility, a breath, and youth is changed. Who shall say that when in after years this boy sang of a woman and gave her a new type of nobleness, the image of this proud sweet maid of Delphi did not float before him and make his creation real? And as for Theria, the encounter was a peep outward into the world. From this time she became more aware of the hurried development outside in the awakening land of Greece. From this time she felt it, the joyous advance into the light, new art, new politics, new thought. The amassing knowledge of centuries was converging to a focus, and the heart of the Greeks soared into a mental atmosphere never known before or since. This intense point came in Theria's lifetime. No wonder the light of it penetrated all her walls and restrictions. No wonder she struggled to be free to meet it. Her own youth was of the youth time of Hellas, and longed to be merged with it as flame yearns toward flame. End of chapter 10「11 of the Perilous Seat」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker Chapter 11 Why Not Be the Pythia? In times of war, we picture every corner of a warring land, torn with passion, dark with fear, dyed with blood. But this is not so. In Nicanda's household, the four meals a day were served by quiet slaves. The washing was done down in the Plestos River as the good housewife Melantho required it. Leutheria received her daily lesson in spinning and weaving and damaged more good wool than any maid of all the generations of Nicanders. This indeed was Dame Melantho's chief grief, despite the fact that her little land was cowering under the heaviest cloud of war that ever threatened a devoted country. At every festival came crowding news of the great Persian king across the sea preparing his army to invade and devour. Into every port came sailors telling of the fleets of Phoenicians, Cyprians, Lycians, Dorians of Asia, etc., all of which fleets were making ready to pounce upon Greece. Then arrived the actual ambassadors of the king, demanding earth and water, which was to say, Consent to slavery and the Persians will leave you out of the fight. Many cities gave these tokens immediately. 
Who then will resist? What will happen if any should resist? Will the gods help? Have the gods forgotten their beloved Hellas? Such were the questions which poured into Delphi. These days, Nicander might be seen pacing to and fro in some lush or near the council house, seeing not before him, blind to the beauty of the hills and far glimpsed vale. Then perhaps in desperation, he would stride down the hill and along the road towards home. In the woman's aula, Melantho would greet him with the small worries of the day. A slave child was ill and she knew not what to do for it. She must have more grain to store away in the storeroom or Nicander would have to go without his special cake next winter. And will you have a cake now? she asked. And a little wine? Do now. You look tired. Yes, he said, yes. And so she went out to make the slaves do all in order. Meanwhile, Theria came in and sat upon a stool nearby. She spoke no word, but tried to untangle a thread from her distaff, parting wisp from wisp with slender fingers, and watched her father with keen, quiet eyes. Melantho returned, chattering, and Nicander ate his cake in silence, and still Theria watched. She knew that the Amphictyonic Council, that famous council of many states, was meeting today in its house west of the town. Why was it meeting now? This was not the season. She knew that her father had been with it. He was one of the Amphictyons. There had been hot dispute. She could see that in his face. But had he won? And what was the strife about? She knew something of the danger which threatened the land. This she knew in spite of the fact that Nikander had been strict in keeping the news away from the household. He hated the aspects of fear. These would come through soon enough. Bitterly, Theria longed to ask questions. She knew that there was no use. She knew that her father had come home for peace, for a respite. After a while, Melantho was called away and Theria moved over beside her father on the bench and slipped her hand into his. He sighed restfully as she did so. Then care again settled like closing wings upon him. Theria decided that he had not won in the council, at least not for today. She also decided that the controversy had been serious. She could not guess that it had to do with the whole policy of the oracle in the face of the Persian attack. In that council, Nicander and one friend stood alone for the defense of Greece. All others stood for surrender. Theria's first instinct was the woman's to mend her father's disappointment by some diversion. Father, she said, I have been thinking all day of the birds that Homer tells of on the Scamandrian plain. He frowned and came out of his dream. What is Homer to you, child? He said impatiently. Nothing, father, but I often think of those things. I love birds, she added quietly. They are so merry and move so swift, so swift. They are kind too. Kind? What do you mean? They come to me when I go to the window. Oh, just a few moments at the window, father, to breathe the air. Then I call them their own calls and they fly down out of the air, very timid at first. I put out my hand and hold it still and talk to them. Finally, one of them is sure to flutter near and sit on my finger with its little sharp claws. They watch me with clever quick turnings of the head and chirp to make me laugh. She leaned forward. Very child in this childish pleasure, father tell me what Homer says about the birds. I am in no mood for Homer's lines, and indeed he was not, but presently he began to say them. As the many tribes of the feathered birds, wild geese and long-necked swans on the Asian mead by the Kaistroy stream fly hither and thither, joining in the plumage, and with loud cries, Settle ever onward. What a picture, he commented. I never realized before how fine it is. Did his nearness to the ardent Theria bring this realization? Who can tell how mind may leap towards mine? So they were sitting when Olen, the slave boy, came and stood beside them. Master, a consultant, he announced. At the street door, he will not come in. Nicander rose from the bench, strangely refreshed, and 
and went to the outer Ola. As Olin was following, Theria made him an imperious gesture and the slave reluctantly left ajar the dividing door. Then Theria moved to sit where she could command the outer room. She saw enter a man with white wrecked face. But I must not come in, he objected. O oh, priest, I might bring it upon your house. My house is not afraid, said Nicander. He sat down, indicating the bench beside him, and the man sat down fearfully, like one unclean at the farther end. It is a curse, O oh, priest, he said. I am under a curse. Very skillfully, Nicander quieted him, urging upon him kindness and wisdom of the oracle, persuading him to speak. It was a terrible tale of this man, Corobius and his friend Pythias, one of those Greek friendships so seriously considered that the marriage was not allowed between the children of the two. We were on a journey, said Corobius. Five robbers leaped from ambush upon Pythias. It was him they were after, not me. I whipped out my sword and struck at one of them. And just at that moment, Pythias was thrown in the struggle straight under my blade. I cut him to the bone. Oh, if he had only lived to exculpate me, if he had only spoken some word, but there was no time. I saw only his eyes raised to me in agony, in reproach. Oh, priest, in terrible reproach. Ah, I see them now. Wherever I go, I see them. The Eumenides are coming upon me. To my children's children will the curse run unless Apollo will clean me. How Theria loved her father as he leaned towards the man, laying his hand upon the shaking shoulder, fearless of the terrible curse which could run so quickly from man to man. The son of Leto will hear you, Nicander said. Our God is pitiful of those whose hearts are clean. Do not fear. Tomorrow you shall consult the God. I shall see that you go in first of them all to the oracle. Your case is needy. The interview was long, for as the man grew quieter, Nicander did not fail to sound him as to his attitude in the coming war. Every pilgrim was so tested by Nicander. Thus Nicander learned the public mind. At Corobius' departure, Nicander wandered back to where Theria sat. He was quite unaware that he was seeking his daughter again. Theria ran towards him with overflowing eyes. Oh, the poor man, the poor man, father. Surely the oracle will help him. It must help him. The poor man, hey, what do you know about the poor man, Theria? I will not have you listening from corners. Do you heed me? But why did the dying Pythias reproach him? Couldn't he see that Corobius didn't mean to hurt him? Couldn't he trust his friend that much? Probably Pythias did not blame Corobius at all. The eyes were in death agony, already unconscious. But will Pythia tell him that? After all, how can the Pythia help him? Corobius is a murderer. Poor man, poor man. Corobius is not a murderer, Theria. Murder is of the heart's intention, not of the hand's mistake. Nay, his hands are clean. Cannot you see that? Nicander was forgetting. The proper reproaches for Theria's eavesdropping. The question of blood guilt was a burning one at Delphi. It concerned a brand new policy of Oracle that sin was a thing of the heart and not of outward accident. This moral advance is in every age the most important and most difficult for the human mind to achieve. Nicander was fighting more battles than the defense against the Persian. I wish, said Nicander, the people could see that the curse does not come that way, without the fault of the accursed. Corobius is not under a curse. Not under a curse? repeated Theria. Will God tell him that? How do I know what God will tell him? answered Nicander piously. Oh, if I were the Pythia, I would pray the dear son of Leto till he gave me that answer. But you are not the Pythia. On a sudden, the wish of many moons sprang to Theria's lips. Father, let me be the Pythia, the next Pythian, priestess. Oh, Father, you do not know how I can pray to God and how nonsense. The Pythian priestess is a stupid girl. You would never do.
but Paithia need not be a stupid girl. Theria was talking now breathlessly. Father, when I pray, Apollo answers me. He does. Nicander took her chin in his hand, lifting her pleading face. What a poor child it is, he mused. What do you mean by Apollo answering you? I don't know, father, but he does. Oh, with the coming down upon me of something out of the air like wings. No, not like wings, but I know it is the God. Her eyes grew mystic with a curious inner scene. You strange Theria, said her father. If you saw all the visions of God, it would not make you a good Pythia. You know perfectly well that the Pythia is a girl of empty mind. The mind must be vacant for the God to speak through it. She is but the mouthpiece of the God. Besides all this, she writhes in agony when the oracle comes upon her. Sometimes it kills her. I wouldn't mind if it killed me, just so I were Pythia, Theria urged solemnly. Just so I could speak for the God. Well, you are not going to be Pythia, my child. This whole question is nonsense. It grows out of nothing but your eternal desire to be doing something. Nicander was right. It was Theria's burning desire to use the power that was in her which kept her constantly urging. Her face turned tragic and Nicander's anger sharpened. He was under great stress. Now, no passion mind, Theria. I have enough burdens in these terrible days without your foolish notions. Pythia, foh! I'll be disgraced to have you, Pythia, silly girl. So he stole out of the house. Theria ran to her room. She expected to cry, but she did nothing of the sort. I will be Pythia, she said, throwing her long arms above her head and clasping her hands. I will be Pythia, no matter what. The springs of the poet inspirations are hidden and very strange. Could it be this opposition which drove Theria to make her song the prize song of the Dryas? The next day, after these events, that song came across Theria's mind like the flash. Anger was a part of its origin. Longing for outlet was another part. Strongest of all was the damning back of the birthright power within her until it welled higher than its nature and broke over into song. It was the following week that she showed her song to Dryas and a further week when Dryas sang the song at the Pythian festival and Theria snatched it back again. The result was disastrous as we have seen. And after her father's whipping, Theria strangely knew that she would soon do something to deserve another whipping. End of chapter 11, read by Madhushri, Nellore, August 20th, 2022. Chapter 12 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Book 3. Within the Oracle. The Place of Golden Tripods. Theria awoke in the first gray of dawn. She sat bolt upright in her narrow bed. A dream had awakened her, or rather a purpose a purpose full-formed in sleep. Awake, even her bold mind could not have dared it. Theria was going to dare to go out of the house, out into the free morning, under the sky, away through Delphi, up into the beloved precinct. Oh, she would see all of it this once. The consequence? Never once did she think of consequence. She was simply doing what she did as if a god had pushed her to it, feeling vaguely that she was in the hands of her god. She sprang from bed and threw about her bare lovely body her chiton, pinning it at the shoulders. How her fingers trembled! Then around her supple waist went her zone, drawn tight, then came cloak and sandals. The key to the front door was in her father's room, Nicander slept soundly, but Melantho slept like puss by the fire with one eye open. 
If they see me, they will whip me again, she thought. Well, what of that? Noiselessly, she stepped out upon the court gallery. Everything in the court stood strangely distinct in the dawn. Would she ever see again the little altar, the swing that hung motionless in its place? No one could tell what might ensue if she went out. Theria stole forward to her parents' room. Yes, they were asleep. The key was kept in the chest among the book scrolls. With an instinctive prayer, she opened the chest and put her hand deftly among the metal cylinders. But one of them settled noisily into a new position. It clattered like a chariot in her ears, and she crouched terror-struck. Her father moved, sighed. The key was not there. In desperation, she arose and pushed her hands behind some clothes on a peg. There, oh, Kairos, it hung, and grasping it in her hand, Theria disappeared like a shadow, and so descended the stair. The porter would be near the door, but at this hour surely in his lodge asleep. And Medin was growing very deaf these days. He was hardly a fit porter. But Nicander would not grieve the old man by taking away his office. Theria had grace enough to feel a passing regret that Medin, through this escapade of hers, might lose his beloved duty. Now she was at the door, fitting the great key into its hole. Careful Medin was asleep, but lying almost across his door. Oh, if she could be quicker, if she would not so lose breath. But slowly the door opened. It did not creak, not very much. She slipped through the crack. Then, O oh Hermes, O oh God of all open spaces and swift feet, she was out of doors. She was under the sky, so high that sky that she was dizzy looking up at it not the accustomed low ceiling of the room or the narrow opening above the court. It was the lofty treading place of the immortals. All the air in the world met her first deep-taken breath, fragrance a thousandfold, the uprising spirit of the morn meeting her spirit. She ran like a deer along the road in the gray silver light a marvelous place in which to be set free, a vast amphitheater of hills, spaceful, and she in the midst of the space. On every side, in a far-flung circle, rose dim mountain forms to the silvery sky. On the nearer hillside, a slant like a picture, lay the precious sanctuary, framed foursquare within its clear-seen walls. But within all was dim and confused, for the cliffs which towered above it still had it in their shadow. She stopped to gaze at it with that tenderness which we feel toward things asleep and with a reverence born of twelve generations of worship. Men of her blood and bone had here met the god and here had builded his temple. Hers, the precinct, had been long before she was born. Hers it would be when she was dead a thousand years. But how was she to get in? The precinct was so strictly guarded, the wall so high, her spirit shrank as she thought of it. Suddenly, there he heard a footfall coming toward her, and quick as a thought she turned down one of the steep streets. Once within the narrow blackness, she could see a little, could see the house doors set down and down the terraces, and the Apollo statues standing pillar-like beside each door. No one was abroad in the street. She passed down the better section and came below into the slave quarter. Here a stench met her which was almost more than she could bear. In this fetid place, doors were wide open and crowded slaves snoring within. The sweat and the weariness of slaves were the very smell of the place. Was it here that Olin and the kitchen slaves had to come after their day's work was done? Now she passed some half-naked women asleep in the street. Great pity for them swept her. 
pity for the slave's life and the slave lowness. She stooped over one of them, gazing into her face. The creature awoke with a howl of terror. Ye fool, she cried, damned of Hades, if ye come home late as this can't ye keep still? Ho, oh, I'll trounce ye. The woman leapt to her feet. There he fled down the street, turned the corner, and fled down another. The woman in full chase, her cries arousing the quarter. Here was real danger. This was the place where thieves and ruffians hid themselves who came to rob the precinct. But even in her fright, there he had no instinct to run home. She only fled farther away down the hill. She outdistanced the woman, who presently gave up the chase. Then Theria found herself below the town in the depth of the glen. She was hurt as if the woman had struck her. Never had she heard loathsome oaths such as had been flung after her. Their meaning filled her with horror. Thus much had her cloistering done for her that it had kept her whitely pure. She crouched like a wildwood thing amid the bushes, confused, daunted. Then slowly her determination came back, and she began to climb cautiously upward. At last she regained the high road. While the slow adventure was chancing a whole new world had been made, a world of dawn, of faint rose and amethyst under an awakened sky, immense, marvelous, holy. Theria had emerged directly below the sanctuary. Its great wall towered above her with glimpses over it of temple roofs. Above all rose the great Phaedriades cliffs, colossal shutting out the east. Their color now was the ripe bloom of a plum from their base up to where their clear-cut summits met the zenith. Theria stood clasping and unclasping her hands. She was a living spark of expectancy in that expectant morning world. Here, outside the wall near the gate, stood the victor statues. She could not but pause by one. She knew its place well, her supple young great-grandfather, who had won the running match for boys. There he stood, long-limbed, spare, archaically smiling at her, and for all time, fourteen years old. Dryas also would have a statue here among the music victors. Tenderly proud, Theria marked the place for it near their ancestor. In her present mood, she had no jealousy or regret. According to custom, ancient and immutable, Theria must now pass by the precinct and go onward some distance to Castile's fount before entering the sacred place. She wrapped herself in her cloak and hurried forward. She easily found Castile, a pool glassy still in its rock-cut basin at the foot of the sheer cliff. It was quite deserted and hidden from the road. Birds fluttered up at her approach, a solemn place. She looked about her. In mortal fear, she took off her cloak and dropped her chiton to her feet. So like a white nymph, very small, at the foot of the cliff, Theria stepped down into the sacred pool. She met the icy water with her shivering cry, but she took the plunge. No one might enter the temple who had not first bathed here. She came out tingling, touched with ecstasy. For holy Castalia cleansed the soul as well as the body. Quickly she put on her garments, quickly walked back to the precinct. She dared not even think now of the difficulty of the entrance. One terrible moment would decide. She mounted the six steps to the precinct gate, dipped her trembling fingers in the lustral bowl, then knocked. They were great bronze doors opening inward. At once came steps within and the clanking of heavy keys, the rasp of the unlocking. Then the door slowly, stingily opened. When she saw the keeper's hideous face at the crack, her courage sank in her. I want to come into the sanctuary, said her faint voice. I want to pray to the God. I would like to make a sacrifice. 
You can't consult no priest now, said the man. They're just getting out of their beds. Behind the man, she saw the glitter of the armed guard. I do not want to consult a priest. I want to pray, to pray for myself and my house. Women like you ain't got no house. Now get along with you. He was shutting the doors. Desperately, she laid her hand in the crack. I pray you, I pray you, she cried. Then she tore off the hemation which wrapped her head. Judge you whether I have a house or no, lifting her face. I am in the candor. Great gods in Olympus, quoth the keeper. You sure be. He opened the doors slowly, hesitating even yet. The guard fell back. Line for line and feature for feature, murmured the keeper of the keys. That daughter of Nicander's. It's crazy, she is. I've heard of her. Darius slipped through the narrow opening. She was within, locked into a wilderness of beauty. Multitudes of little temples, red, blue, and gold. Multitudes of statues, some of hoary eld, some glossy new. Statues of wood, marble, bronze, standing under graceful porticos, or standing bareheaded by the wayside looking out dreamily from lifelike eyes. And over all the still holiness of the morning, the unearthly light, whose steady increase affected her spirit like a joyous, irresistible call. A child set free in fairyland? Oh, theory was more than that. A soul set in heaven, if ever heaven came down to earth. And in sooth, it sometimes does. Theria's soul leapt up from its depths. Suddenly she could not see for the tears which filled her eyes. She brushed them away impatiently. She must not waste one moment of her seeing. Right at her hands stood the Athenian gift after Marathon, statues of Athenian gods and heroes standing so friendly, mortal with immortal, together in their portico. Ah, Athena, thou art dreaming of thine own hill in Athens, she cried, moving closer. No, thou must not. Be happy here, dear Athena. Bred in the worship of images, Daria quite forgot that all these were not alive. Here was Miltiades, he who nine years ago had won the battle of Marathon. He was a noble statue in the new manner, almost a portrait, with his curling beard and fearless eyes. Daria touched his robe. It was thou who saved Hellas, she said seriously. Oh, thou couldst do it. Thou hast the look. Suddenly Theria realized that the light was much increased. She had told her name at the gate. That would mean quick capture. She must hasten. Before her the white sacred way zigzagged boldly among the treasuries up to the lordly temple of Apollo above them all. In Delphi there is neither near nor far, but only below and above. Swiftly Theria chose out what she must see and what she must pass by, perhaps never to see again, for though she might some day walk here in processions, she could never linger as now. Every object had its story, history she would have called it, for she believed them all. Here nearby was the Argive bronze horse given to commemorate the wooden horse which Odysseus made and gave to Troy. Everyone knew that tale. And here was the Siconian treasury. Therium must see that because it was the first little temple at the wayside and was very old. It was round with a circle of chaste pillars upholding the roof. She mounted the three shallow steps. The doors had been just opened, for some god had destined her to go in. The little circular cella held many treasures, but of these Theria saw only the central one, a book unrolled upon a marble table. The antique lettering was of pure gold. Eagerly she began to read. No one had told her of this book. It was the epic poem of Aristomachy, 
of Erythrae, a woman. Aristomache had won the prize at the Isthmian Games. Of course, it was long ago, but a woman had won it. The poem, how lovely, how much more noble than Theria's, but a woman's, a woman's. Theria would try again, try to reach the high goal this woman had set. Oh, she would try soon. She was heartened and came out of that treasury with shining, purposeful face. Theria had lingered here longer than she had intended. In haste, she had to pass the treasuries higher up the way, the Nidian, a little temple exquisite as a jewel lifted high upon its tower-like foundation, its porch upheld by tall, long-haired maidens. Kore, she called them. She began to meet caretakers on the way, yawning after their night watch, going to their homes. Now came the first turn upward of the way. Here stood her beloved Noxian Sphinx, the one the top of whose wing she had always glimpsed from her window. How wonderful now, close at hand, high on her high pillar, her breast covered with brilliant feathers, her blue wings flung up lofty to the sky, her woman's face dreamily smiling. Ah, well, she kept her wisdom to herself, Mistress Sphinx. Therian knew she was dreaming tenderly over the silent dead, for she was Gi, mistress of earth and underworld. Theria climbed dreamily higher up the way, passing now the threshing floor where Dryas had enacted the play. Memories, stories, faiths, all these swam together in her mind until she dreamed herself away and became part of the posy about her. Now the sacred way made its last steep turn. From here, the whole Delphic Vale burst into view. The way here ran upward and clung against the wall-like foundation of the great temple. But on its outer side was a veritable Olympus, full of gods and godlike men, statues which would remake art if we could but see them now. All were in action, Achilles on horseback and his beloved young Patrocles running beside the horse and gazing up at him. Apollo and Heracles both grasping the tripod, for they had once had a quarrel over it. The mother Leto and sister Artemis were trying to quiet the angry god, and Athena was quieting the boisterous hero. The eyes of these statues were set with living colored stones, and looked in anger, command, compassion, whatever they willed. No wonder Theria shrank from them a little afraid. Suddenly, Theria was aware beyond the statues of the great depth of veil, the Plistos, a silver ribbon visible for miles, the hills away and away, and ah, the direct golden sunlight in the long level shafts flooding the vale. The sun had risen high over the mountain. Her time was almost spent. She fairly ran up to the remaining way to the platform of the great temple. She stood breathless, awed before the greatest temple of all Hellas. It was pure Doric. Grandeur spoke from its mighty columns, repose from its perfect roof. It was at once solemn and tender, man's thought of God made visible, and indeed the God breathed forth in every line of it. No mere thing of white marble was this. Gorgeous, it faced the sunrise, crimson of column, blue and orange of architrave, and golden griffined at eaves and peak. The doors were newly opened, and he who had opened them was busily brushing the threshold with a laurel branch for broom. He was singing softly to himself, happy young priest at his happy task. Theria came softly nearer. She knew what was in the temple, every bit of sacred furniture and age-old thing. She wanted to see each object, to treasure it in her heart forever. The young priest saw her and stopped his sweeping in amazement. May I go in? she asked. You know very well you may not, was his answer. Unlike the rude porter, he knew that Theria was a lady. 
I cannot imagine, Despina, how you managed to come up here. I cannot imagine either, she answered. The joy of it overcame her, and she laughed, a gay ripple of laughter. This angered the young man. You had no business to come here, he said severely. You have disobeyed in coming, that I know, or you would not be alone. Just at this moment, an eagle circling down from the cliffs above made a swoop like a falling stone for the altar where the early sacrifice lay. Instantly, the young man seized a bow near at hand for such a venture, lifted it Apollo-wise, and shot the bird. Then he bounded down the temple steps to seize it, and Theria, quick as thought, darted into her beloved fane. How lofty it was within, the flickering light from the hearth flame playing everywhere and meeting palely the day that poured in at the eastern door. This hearth flame was eternal and must never go out. An old priestess was tending it. There you paused by the famous navel stone which marked the center of the earth. Who knows how many thousands of years men had worshipped it. It was a rude stone, but immeasurably holy. Two golden eagles were perched either side of it, commemorating those whom Zeus had sent to meet at Delphi. Farther within, near the statue of the fates, was Pindar's chair, waiting for him always to come and sit and sing inspired songs, the songful Apollo welcoming the human singer and giving him of his own divine fire. There he bent and kissed the chair for the love she bore the poet. As she did so, her shoulder was seized and roughly shaken. What? Do you mean by coming in here when I had forbidden you, said the furious priest. There he was too startled to speak. Answer me, he shouted. I had wished for this, she faltered. Perhaps I can never come. I should say not. There he came to herself and stood like a tall goddess. How dare you speak to me like that, she cried. How dare dare you? But the priest seized her shoulder again. Get out, he stormed. The priests even now are coming up the road with visitors. Get out, I say. There he had no time for either dignity or resistance. The youth pushed her out of the cella, across the temple porch, and down the steps. She fled across the platform. A single glance showed her the whole precinct below the little shrines, unearthly in new golden light, the bronze tripods all a glitter. Yes, and the way, the priest coming up the way. She was in terror, not of punishment, but of more unkindness. She was almost sobbing. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The Perilous Seat this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dales Nedecker. In Pleistus Woods. She sped across the road and hid behind the Folkian offering. She could hear the priest's pleasant voices talking of Delphi. From where she stood, a little path set out here, behind the shrines and treasuries. She followed it to the precinct wall and went searching for a side gate. Found one at last. The keeper was almost asleep. Let me pass out, she commanded. Let me pass at once. The man spat. Now, missy, this here locks rusty. You go down on to the big gate. It won't be far. I will not go to the great gate. Be quick, or I shall have you punished. Theria's voice had a ring of command. Besides, she did not speak the dialect of women, but the speech of men. I will, Missy, I will, hastily said the man, fishing the key from his belt and fitting it. Noisily it creaked. Theria twisted her fingers in nervous fear. 
She could hear footsteps again. The precinct was filling. It's awful rusty, Missy. I can't. Oh, Hermes, there it goes. The door swung open and Theria darted out. Her precinct hour was over. Where now to go? What to do? She was bitterly lonely. Dryas can come to the precinct whenever he will, she thought heartbrokenly. And father brings him there and tells him all things. But I, I am hounded out as if I were a thief. She would not go home. No, she would not go home, not yet. She crossed the highway into the eastern end of Delphi Town and passed down through it to the glen. The glen was deeper here, even wilder, than where she had seen it below her home. It was so steep that no buildings could cling. It was given over to wild olives and laurel trees with gnarled roots, and to huge rocks, the gift of earthquakes from the cliffs above. Theria pushed doggedly down through it, tearing her hands, bruising her feet. At last, after a special tumble, she curled up her long chiton, pulling it up through her belt, took off her hemation and formed it into a long roll, which she tied about her waist. She was amazed at the ease this gave her. No wonder the goddess Artemis could leap after the stag in this her special costume. Now she was in the midst of stark, slender pine trees, which soared from the vale into the height to feather out against the sun. She paused with upturned face. Are they always so solemn thoughted, these dryads here? She asked herself, for of course each tree had its dryad, and the mood of the tree was the dryad's own mood. Do they always pray so seriously to their father Zeus? Theria would never willingly have come into the forest. No Greek would have exchanged the man-beautified sanctuary for this wild. But once here, the forest mysteriously received her. She, who had never before known the sweet ministration of trees, began to be strangely quieted. The forest distances, infinite yet hidden, mobile, shifting with her every step, what a relief after the rigid walls of her house. How twilight dim it was. Yet sunlight filtered through the dimness. Pools of gold among the tree roots. Shatterings of gold on boles and boughs. Beneath her feet, which had never trod aught save floor and pavement, was the deep pine needle mass springy under her step. She looked down, wondering at it a carpet no hands had ever woven, or perhaps a carpet woven by some delicate god. So the forest silence entered her heart, the silence which is not silence at all, but the deep breathing of all living things. She seemed to have grown wings which would make her essentially free, no matter in what house of stone or clay. But no, it was not the forest itself which received Theria. She could never have conceived such a thought. It was rather the thousand delicate dwellers of the wood. Dryads, fawns, satyrs, nymphs. These were touching her with unseen hands. These were they who dogged her footsteps with invisible service, who ceased from their gay dances, slipping into invisibility that she might move across their place. Did she not see their layers among the ferns? and the footprints, perhaps, of Artemis herself, where she had crushed the starry mosses. Most of these beings were sinister. They could lay spells upon you. They could whisk you away into sleep. But today they had no mischief in their hearts. They were only kind. Gradually came sweeping across the silence the voice of a rushing stream. Theria pushed forward eagerly to behold it. A lovely living thing, leaping, running, singing between its banks. It was the same little stream she had seen falling down Castile's gorge, here set free on the hillside. Who has not been touched by the immortal force of moving water? Surely Theria was touched by it. She knelt by the stream, stooped her dark head low, her breast among the fern, and drank. 
The ineffable fragrance of the waterfall met her, a fragrance new to Theria. Did not the gods breathe fragrance such as this? Ha, the nymph Castilia, her veritable presence. Theria sprang to her feet, hiding her face. At any moment, Castilia might be visible. No, no, Theria would not spy upon her. Fearfully, she said the accustomed stream prayer, then took off her sandals and waded across. No Greek would cross a stream without first asking its pardon. Once on the farther bank, she quickened her step and began to breathe again. A narrow escape was that from a supernatural sight. Soon noon came lordly into the sky, and afternoon, Theria found herself in the enclosure of Athena Forethought, the farthest shrine of Delphi, or its first, if you came from the east. The Forethought Fane, a little circular temple, was far above her on the road. She could scarce see it for crag and tree. Here, weary with wandering, Theria sat down to rest. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker, May 11, 2022, Westford, Massachusetts. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker the poor slave. And here so late, she met the adventure of her day. Sounds of distress brought her quickly to her feet. She hastily wrapped herself in her hemation. She peered down the slope and could see the figure of a man moving wildly about among the trees. Now he lifted convulsive hands on high, now spread both arms abroad and groaned. Greek woe never repressed itself. It rather flung out, wind-swept, fiery, real. But, thought Theria, this must be some physical agony. She remembered her remedies at home, yet what could she do for the man in this wild place? She started down the hill. Nearer at hand, she saw that the man was a slave, rough-bearded and clad in an old slave cloak. Her adventure with the cruel woman of the morning came back to her. A slave might hail from any barbaric coast. Wild deeds, wild, unthinkable crimes were committed by slaves. Theria stopped in fear, but at that moment the slave saw her. His arms dropped to his sides. He gazed at her wide-eyed, terrible, then suddenly pathetic. For thoughtful one, he faltered, hast thou come to punish or to save? What did the man mean? The forethoughtful one could be none other than Athena herself. Theria laughed outright. Surely you do not think I am the goddess, she queried. The mistake was not unnatural. Theria, slender amid the slender trees, the light behind her, and all in the Athena precinct. However, the man looked a little ashamed. Forgive me, Despina, my lady. I am beside myself. I, you startled me. He was still wondering at her. Are you a priestess? You can see that I am not, she answered businesslike. You are ill. I thought I might help you. Again he wondered at her. Then his face changed back to its misery. I am not ill, Despina, not bodily ill. My courage is gone. The gods know how I shall ever pick it up again. What took your courage? He began to pace again. A slave's tale, a miserable slave's tale. Why should you hear it? Oh, mistress, you can do nothing, nothing. Yet he burst out with the telling. My freedom money, it is gone, gone, I tell you. My damned master knew all the while where it was hid. He let me work and hope and hoard it. And now when all but two drachmae are there, he held out his hand with these last coins. He came and seized it the beast. How can the just gods let such a man walk the earth? Theria came nearer, interested, absorbed. You mean that you earn the money to buy your freedom? Yes, Despina, to buy it from Apollo. He was referring to one of the noblest customs of the oracle. Both of them knew it well. 
a slave might sometimes be so fortunate as to get money to buy himself from his master, but the Greek master could seize him again and once caught, the slave had no redress. But Apollo of Delphi would buy slaves. They could come to his temple and pay the money down to the god. The terms of the transaction were engraved on the stones of the temple foundation for all men to see. Then the slave went free, protected by this divine ownership. No former master would dare touch him. Wherever the former slave might go, he was under divine protection, Apollo's ward. How long did it take you to earn the money? She asked. Four years, mistress, oh gods, four long years. I cannot do it again. And if I did, would not my master seize it as before? How did you earn it? My work is in the pottery, lady, the pottery there below the hill toward Kirha. He showed her his hands marred with the clay. It is I who make the best pictures on the pots. I like those pictures, spoke Theria. They are beautiful, those gods and men that you make. Tears ran straight down the man's sturdy cheeks. Praise was rare for a slave. Do you think so? he queried. Do you think so, my lady? Theria did not answer. She was thinking. My father now, if you could bring your money to my father, each drachme as you earn it. Do you mean me to begin all over again, my lady? Then I will. If only my master does not take me away from the pottery. He wants me for a body servant. He is always threatening to take me for a body servant. But to be a body servant is easier, said Theria. Privately, she was wondering what sort of a body servant this uncouth man would make. I hate to be a body servant, he said loathingly. Besides, I would not then know where to turn to earn extra money. Suddenly, Theria clapped her hands with a cry of delight. I have it, I have it, she said. I can help you myself. The man gazed at her as if his faith in her goddesshood had quite returned. I have jewels, she went on, moving her hands in her excited telling. They are ancestral jewels and were given me at my birth. I am supposed to give them to my first daughter at birth. Well, my first daughter can do without them. They are rich pearls. They are worth more than the price of a slave. Lady, lady, oh, they would free me at once. Yes, free you at once, but the matter is dangerous. The priests may think you have stolen the jewels. If they do, call for Nicander's daughter. Yes, blessed one. And when you go to the precinct, ask for Cobon as your priest. The Cobones are angry with us and have never been in our house. Cobon will not recognize the jewels. Yes, yes, he said as if in a dream. But how to get them to you? Mother will not allow me. Father will not. Balte, no, no slave would dare do it for me. Besides, I hate to let slaves know anything. They are so apt to tell. The man started out of his dream. I will not tell, Despina. You, she laughed. No, of course not. You will be hastening off as far as you can go. You will be free. Then she added quite unintentionally, Yes, you will be free, and I will be in my room again, shut in, always shut in. Of course, Theria did not say this to the slave. She said it to herself, because on a sudden she felt weak and discouraged, felt her capture very near. The slave, however, took note of her saying, How strange, he said, how strange I never thought. What is strange? She demanded, I never thought, Despina, that wives and maidens cared to walk abroad. They keep the house and seem all content. It was the same comment that the lad Sophocles had made, the very same. It aroused her sudden anger and flood of speech. Oh, yes, be content, be content. You and a slave dare mock me with that. And you yourself, what do you want with your freedom? Why aren't you happy making pots? What is the difference between making pots and spinning wool? What is the difference between obeying a master and obeying a father, brother, uncle, cousin, every man that is your kin? What have I to look forward to? What to do to do? 
The man fairly trembled before her outburst. Despina, dear, dear lady, he kept trying to make her listen. I, fool that I was not to understand the beautiful one. Despina, hear me. Something in the man's ardent voice frightened Theria. She stumbled to her feet, but the man came nearer. Despina, oh poor lady, you have been away from home many hours, have you not? How dare you question me? She walked away. She was dizzy, staggering. The man was following her. What would he do? Seize her? Carry her to Nicander's house for reward? Perhaps do worse than that. Do not go, he urged. Mistress, you are famished. Forgive me, but we slaves know the look. He snatched from his wallet the rough brown bread, the day's slave ration. He pushed the bread into her hand. I pray you eat it, not fit for you. Oh, I know that. But if you do not eat, you will faint here in the wood. She turned to him. Then suddenly she laughed. Hungry? Why, of course, I never thought of hunger. She sat down, broke the tough bread, and began to eat. The man ran down the hill to the stream and returned with a little cup, one from his pottery, brimming with fresh water. As he offered it, he trembled and spilled it awkwardly. Forgive me, lady, I am not a house slave. How breathless he seemed from his short run. Dear lady, he added gently as to a child, do not eat so fast. I will guard. I will let no one come. I have cheese too, but I was afraid to give you that. I could not eat their cheese at first myself. But she took it eagerly. It was atrocious stuff, smelling horribly and perfectly green of color. Isn't it strange, she said. It tastes as good as the daintiest fish. I never was hungry like this before. My lady has never been in the forest before, said the man. The house breeds no appetite. I have long been without food, she confided to him now. I ran away before dawn, and I never thought to eat. I walk up into the sanctuary and saw all the gods and temples and golden tripods, Oh, if they take me home and whip me now and put me in the dark, they can never take that away from me. Whip? Great Zeus, who would dare do that? No one, no one, she quickly answered. Of course, that was only jest. But his eyes still held the horror of it as he watched her. Do you know, she said as she finished the last morsel, this bread has given me all the rest of my precious day. With my hunger... I would have had to go home. May it give you your hours, said the slave devoutly. You who are giving me a life of freedom. Something in this manner of speech caught her notice. It was well tuned, and he used quaint words which she had never heard before. You have not always been a slave, she concluded. No, Despina, that is why it is so hard to be a slave. And when I saw the years ahead, once more I cursed the gods. Then you came, and I thought you were Athena come to punish me for the cursing. Even now, dear lady, I would not be amazed if you were to grow suddenly tall and rise up or through the trees. He made an eloquent gesture. Then his eyes grew fixed, staring at a place up the hill. Who's that? He whispered sharply, Do you know them? She followed his look. Balte, she spoke almost with a sob, and dry as my brother. Then she collected her thoughts and began to talk quickly. The jewels, I have not told you how to get them. There is a little street beside Nicander's house, and a window in the house that side. Come at twilight, I will throw them down to you. She hardly said the last word when the slave disappeared among the bushes. Then she forgot him. Dryas was there with his scorn, Balte with her tears. She had to face both. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker The Shattered Cup Bitterness and confusion were Theria's portion when she reached home. 
Melantho was ill from anxiety and stormed alternately at Theria for her misdeed and at poor Balte for not taking better care of her. Dryas was very superior and very wrathful. The slaves whisked hither and yon, some delighted with the fuss, others scared as to which way the storm might strike. Lycophron treated everything with amused scorn, whether of Theria or her tormentors could not be told. Nicander was away. But the whipping he will give you when he comes, declared Melantho, will make that other whipping seem a caress. Theria waited in dumb terror, not of the whipping, but of her own reaction to it. She would fight back. Oh, the disgrace of that! Deeper than all that was the fear of losing the last of her father's love. She had been sent to her room and poor Balte watched her like a Cerberus. No chance to be throwing jewels from windows even if Theria had thought of it. As a matter of fact, she forgot it utterly. It was next morning before she met her father. His face was darker than she had ever seen it. He seemed to look at her strangely and from a great distance. Oh yes, Theria, he said, putting his hand to his head. I am in too great anxiety to care whether you are punished or not. Father, she exclaimed, instantly concerned for him alone. What? What has happened to you? The Medes are at our door, child, he strainedly answered. And at present, I see no one who is going to resist them. She laid her hand upon his arm, but he hurried away out of the house. All that day, Theria was in disgrace. Her mother set her an extra long task of weaving and with extra severity, made her ravel out all her mistakes. These were many. Theria could think of nothing but her father's worried words. The Medes are at our door. The phrase rang over and over again in her ears. The Medes were the Persians. Did father mean that the Medes were in Phocis or on Mount Parnassos itself? How soon would they fall upon Delphi? Oh, if she could only question her mother. But her mother would know nothing about it. In the midst of her worry, her promise to the slave concerning the jewels flashed across her mind. But it was last night I was to give him the jewels. Last night, poor slave. He must have come and gone away again. Will he come tonight? Or oh, sure, he will. She went immediately to her room and took from her jewel box a necklace. It was of pearl strung upon horse hair. A mother of pearl amulet depended from it. This she tried to remove, for it was characteristic, easily identified. But a sound along the corridor made her swiftly hide the necklace and all in her bosom. Moments alone were rare today. She must have the jewels ready. Of course, the adventure pleased her. She was young and she was Theria. After the family had dispersed from the last meal of the day, she sped away to the back storeroom. There at the window she waited. Never had so many steps sounded in the house, coming near the door, passing and repassing. Never had the lane re-echoed so loudly, the footsteps from the highway. Again and again, she thought people must be entering the lane itself. Once Neria came into the storeroom to fetch wheat for the kitchen. But it was by no means unusual to find the little mistress sitting in that window and Neria went innocently away. Down in the lane, the shadows crept closer. Deep twilight now. There among the jagged rocks at the lane's end was a denser shadow. Suddenly, bird swift, the shadow darted forward and stopped under her window. She leaned out. St, is it you, slave? The bearded face uplifted itself, the hands as well. She could see this in the dimness. Oh, marvel of kindness, came a low voice. I knew you could not fail. But I forgot yesterday. Hold your hands up close together. Careful now. She dropped the pearls and he caught them easily. But he still stood in his place. They did not whip you yesterday, Desponia. Tell me they did not, he whispered. Of course not, fool. Go quickly. You will be caught. Go. He flung his hands upward again. Poor creature. The gesture was a very speech of gratitude. Then he slipped back to the enfolding rocks. Theria suddenly recalled 
how once she had found a bird in the court and had taken it to this window to set it free. Even so had it flung itself off and was gone. Her fancy pictured the slave hiding for the night among the rocks. Then at the break of day, hurrying down to the prison to purchase freedom from the god. Ah, by tomorrow he would be miles and miles away. He would not wait for the jewels to be questioned. That problem would be hers. She went off to bed singing softly a little tune. Next afternoon, Olen, her father's slave, came into Theria's room. He seemed furtive in his errand. I was to give you this, he said, and handed her a small two-handled bowl. He was for hurrying out, but Theria stopped him. What is this, Olen? she asked. You know the best, mistress, he said, hiding a smile. It was a shallow bowl, one of those made in the pottery below the hill. Within the bowl was a delicate figure of the goddess Athena. So the letter said above the figure. She was bestowing something upon a supplicant who stood before her. Who gave you this bowl, Olen? asked Theria, puzzled. A man, mistress, a sorry-looking slave with clay matted in his hair. Theria turned the bowl about. On the underside was an unburned painting of a youth standing tiptoe with his arms outstretched as if to fly. The drawing was exquisite, but exquisite drawings were common in Greece. Above the youth was crawled. Eleutheria gives freedom. Theria blushed slowly, angrily red. She held forth the bowl and broke it into shards against the house wall. Olen, she said sternly, never bring me messages, never bring me gifts. End of chapter 15 Read by Madhushri Nellore, March 20, 2022. Section 16 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedeker. Gathering the Threads. Nikanda had spoken of the Medes, but in a voice so low that none but Theria heard. Theria, Nikanda knew, would not give way to fear. However, she did give way to curiosity. She questioned Medan, but Medan would tell her nothing. Your father has forbidden us, Missy, was his word. She plied Allen with questions, but Allen backed away from them with a skill which slaves acquire. As for Balte, she could only say, Oh, darling, it is tribes and tribes of men, all the men in the world, coming against our Greece, and the king at their head is a god. Where he will, he knocks the mountain over, like that. And when he will, he makes the sea dry land for his tribes to walk over. He is going to burn every city in Greece. Theria, what with her love of her land and her love of mere knowing, felt actually ill from all this bafflement. Late in the afternoon, she caught Lycophron walking across the Aula. Lycophron, stay with me. Talk with me only a little while. I'll have all and bring wine and fresh cakes. Now, sis, what are you up to? he asked. Her eyes were wide and starry. At such times, they had the look of being new opened like a child's. And Sears put wine before the mariners, he quoted, laughing. She finished the lines. You rogue, he said. I believe you know the whole Homer by heart. Very improper for a girl. No, I don't. I only know most of the Odyssey. But don't talk about that, please. Oh, please tell me of the war. She caught his arm pleadingly. Nobody but you will ever tell me anything. I am not afraid about the war. But you'd better be, he said shortly. Old Baltus says the great king is a god who makes the land a sea and the sea dry land. Well, do you know that is the truth? Almost. Xerxes had dug a canal across the peninsula of Athos beneath the stormy mountain to give safe of passage to his ships, and he has built an enormous bridge across the Hellespont for his tribes to walk over. They were nine days and nights passing over the thing, a constant stream. It seems foolish of him to transport so many men to Greece. He could conquer our little state with a fifth of that number. Do you mean he brings too many? queried Theria keenly. Gods know, the great king knows what he is about. He's an enemy to be reckoned with. I don't say we should throw up our hands and medis all at once, 
But surely we should treat with him before we try to fight him. Why should we go out with a handful of men and ships to be butchered? Shut! He snapped his fingers scornfully. That tempeh business. Do you know about tempeh? No, breathlessly. Well, they started out, the Athenians and the Spartans together, and... Now, sis, you may as well know that the Persians are coming really against Athens and Sparta. Them only. None of the rest of us are in this fight at all, and I say there's no need of throwing ourselves into it like geese. Well, they start out, these Athenians and Spartans, and go to the Vale of Tempe, where they say there is a pass where they can keep the Persians from coming through. And when they get there, they find two passes into Greece instead of one pass to defend. So back they come like whipped curs. I can hear the Persian king roar with laughter when he hears of it. This was last week. The news of their fizzles all over Hellas. It's taken the heart out of everyone. You've seen a hare sitting with ears up, ready to run. That's the way we are. Oh, breathe, Daria. She was leaning forward, drinking the news. That is what ails father. That tempe failure. Not that he is scared, she corrected herself, but so troubled, so deeply troubled. Yes, he's troubled. The difficulty with father is he is trying to butt into a stone wall. I suppose he'll see after a while, the old dear. Don't call him that like a fron. Father isn't old. What do you mean by butting a wall? Like a fron stretched out his hands, yawning. Oh, sis, you want to know the history of the oracle since the time of Gaia, he said. Then suddenly a shrewd, purposeful look came into his eyes. Look here, puss. If I tell you about it, will you try to help father? Father's going against the oracle. The Pytha says one thing, but father thinks another. Now Theria's faith in her father was second only to her faith in her god. He wouldn't do that, she exclaimed. How can you say that, father? Father is- Now, now, don't get so hot all of a sudden. Wait till you hear. Athens has sent to Delphi, asking, Shall we fight the Persian, and if so, how will we come out? The Pytha gave them a discouraging answer. Then the Spartans came, discouraging answer again. Something about a king shall die to save you. But not clear. Now father wants them to keep on asking again and again until better answers come. That's pretty near sacrilege. He paused a moment. All the answers are the same, sis. The answer to the Cretans. I heard that myself. Heard the priestess give it. Confused, of course, but after the priests deliberated over it. Clear as a whistle. Keep out of the fight, it said. Do you want to be whipped like the Phokians whipped you? Now father is horrified at that. He says the oracle meant nothing of the kind. He had a terrific argument against all of them in the council. He's making enemies left and right. What worries me is that man Coben. The Coben family have always hated us. And Coben, well, he'd like to destroy father. Now here is his chance. Sooner or later, he'll do it unless father stops what he is doing. Theria was speechless with horror. Lycophron leaned toward her earnestly. Look here, sis. Why don't you talk with father? You. I can't talk to him anymore. He won't listen to me. Try to tell him what I've told you. Of course, he'll be angry. He'll say you know nothing about it. But it may count if you tell him you've been warned. He's bitter discouraged now. It may count. Will you do it? Yes, oh yes, she said. Lycophron kissed her. He was really an affectionate fellow and considered his sister a charming child. Then he hurried out of the house. Her father was in danger. Her father might be destroyed. This fact overtopped all others in Theria's loving mind. Even the impending war was dim in this presence, and at nightfall, Theria learned that her father had gone away from Delphi. He had gone on some mysterious business. Lycophron had seen him depart, but even he did not know Nicander's destination. For the next two weeks, Theria was well nigh impossible to live with. Her temper took fire at everything. I cannot sit and spin, she declared. Ah, gods, but I cannot. She threw down her distaff, defying her mother's authority. In her room, she paced up and down, maddening for activity. If only father were here, she would repeat. If only here, so that I might plead with him to keep out of danger. But if Nicander should come, would she dare to question him and his state policies? Never in her life had she doubted her father's wisdom. Theria had in some way gleaned a knowledge of Nicander's far-reaching powers. 
the candor, who seldom thought in terms of the individual, but nearly always in terms of the state. But now his stagecraft was bringing him into personal danger. That very danger made him seem to her in the wrong. Yet to question him face to face, that seemed to Theria the height of impity. What could she, an ignorant girl, say to so wise a statesman? Yet persuade him she must. He was in danger, in danger. From this perturbation, Theria found her old solitary place in the back storeroom and only refuge. Here she could at least breathe the air, could see the turbulent stream, could watch the gradual rise of nooning light or its golden decline. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker. A Youth Under the Window. One evening she had sat there until the violet twilight gathered and the stream down in the lane ran uproarious among the damp mists. Presently she heard footsteps, and looking down, saw emerge from the hill a youth, a beautiful lithe fellow, walking with that swift grace that youth is heir to. He looked directly to her window, and threw out both arms as if in surprise and greeting. Theria retired at once. She was quick enough for adventure, but not this sort of adventure. She had no taste for romantic secrecies, but the youth stopped under her window. Lady, he called, low but intensely, for the love of the gods, do not go away. I have not come to harm you. Something in his tone, earnestness, a tragic need, brought her back to the window. There he was standing, with an upturned face, beautiful in the twilight. But now having her in sight, he did not speak. He only lifted up his hands towards her, in an energy as though he would spring upward. Could this be her cousin Aegis, or Cara Minor? one of those with whom she played as a child. Was he bringing her news of her father? He seemed to have come with purpose. What news have you, cousin? she asked anxiously. The news that I see your face, your face, answered the astonishing fellow. Oh, all my happiness harks back to you. All my freedom to be a man is of your making. Do not wonder that I thank you, that I must see you and speak my thanks to your face. Every breath waking and sleeping, I thank you. But who are you? asked Theria, amazed. Are you mad? You have nothing to thank me for. He was the more delighted. Oh, hey, my lady, you do not recognize me. Nay, forget the one you saw before. You, with your jewels, have made me a new man. Then Theria's mind leaped back over the two weeks, and she guessed. But love of Leto, you cannot be that slave. No, no, I am not he. I am free. I don't believe you are that slave. You have no look of him. You are straight. You are young. I had almost forgotten I was young. I had kept that disguise so long, and how I hated it. The dirt, the miserable matted beard, the stooping. It took me days to stand straight again. Was it not bad enough to be a slave without making yourself like that? said Theria disgustedly. Dear maid, I had to keep so. They would certainly have sold me into Persia. There was a great price in the East for beautiful men. He did this frankly of himself as a matter of course. Indeed, there was something startling in his beauty, an ethereal quality, though he was manly too, but now so full of delight that he seemed like a child. He began hurriedly to tell her of himself. Dear lady, I was not born a slave. You will believe that. I was taken at sea by pirates. The whole ship seized. They put us below in the dark hold of their ship and fed us on nuts. That first night I blacked my face with the nut hulls. I exchanged garments with the meanest man among us. I- But why? asked Theria. I had heard the sea robbers upon deck above talking of me, and how they would sell me to the Persian court. A horror crossed the youth's sensitive face. Lady, he said, the Persians would have shamed me and made me worse than a slave. I would do anything to escape that. In the morning when the pirates came down looking for me, they thought their beautiful youth had jumped overboard. Stupid Phoenicians. This odyssey was holding Theria fascinated. She forgot all the proprieties. She forgot that the youth might be lovemaking. 
Her mind had moved so many days in a doomed circle that now it spread wings of new life. But you got home again. However did you manage that? She questioned. For long I was a galley slave, but one day when the ship stopped at Corinth, I won the captain's attention and told him of my skill in making gods of stone. Then he sold me to an image maker, and the image maker again to the owner of the pottery here. Oh, those days at the pottery, those endless days. The dirt, the sweat, the low talk, the beatings of work was not swift enough, for I was not a swift worker. I had to make even those poor, slight drawings as beautiful as I could. My only life was in them. I would dream over them. Then the overseer would beat me. But those days are over. Think of it, lady. Can you think how happy I am being away from that? Great Hermes, yes, and then you went up the precinct with my jewels? Yes, blessed one. The next morning after you gave me them, the good God freed me. I came down out of the precinct gate, knowing that I was free. I went straight to Argos. I think I sang all the way. Argos is my home. His face saddened unexpectedly. Dear lady, I had been long away. I found that my father was dead, and also my lady mother for the grief at losing me, and and I found something worse than that, even than that. Great Hera, he lowered his voice. Argos had mediaized. My father's dearest friend confessed it to me. The Argives say they are bargaining for the headship of the all-Greek army. They are really doing nothing of the kind. They have mediaized. They have made a real compact with Persia, nothing less. Lady, I had lived so long in dread of Persian slavery, and there at home to meet it again. But I will not meet it, he cried with sudden energy. I will not. So I have come back here to Delphi, but I loved Argos so dearly. Of course you did. Your home. Dreadful. Argos mediaized. There we hardly know that she spoke. I'll fight the Persians here. Here in Delphi. You will surely need every man you can get. I shall become a Delphian. I have a little fortune, lady, he added, very businesslike. My father's good friend saved it for me. I can buy citizenship in Delphi. Then suddenly the moral of the tale was out. And lady, with my fortune and my citizenship, I shall ask your father for your hand in marriage. But not against you will. I will not enslave you who have made me free. Oh, dearest lady, love me, love me, love me, he hurried on. Cannot you see what the Cyprian has done to me toward you? Theria rose from the window as though the youth had struck her. How dare you, how dare you, she gasped. Words not meet for a maid to hear. Lady, she called so loud that she came back to her window for a very caution. Hush, hush, she whispered. Will you disgrace me? No, no, lady, I pray for you. I bless you to the immortal gods. He beat his palm against the house wall for emphasis. Can you stop the stream of Castellet flowing down from the cliffs? He questioned passionately. No more can you stop the stream of my love. It will refresh and bless you whether you will or no. Ah, what I would do for you, dear child, if only I might. He tossed with a skillful fling a bunch of fresh ferns into her window. Then he was gone. If the stream of Castellet had indeed fallen on Theria's head, she could hardly have been more shocked. She stood in the middle of the room, angered into tears, hurt, strangely frightened. How dared the man return her kindness in this fashion? When a man wanted a friend, he took a man, creature of his own mental stature, not a girl. Well did Theria know that lovemaking was disgraceful, and not for high-born maids. Pure girls dreamed of marriage, of course, but not of love. Theria had dreamed of neither. She picked up the scattered ferns and tossed them out the window. The delicate scent of the wild wood met her, as she did so. Suddenly, she longed for her mother's touch and voice, even her scolding voice. She hurried out of the room. But as she went to sleep that night, she remembered only that Argos had mediaized. End of chapter 17
gathering more threads. The next morning Nikanda returned to his home. He retired at once to rest after his journey. Theria met him as he came forth again from his room in the late afternoon. It was plain that no sleep had been his. He was haggard. There was something in his face which cut Theria to the heart. She put herself directly in his path. Father, she said, I know your trouble. Do not hide it from me. You think I cannot help you, but, oh, let me try. The love outgoing from her face and from the little trembling gesture of her hand, these he could not choose but see. You say a great deal when you say that you know all about my trouble, he smiled. Don't laugh at me, please. I am a grown woman. I am sixteen years old. What is it you want to know, child? About the Persians, she said breathlessly. She was daring the question now. What a fool she felt herself to be. If they're really coming against only Athens and Sparta, couldn't the other states stand aside and keep out of it? Wouldn't it be best? His face went black. Theria, who has been talking to you? he demanded. Nobody, father. We hear things in the house. We can't help hearing them. I heard, too, that Argos has medais. I wanted to tell you that. The Pythia's answer had nothing to do with it. They made us long before. They are in actual league with the Persian. Nicander looked as if she had dashed water in his face. By the thundering Zeus, how did you know that? The priests only made certain of it last night. It's because I want so much to know, father, that I learn. And I know that you are in bitter danger from Cobon. Are you sure? She caught her breath before the plunge. Are you sure you are right? Are you sure that all the states should fight the Persian? Wouldn't it be better to treat with the Persian just as the oracle bids us do? This time his eyes flashed with anger. Am I to hear myself flouted, he said, by the very women of my household? She suddenly threw both arms about his neck in a passion of tears. No, 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 I am not flouting you. Cobon, he may kill you. Any day he may kill you. "'That side of the question is not to be dwelt upon,' he said severely. He put his arm about her, but his face was like a mask. "'Come with me,' he said. He led her into his room and shut the door. She could not tell whether he would punish her or not. "'Do you know what is meant by treating with the Persian?' he demanded. "'No. It means to be his slave, to submit to his rule in ways that would ruin the freedom of Greece.' We Greeks could meet in our councils, oh yes, we could meet, but the councils would count for naught. The great king's word would be law. It would mean that we would be called out to fight the king's battles, not our own, that he would take our young men to his court and make eunuchs of them, take our young girls for his concubines. Don't you think that any state of Greece should prefer death to such a fate? Yes, oh yes, she whispered with wide eyes. At last she was to know the truth. Yet this is the fate you tell me Argos prefers. I suppose, he added whimsically, you know all about the council at Isthmus of Corinth, from which I have just come. No, nothing of that. Then I will tell you. Athens, Sparta, and all the lesser states who want to defend our Hellas have sent representatives to this Congress. They are making our plan for defence. They have sent envoys to all the doubtful states of Greece, begging them to join in the fight. Now, here, my child, is my grief and should be yours. These states, Argos, Crete, and others, sent at once to Arpithia to ask whether or not they should enter the war, and in every case the oracles have been negative. It has been so when there was no need. You know, my child, that oracles are not always clear, just as prayers to the gods are not always answered. And when the oracles are not clear, surely it is because the son of Leto wishes us to use our own wisdom in the interpretation thereof. These oracles to Argos and Crete came forth in confused utterance and would have been interpreted into splendid words of courage to those states. We could have forced them to join the League. Nicander's voice began to ring with his message. He forgot it was only to his daughter, Theria, that he was speaking. She, meanwhile, thrilled and quivered with the sudden enlightenment. Yesterday, she had been for the moment persuaded by Lycophron. But this from her father was the truth, 
so clear that she ought to have known it without any telling. Nikander went on. But all the priests were for bending the oracles the other way. They fashioned them into driveling nonsense, only adding enough of sense to warn the saints away, to make them afraid of fight. Oh, that our Delphi should come to this! The priests themselves are scared. Many of them have visited Persia and remember its vast power. I, too, have visited it. What of it? Cannot they see that in a pass like this the gods will fight on our side? But among all the priests only Timon and I are for the nobler part. I am not accustomed to failure. I do not know how to bear it. His head bowed, but it lifted again quickly. But we have not failed yet, Timon and I. There are yet Athens and Sparta for us to help. Suddenly he seemed aware of his daughter. He took her hand. Athens and Sparta prefer death to the Persian rule. They are going to fight the Persian, though he be twenty times their number. Do you see nothing fine in that, my child? Her wide-open eyes answered him. Up till now the oracle has disheartened them both. It shall not dishearten them again. Athens and Sparta will certainly visit the oracle once more. If I have to die in giving them the message of the god, that is a small matter. The message shall be given." Theria moved toward him in awed, shining acquiescence. "'Father,' she said clearly, "'if you have to die that way, I will not cry out any more.' Nikander framed her white face in his two hands. "'My darling child,' he said in a kind of amazement, "'how strangely you understand.' She felt his hands tremble, and then he smiled almost merrily. "'But I do not intend to die, Theria. I intend to win.' Her trust in him now was too complete for her even to urge her own help upon him. "'I will not ask you again, father, to make me pithier, but if I can help you that way, or any way, you will let me, you will let me. Persistent, Theria, you cannot help me by being pithier. How many times must I tell you that the pithier is the empty mouthpiece of the god?' "'Yes, father,' she consented. "'You can help me,' he said, "'by keeping up the courage of the household. "'Do not let the slaves talk. "'Don't let your mother cringe and worry. "'Most of all, do not be surprised at anything. "'I'll tell you now the fullness of it. "'The Persians will come to Delphi. "'No amount of treating will keep their greedy hands "'off this rich spoil. "'Our streets will know their footsteps, "'our temples and households the desecration. "'They are a great horde, all the armies of the past taken together will not make the sum of them. Yet we must fight them. There is no other choice, my child. Can you keep a brave heart and stiff will? Yes, she answered. Yes. She went back to her room exalted and actually refreshed. The danger was so great, so certain, that it bred not fear but only a deep solemnity. Nikander, however, walking out into the street, was not encouraged by this conversation, but miserably cast down. He had received sympathy, but not from his sons had he received it. The fullness of Theria's understanding but made him feel the more keenly their aloofness. This poor child, a daughter, wanted to help him by becoming the Pythia, futile effort, yet the only one open to her. His sons, had they desired, might have been already in the priesthood, fighting by his side for this, the greatest cause the oracle had ever known. Meanwhile, he must fight alone. In bitterness of heart, he made his way through the midsummer heat up toward the council house. End of section 18、Chapter、19 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snitaker. The Song Resung. Theria's first thought was to deal with Lycophron. That afternoon she met him in the outer aula. He questioned her first. Sis, did you speak with father? Yes, and oh, Lycophron. Father is right about the oracles. You haven't quite understood. He explained. Shh, he interrupted. I might have known it would turn out that way. You take father for a god. Don't talk that way, Lycophron. 
You know yourself how wise he is. You know how the priests have always looked up to him. Do they? Now, in this crisis? He demanded. No, but that is the more reason we should stand by him. We should think and act with him, like a front... She caught the corner of his hymation, twisting it in her fingers. You could really go into the council yourself if you wished. You are old enough. Your vote would help his. But I wouldn't vote his way, puss. Do talk with father, she pleaded. He will make you understand. He talked of it with me. She said it proudly. How much rather would he talk with you? He would make it all clear. Now, sis, it's you that are butting into a wall. Father and I don't agree in these matters. You're a smart little girl, but don't try to meddle in things too big for you. By the way, when are you to be betrothed? She paled quickly, and Legafron laughed. Theria's reluctance to marriage was a curious streak of idiocy in this quick-witted sister of his. Legafron thought it comic. Great Hermes, what a face you make. Father hasn't said anything about a betrothal, has he? She queried. Well, I won't say whether he has or not, he teased. But I shall remind him. I met Theron the other day. When am I going to get my beautiful wife, says he. Oh, my cofron, please, please, she begged all in a tremble. Don't remind father. Do not tell him what that man... Why, sis, you little fool. A betrothal is a fine festival. And you would be coming right down among the men. It would be the merriest time you ever had in your life. And you, the center of it all. Who would want a merry time? She retorted. When the Persian is coming to tear us to pieces. No. Don't you be scared to death like Dryas. You know I am not scared. She said so indignantly that Lycophron patted her shoulder approvingly. There, there, sis. I won't remind father. But honestly, I do think it is a shame that he forgets to betroth you just because he is so busy in the council. I'm glad he forgets, she said vehemently. I'm glad he forgets. After a moment, she asked with anxiety, But is Dryas really scared? He doesn't say so, but I can tell that he is. He turns white about the lips. Oh, I am so sorry. So sorry, she answered. The breakup of the family front was more serious than she had supposed. But, she concluded, Dryas will stand by father, whatever happens. For a week, Theria kept away from her storeroom in its beloved window. Cruel that the impudent stranger should deprive her of her refuge. The storeroom was her place of intimate solitude. It was saturated with her thought, her dreams, her songs. The little window and the lonely street, all were hers. But after a time, her fears lessened. Surely the youth would not keep coming all this while. Or if he did, she had only to tell her father. Nicander would punish him thoroughly. Yes, and perhaps his daughter also, for being at the window at all. Oh, but the youth must have forgotten. Why need she be anxious? The evening was very hot. The air seemed to press down heavily into the amphitheatre of the mountains. One could hardly breathe. Theria found her window. Darkness had fully come, and the hoped-for breeze. She had sat there for some moments before she realized that the Argive youth was in the lane below. She shrank back, but his first word startled her into speech. Lady Eleutheria, I have asked your father for your hand, he said. But, oh, dear maid, he tells me that you are betrothed. I am not betrothed. I am not betrothed, she cried vehemently. There has been no betrothal. Thank the good gods for that, was the devout answer. Foolishly, she began to argue. But that does you no good. 
No, but at least it does not snatch you quite away. I have learned to hope, Eleutheria. When I was in the galley hold all day, rowing until my back cracked, then it seemed as though I could never be glad again. But I am glad, thanks to you. In the same way, I shall hope that some glorious fate will bring you to me, though so far from me now. I shall make you love me. But I do not love you, said Theria desperately, and you must not come here any more. This window is my solitude. You shall not come to it. Do not say that, he pleaded. You cannot imagine the joy it is to come. I have worn a path on the hillside coming, coming to you. And as I come, my heart lifts and lifts as with a dawning light. Ah, you do not understand it, nor did I, dear child. It is something stronger than I, than you. Each morning, he hurried on, fearful lest she leave him. When I awake and remember that I am free, then your cry comes back to me that you are shut in always, always without hope. My heart breaks. I, too, had been shut in without hope. Therefore, I long to free you. You compare me to a slave? She said sternly. No, no, he cried. If I could only take your hand and show you the beautiful temples of the gods, the cities which I know, the sea. Lady, have you ever seen the sea? No, she answered, very low. Once I had a friend. He was taken prisoner with me on the pirate ship, but he died of the wounds he got shielding me, and I still love him. I thought I could never love anyone in all my life as I love him, but you, dear maid, you are more than that friend. It is strange to say that, but you are my friend and my life. I am no longer my own. His voice changed with awe. Dear lady, it is not Aphrodite's passion that has come upon me. It is the gift of some god loftier than she, perhaps Eros the creator. Try to understand. Just here, the moon sailed clear of the housetops over the way and filled the narrow lane with light. She could see him standing there, his head thrown back to see her, his golden hair bound and crowned. His very standing was elastic, spurning the ground. So much had his few weeks of gymnastic restored to him of Hellenic health and attitude. She could see the curious, searching light in his face, a light of tenderness such as she had never known, but which she recognized as all maidens do. Oh, why did her heart leap? Was she, too, in the power of a god? Now, he startled her yet more. Dear lady, I am coming to this house tomorrow night. I am Nikander's guest. Delphians, though proud as Olympians, were yet the most cosmopolitan of Greeks. They were taught by the oracle to receive all men hospitably. Various dread increased. What would her father think? What might not this strange youth tell? I shall ask to hear that song, added the youth. The prize song which you made for Dryas, your brother. I made no song, she asserted, loyal to her house. Oh, yes, you did. All the precinct whispers that. But I shall know, dear maid, whether the song be yours, if it came from your spirit. It will go to mine. Steps were heard in the lane. She cried out a low warning. Her anger swept back again, that the youth should thus bring her into fear. But he was gone almost before her cry. He was among the hills. Theria turned, dazed from the window. There on the moonlit floor lay flowers strewn, one bunch upon another. Faded ferns, fresh anemones, violets half dry. Evidently a gift for every day. If the youth came in this fashion, sooner or later someone would see him. 
They would punish her. Worse, they would laugh at her. A street song, a vulgar old catch, struck across her mind. One of the common jibes at women. Always as of old, they roast their barley sitting as of old. They on their heads bear burdens as of old. They buy themselves sly dainties as of old. They still secrete their lovers as of old. Ahai, so she had thought herself different. Better. She was like all the other silly women. No wonder the men jibed. Only for a moment had she been guilty, but it was such a vivid, unforgettable moment. The moon had shone so bright upon him. The youth had looked so impossibly beautiful. Fool! The youth was plainly mad. Never would she allow herself to see him again. Wrathfully, she gathered all the flowers at one sweep and flung them far out of the window. Feria had heard of physical love. She had heard of no other kind. How was she to understand this sudden placing of her upon a pedestal? How should she guess that the youth, through the suffering of slavery, through the purity of his gratitude, had stumbled upon an emotion old as creation, beautiful as dawn, strong as life, which the Greeks had utterly quenched and set aside. Next day, sure enough, a feast was preparing in the house. Theria watched fearfully. Was the archive really coming among the other guests? She tried to keep out of her father's way, but she had to face him at luncheon. Nikander, where his family was concerned, was very frank and childlike. Well, Faria, he said, what do you suppose has happened? A young man comes asking for your hand. Faria's heart thumped so that she had to stop eating. His name is Aetion. He is from Argos, one of the handsomest youths I ever saw. What do you think of that, daughter? I... Do not know, she managed to falter. My dear white tremble, smiled her father. The youth does not concern you, but the fellow is curiously headlong. Of course, I did not discuss dower with him, but he offered it. He said, I want no dower. I have seen your daughter in a festival procession. Her beauty is enough without dower. Now, in what procession could he have noticed you? Feria. I do not quite like it that he should have seen you. I do not know, she said, again bowing her head. She was in mortal fear, lest he see her fear. But he turned to Melantho. By Hermes, Melantho, I do like the youth. He quitted Argos because he is too loyal a Helen to stay there. I like that. Timon knew the young man's father, says the family is one of the most upright in Argos. The boy shows his race. Beautiful fellow. Astonishingly beautiful. The Greek could not but dwell on beauty whenever he met it. The children of such a youth would be glorious children. But, father, must I... must I marry an Argive? Nicander threw back his head with laughter. It had been weeks since Theria had heard him laugh. No, Theria, your children would be glorious, but they would not be legitimate. Aetion has purchased citizenship in Delphi, but he is still metic, a foreigner. Of course you will not marry him. Nicander voiced the pride that was in every Greek citizen. The pride and the isolation. No man could take full citizenship in a city not his own. No marriage with a foreigner, born, say, fifty miles distant, was counted legal by any government. This fact, instinctive in Theria's mind, had steeled her heart against the Argive. Oh, what right had he to come to the house, even as her father's guest? She dared not object. She was not supposed to know of his coming. The dinner guests assembled early. Theria and her mother had their supper upstairs. Then Theria went off to bed so as not to hear anything of the feast. But she could not sleep. She did not want the youth to hear her song. 
She tossed and tossed on her hot couch. What must they be doing now at the feast? Talking of the war? Ah, yes, that surely. They would not be singing songs in these war-troubled days, even at Symposia. If she had only dared to ask Dryas not to sing. But was he singing? Oh, if only she knew. Impatiently, she rose and crept to her father's room. Here came up the mingled voices and laughter from the men's porch. Oh, what was that? Why were they suddenly silent? That liar tuning. Then, clear and fateful, came the sound of Dryas's singing. Far, far on the mountain, the feet of the follow striding. The thing always thrilled her, so intimately hers. I shall know, dear mate, whether the song be yours. If it came from your heart, it will go to mine. The Argive's saying was ringing back upon her. He was down there now, listening close to the singer. Almost she could see the listening in his face. And, oh, the song was giving him what she did not want to give. Her intimate, sweetest thought. He would grasp it all. Had he not asserted that he would? She clapped hands upon her ears and fairly ran back to her room. He had no right, that Argive foreigner, to read her soul that way. No right. She lay in her bed trembling. It was long before she could reason with herself and believe that this was a foolish, childish fear. End of chapter 19 Read by S.K. Velt Minneapolis, 7th of September, 2022Chapter 20 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker. Love in the Lane. Faria paced to and fro in the large upper room, weaving. She had unskillful hands for this craft also, as well as for spinning. Her figures of gods were stiff, her colors never true. But these days the long task was grateful. The whole household seemed hushed as before a storm. Even Melantho now knew how near the Persians were. She, too, must be told. Last week they were at Pydna. Today we hear they have reached Larissa in Thessaly. So the vast armies approached nearer, nearer, fateful, certain, awful, and the tiny land toward which they came seemed crouching with arms upheld to ward off a blow. But Melantho was unexpectedly quiet. She had taken charge of the house as never before, and there was need. The slaves were irritable with fear, disobedient. This morning, Olin had run away. As for the Argive youth, Theria had not seen him since the night of Dryas's singing. She had forsworn her beloved window, better so than to see him again, that one moment of piercing beauty in his face. Ah, that had taught her the danger. Tender, conscious child that she was, she was remorseful for every moment that she had lingered at the window listening to his speech. Those moments were not worthy of Nicander's daughter. One day she went into the storeroom to fetch a book roll which she had left there. The floor again was strewn with flowers, faded and dewy fresh, as though thrown there each day. That the archive youth should keep coming, this haunted her. Patient, persistent, each evening lonely in the lane, how was she to drive him from her thoughts? She looked up from her weaving. Her father had opened the curtain of the doorway. He came toward her. There was in his face a finality which brought her to her feet. 
father, the Persians. No, child, answered Nicander's low voice. The delegation of Athenians is in Delphi. Yes, father, I knew that. They have received their answer from the oracle. Child, the message needed no interpreting priest. It was fearful and fearfully clear. The Pythia, in her own voice, in ecstasy upon the tripod, warned them out of the shrine. Quit Athens, was her cry. Flee afar, fire and sword shall come upon your city, and not only yours, but many cities. My temple sweats blood. Get ye away from my holy place and steep your souls in sorrow. Father, how dreadful, horrible. The priests, of course, are horror-struck, but they are triumphant, too. They have prevailed over me. The Athenians, very the Athenians dare not go home with that message. We have told them, Timon and I, not to go home with it. That message would put their armies to rout before the Persians should strike one blow. He stopped. His face took on a deep regret, almost abhorrence. Then he said hurriedly, Faria, I have come to make you the Pythia. It is a last resort. You say you can pray? God grant you can. Oh, my child, Put into this consecration every effort, every spiritual strength you know. She was so dazed that she could only stand before him trying to say, Yes. You will leave the house early tomorrow morning. You will have your days of rites and preparation, but the Athenians will await your days. We will enter the precinct as supplicants, you and I. The Athenians also as supplicants. Supplication may win the god. He put his hands on her shoulders, gazing deeply into her eyes. But his mind was far away, wrapped in the purpose for his state. Faria, the honour of the oracle, the very saving of Athens and of all Hellas are in your hands. Pray. Pray. At the door, he paused again with bent head. You will have your wish now to stay a virgin, and you can never come home again. She was alone. It is in such moments that one grows old. Maturity is not of years, but of such experience. She was neither happy nor sad. What she had desired so long seemed strangely impossible now that it had come to her. There was no exaltation for the great task. She kept naming the task over to herself. I am to win the good oracle which will save Athens. Apollo will give me a good answer if I supplicate. But she felt very dazed. Now she laid aside her hated weaving. It was the last time. The Pythia did not weave. Greater tasks were hers. There is home which had seemed so prison-like. That, too, she was leaving forever. Very quietly, she walked along the balcony to her own room, and there stood thinking. How distant her father had seemed. The great state sorrow weighed him down. He was beyond thought of her, yet there had been something tragic in his face, as though he were laying her as victim upon the altar, rather than lifting her to the tripod. A fearful thing, that tripod. It stood in a dark cavern, and the breath of the god rushed up from a gulf below and filled her who was set there. How would it feel, that breath upon her? What would it do to her, that ghostly thing? She shook her shoulders as if to free them of a load. Oh, dear Pyan, what if it did harm her? That was nothing. Nothing. Could she win the good message? Could she by prayers, importunity, and ritual supplication win from the god the better fate for Greece? Apollo had already given forth the terror and warning. Could she push that evil back as with her two hands? All the courage, the confidence, which had so easily been hers, 
sank out of her. Her heart, which had been like a pool reflecting the sky of the gods, was suddenly empty. She longed to go to her mother to hide in her arms. For Balantho, how well she knew, would only weep and add weakness to her own. Her father? It had been her father's detachment, his way of laying the task impersonally upon her, forgetting the daughter upon whom he laid it. It was this that made her lonely. She thought of Dryas, of Lycophron, of Baltic. She could only hide her face in her hands, rejecting the thought of each, and the black loneliness grew at each rejection. Is there someone else? Isn't there anyone else? She thought wildly. And like answer to her thought came the clear picture to her closed eyes. The Argive standing in the moonlit lane with face upturned to hers. Can you stop the stream of Castaly? Even so will my love refresh you, whether you will or not. She lifted up her face timidly in the empty room. Ah, he had loved her. He had come again and again with his love. So faithful, so patient, and how true he was to Greece. How ready to fight for Hellas. If she should go to the window tonight, would he give her strength? Strength for her fearful duty. But how could he? Would he reach up his hands? What could he say? Suddenly, she was trembling so that she had to sit down, clasping her hands, unclasping them again. How could he do anything except to put arms about her as she had longed for her mother to do? But these arms, as they stole about her spirit, were not like Melantho's. They thrilled her, brought her near to weeping. They were the arms of love, the love he had told of, the love that understood the inmost of her heart. She began to long so intensely for their comforting that she was frightened. The barriers of her coldness went down at once, leaving her as tender as young spring. Unconsciously, she reached out her hands in the dim room. Then a panic assailed her. Perhaps he would not come. Perhaps her long refusal had broken even his faithfulness. Perhaps he would fail her for just this one evening. Then it would be too late. Tomorrow she would be locked in the Pythia house. Then even to see him would be sin. Tonight... Oh, could she go down into the lane and greet him there? But how? The house wall was too high for her down clamoring or for his ascent. The front door was guarded by Medon. She would ask Balti to take her. Surely on this, her last night at home, Balti would be kind. Meanwhile, the news of Tharia's departure was noised through the house. Melantha was excited, bewildered, frightened. She was closeted with Nicander. The slaves were weeping. One after another stole to Theria's door. The men awkward in their grief. The women and girls throwing their arms about their little mistress in stress of tears. Theria waited till nightfall before she asked Balti. Just to go out into the lane a little while, Balti. To stand near the stream. Balti sometimes had taken her there, but always of a morning when Balti was doing her washing. Not in the evening, little mistress. You know your mother would not allow it. She will not care this time. Oh, Balti, you will have no more chances to please me. But surely I am going to be with you in the Pythia house, little mistress, cried Balti, frightened. There, Balti, don't cry. Of course you will. For Balti had already consented to her little mistress's wish. The two entered the lane at nightfall, climbed the short, steep path beside the stream to the very wall of the cliff. But, Missy, I should think you would rather stay down near the high road where you could glimpse the folk passing. Not tonight, Balti. It is only the air I want, and to be still, very still. She slipped into a cleft of the hillside and drew Balti with her. How quiet it was! 
a cricket chirped above her on the hillside, lonely in the stillness. At the opening of the lane, the high road was half hidden by the rocks. Missy, it's growing late. We mustn't stay too long. Oh, Bottie, wait. Wait. Never in her life had Theria known fear such as this. The fear of the archives not coming. It choked her. It tasted bitter in her mouth. But why should he come? Oh, why should he to her who had been only cruel, who had thrown only contempt from her window? That window which now stared at her dimly at a distance like some vacant fate. What was that? Oh, Payan, a stir in the bushes above her, a form in the dusk that walked swiftly and stopped under her window. Ah, oh, dear gods, how intently he gazed up where he thought to find her. She slipped from Balthy's hand and sped like a freed bird toward him. Lightly, she touched his arm. She could not speak. He wheeled, saw her. Gods in Olympus, my lady! The Argive's hope had been largely boasting. He had never imagined a thing like this, that she should greet him in the lane. Now he saw her changed face. His voice broke with tenderness. Eleutheria, he whispered. Her timid hand reached toward him. Then the arms that she had dreamed of were about her, wonderful, amazing in their love. She had not known they would tremble. She had not known they would seem so strong. All thought for winning courage for her duty left her. All thought of asking anything. She only longed to give him the gentleness and affection she had so long denied him. She lifted her hand, touching his cheek. It was wet with tears. I have been unkind. Oh, I have been cruel to you. Never cruel, he said. Only a child whom the gods must teach. They have taught me. They have taught me, she answered. But now, Balti recovered from amazement and was shaking Thary's arm. Oh, Missy! Missy, come back with Balti! Wicked child, you deceived me! Yes, yes, Balti, she said, tender even toward her old nurse. I will come. Aetion will not harm me. He is good. Good. At this confession of faith, the youth kissed her afresh. But Balti was not to be balked. Missy, please, please for Apollo's sake, she cried, again shaking Theria. How can you, you who are to be Pythia tomorrow? Pythia, repeated the lover. What does she mean? Theria, that is not true. Yes, I am to pray for a good oracle from the gods. Oh, Aetion, I feel now that it may be granted me. But you, great Hermes, you cannot be Pythia. Your father will not allow that. But father commands it. He says it is the only hope of saving the Athenians. I must do it. Varian, no, no, he said wildly. The horror of the thing broke over him, and the horror of her being torn from him, forever beyond his reach. What a frightful mistake. Nicander should know better. You are not fit for Apithia. The tripod will kill you. It will destroy your mind. Theria, you must listen to me. She was listening indeed. His misery was sweeping down her high mission as the gale sweeps down the grain. She clung to him, saying no word. I can take you away from it. Oh, it is a horrible fate. My darling, for the gods' sake, let me save you. I'll take you to the islands. No one will find you. No one. He was drawing her toward the hill. That moment, her spirit returned to her. No, no, Aetion, you cannot save me that way. Oh, you know you cannot. His hands dropped to his sides. His head drooped. Yes, he faltered. Not in that way. But how? How? 
You must not be Pythia. You are not fit for Pythiahood. I have seen the present Pythia, pale, weak, and above all, empty, ignorant. Oh, darling Theria, you cannot be made like that. I must save you. You have saved me, she said, childlike. I was afraid, and you have made me unafraid, because you love me, just because you love me. O oh, Aetion, death lies both ways, for the Persians will kill us if they get into Hellas. Only the god can keep them back. I must pray to the god. I must pray to the god. I know he will hear me. Must I not go when I know that? O oh, Aetion, help me. Help me to go. He took her face between his hands, gazing into the brave depths of her eyes. Always you make me remember that you are Eleutheria, he said in a low, awed voice. If you were like other women, I could not so love you. Oh, do you believe how I love you? Love you? Then, before she could answer, Go, he said hastily, while I can let you go. She bowed her head and started down the lane. But he caught her back with passionate kisses. He knew it was the last time. There, in the narrow lane, pure love, neglected and chilled by Greek custom and unknown to Greek sullying passion, burned high and clear like an altar flame. Balti was beside herself with fear. Yet if she gave the alarm, what a punishment there would be for her darling. Only the dread Cyprian could know when they would have parted had not a step echoed from the highway and Madon's deaf, hollow voice called, Balti, ye fool! If ye don't come in, I'll lock the door on ye. What time is this to be staying out in the night with the little mistress? And at this, Balti gathered her nursling in her arms and almost carried her into the house. End of chapter 20 Read by S. K. Belt, Minneapolis, 7th of September, 2022. Chapter 21 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker A Procession of Sacrifice Next morning, it was Nicander himself who came to awaken his daughter. The house was full of bustle and awe of the departure. The dawn was yet grey. Melantho brought a white festal robe and for one long hour, she and Balte dressed the young candidate, pinning the robe at the shoulders, clasping the girdle, drawing the soft fabric up through it, full of the breast and then adjusting the long straight folds to the sandaled feet. Melantho brought the casket of jewels. Where are the pearls? she complained. You should have the pearls today. Theria put her deft fingers among the jewels, stirring their glitter. Please leave me without jewels, mother, she said quietly. Then she added, Oh, mother, let me give them to the god. Apollo loves gifts. He says if one gives one's all, it is as great as the bowl of crosses. These are my all. Perhaps they will help. So they crowned her head with red roses and hung a great garland of roses about her neck. Balte thought she had never seen anyone so beautiful as her dark-eyed darling. But Nicander, coming to look at her, was touched with anxiety. Daughter, he questioned, your hope is yet strong in you? Do you feel that you can reach the God? Yes, father, I was never so sure as today, she answered him. He took Balte aside. What is it, her eyes? He asked anxiously. It is almost a fatal look. Is she well? Yes, master, said Balte. But master must remember that she is leaving her home. That is awesome for a maid. No doubt. Yes, indeed, he agreed. He went to his own room and brought forth a cup of his most delicate wine. I want roses in your cheeks this morning, Theria, he said as he gave it to her. But roses came before she drank. 
for as she took the cup she noted its picture the same that was on the cup that she had broken athena bestowing upon a worshipper the same delicate sureness of drawing unmistakable my dear you are spilling the wine admonished nicander steadying her trembling hand slowly she sipped it bringing herself to speech father give me this cup to take with me you strange child it is a common thing from the pottery under the hill it will be from home she faltered nicander went off for reassurance to his wife will she be homesick think you he asked left alone theria stole away to look at the places that she must see no more her father's room the aula the balcony she had to walk slowly stately in the robe already she seemed far away from the free swift moving theria she had been last of all she came to the dusky old store room here strangely enough it was not its recent memories that came to her but the memory of that far off day when she had wept there as a child and had seen the nymphs and the baby herms in the stream then suddenly the sharp scent of violets met her sweet dewy fresh and new with a low cry she gathered the flowers from the floor then stumbling upon her long robe she hurried from the room the nikanda family left the house in silent procession they were all crowned with laurel and carried with them the necessary things of sacrifice the flat baskets the grain of barley the torch lighted from their own dear hearth like a foreign let the victim a white goat whose girdled horns were crowned with flowers it was a solemn going theria had never thought that she could walk toward her beloved present with so heavy a heart a breeze rare in summer caught her festal skirts and fluttered them about her across the sky raced splendid clouds whose huge silver bulks but made loftier the blue sky spaces between them midsummer had laid its silent on the morning birds but doves on her cousin's clytes roof cooed and strutted in the sunshine and now they had reached the present how easily the great gates opened to her this time did the keeper remember that other morning she wondered when he had refused to let her in father who was those splendid looking men she asked they seem waiting for us they are waiting indeed they are the athenians theria's heart rose at the sight of them at sight of their anxious faces her personal sorrow retired before their larger sorrow she wanted to call out to them to tell them how sure was her hope but of course she could do no such thing the athenians greeted her father solemnly from a distance now the priest gave into all their hands great boughs of trees do not speak again daughter said nicander we are suppliants now and bearing their solemn boughs with which to constrain the god and with their baskets their torch and their slow moving victim they went up the sacred way the athenians went with them kindly the little temples watched them go kindly the gods and heroes beside the way before the great altar in front of apollo's temple they stopped the altar was alight smoking in the sunshine the flute player began a slow dorian melody the priest brought a great silver bowl of water and lighting a new torch at the altar flame plunged it hissing into the bowl with the water thus sanctified he sprinkled the worshippers then lifting the bowl high with the swift gesture of long custom he dashed the water full upon the goat it shivered in all its limbs good omens good omens all theria's confidence soared upward with her simple faith when the goat was sacrificed theria was so sure that its outgoing life was mounting invisibly to please the son of leto in her enthusiasm she kissed her hands to the god and stood so with her arms uplifted Nicander gazing upon her felt more hopeful than for many weeks when the ritual was done they laid the supplicant bows upon the altar her brother and her mother kissed theria goodbye a sorrowful parting but quite as befitted the temple place then nicander took theria's hand and balte following led her around the back of the great temple to pythia house End of chapter 21 read by Madhushri Nellor March 27 2022
Chapter 22 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker In the Pythia House The old housemistress received them a stubby little person, most proper and severe, who fixed her eyes upon Theria intently and disapprovingly. As she let them in, a curious suffering sound came from a farther room. It's Astronike, the Pythia, vouched the mistress. She's been like that ever since her last oracle, the one to the Athenians. She stands it worse and worse, poor child. It's good we're getting another to help her. Again she looked Theria up and down. Your slave woman can come with me, she said, referring to Balti. Wait you for me there. She was one of those old servants whose trustiness and efficiency are so great as hardly to be borne by those who employ them. Lycander and Theria were left in the little room, unknowing for how long. Beyond the corridor, the poor little pythoness kept up her incessant moaning. It did not frighten Theria. From her stronghold of perfect health, she could not think of herself as being thus laid low, but it filled Nicander with horror. He was glad when Theria began to speak. Father! The Athenians looked so bitterly anxious. Is their task the hardest of all? Harder than that of the Spartans? I think so, child. But why? Because they are not only doing their own task, but keeping the Spartans to theirs. Then, too, Athens' city itself is almost sure to be destroyed. Father! Theria leaned forward in her usual absorbed fashion. Nicander suddenly realized how he would miss Theria's questionings at home. Of late he had actually cleared his plans by talking fully to Theria. This he did not acknowledge even to himself, yet it affected his mood. He was tenderly frank in speech with her. Athens destroyed, she repeated. It will all depend upon the battle in the north. A battle which we hope will bar the Persians out of Greece. We have decided now to hold them back at a place called Thermopylae, the narrowest pass anywhere in our northern mountain barrier. The pass lies thus, he gestured, between steep mountain and sea. It is scarce six feet wide. How far from here? she queried. Seventy-five miles by mountain road. The Spartans, we hope, will march thither. The Athenians' ships will hold the strait at Artemisium. Land and sea will fight at once. But if we win, exclaimed Theria, then Athens will be safe. Yes, if we win, he repeated. If we lose, the Persians will march direct upon Athens and upon us. Oh, could the Athenians do nothing? Nothing? Nothing to save their city, my child. Even Themistocles says that in that case, the citizens must flee to the Isle of Salamis. Nicander was by this time lost in the subject uppermost in his heart. But the Athenian fleet would fight. They are very confident of their fleet in Salamis Bay. They can tempt the Persians into the small bay where skill will count more than numbers. The crowding of the Persian ships might. But, child, why do I tell you this? I have the habit of it because you never tell what is told you. But this is most seriously secret. And you know I will keep it so, she said with a little dignified uplift of her head, which gave him a sudden pleasure and pride. Silence fell between them. They sat impatiently waiting the courage of one of them oozing fast. They could hear again the moaning of the Pythia 
with now and then a miserable, delirious scream. At last the old house mistress appeared. You are to come with me, she said to Theria. Nicander rose and took his daughter's hand for goodbye. But as he kissed her, a bitter tumult seized him. He hid his face in his cloak and hurried from the room. End of chapter 22 Read by Kerry Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 9th of March, 2022. Chapter 23 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. The Child Priestess. Theria's room was small, hardly more than a closet. Like all Greek bedrooms, it was windowless, but opened on a sunny court. She was glad to be alone. The coming three days seemed hardly enough for her prayers and importunities to her God. The Athenian danger possessed her. She felt inspired and strong. She stood in the middle of the room, lifting her hands. They almost touched the low ceiling. O oh, Payan, dear son of Leto, am I not thy supplicant? A supplicant thou canst not refuse. Have I not given all my jewels, Apollon, Apollon? If I had more, I would give all to thee. Here the old housemistress entered without prelude. You are to take off that gown, she said, and put on this, the simple garb of the Pythia. She held forth a sort of long shift. It was fine-fluted in the ancient fashion, and yellow, the accepted color of the Apollo priesthood. Send me my tiring woman, said Theria. Your tiring woman is gone home. You will have the usual temple slave. The Pythia has no touch with outside folk. Polte is not outside folk. I will refrain from all speech with her, if that is the rule, nor will I allow her to speak. That makes no difference, said the old peasant woman, joying in her authority. It is against the law. Theria's heart bounded with anger. How dare you mistrust me, woman? Have I not the good of the oracle at heart more than you? Go at once and fetch me Balte. The housemistress bowed and went out, and presently the Pythian slave appeared, very timid and eyeing her secretly amused. Theria looked hard at her. Go out, she commanded. How dare you enter my room when I have not sent for you? The woman withdrew, but Theria was conscious that she lingered in the court. Never in all her life had anyone dressed Theria but Balte. It was quite unthinkable that anyone else should do it. Theria was a spoiled child in this. Awkwardly, she unpinned her white robe herself, folded it away, and donned her Pythia habit. But anger is the arch-destroyer of prayer. Theria could not pray now. Besides, she was mortally hungry. In her excitement last night, she had eaten almost nothing. Now she must fast for three days to come. She supposed, of course, that the hunger would grow worse and worse. She walked up and down the room when she should have remained still, saving her strength. What do I care of hunger? She kept saying proudly. For mere hunger when Athens is in danger of burning. But it was only by an effort that she could hold her mind on Athens. Her thoughts kept rising, floating away like clouds. E Etienne, where was he today? Somewhere in the precinct? Was he thinking of her? Surely of naught else. Word after word of his came flashing back to her, snatching her breath with joy. Now his very touch... His trembling kindness filled her with a new and terrible longing. Only one dear hour of love in all her long life would she ever have to treasure and remember. Suddenly, with a wrench, she brought her thoughts back to the present. Love of Leto, how the poor little Pythia moaned in her room across the court. It was impossible for Theria to be near suffering and not try to help. 
she hurried across the court and entered the room. Astoniki lay upon a couch, her eyes staring and bright. She was thin as a blade of grass, looked a mere child with her poor little cheekbones so prominent and white and her tiny chin so pointed. Theria came and stroked the pathetic face. Poor little Astroniki, poor little girl, she said. The wandering eyes fixed themselves upon her. Who? she whispered. I am Theria, daughter of Nicander. Where is your pain, dear child? Not anywhere, all over. Are you hungry? asked Theria. This thought was so present with herself. Ugh, said the little creature, turning with disgust. The slave who sat at the bedside answered for her. She will not eat these many days, mistress, and she never sleeps, never, after an oracle. Theria gave a low-toned order to the slave, who presently brought hot milk. To Theria, in her hunger, it smelt like nectar itself. Astroniki, at the sight of it, hid her eyes. But if you will take it, pleaded Theria, I will send out your slave to buy a little living bird for you, a linnet in a cage. Astroniki uncovered her eyes. Will it sing? Ah, how it will sing, high and low and chittery, but you must awake early in the morning, for then it will sing best. As Theria talked, she fed the milk to Astroniki, and Astroniki sipped it before she knew. They were still at this when the old dame Touche appeared. Mistress Theria here, what are you doing in this room? You see what I am doing, Theria answered. You are to keep to your own room. I supposed you knew that. Theria rose in alarm. Have I broken the ritual? Oh, I hope I have not broken it. Astroniki began to moan again. Do not go, old oh lady, do not go. She caught Theria's dress, clinging to it as with little claws. I did not think the god would mind, spoke Theria anxiously. Is it not for his priestess to heal if she can? Old Touche's armor was not without its flaw. She loved the little priestess child. She gazed at Astroniki, and her face curiously changed as if some sweet were trying to mitigate its sour. Well, mayhap ye can stay, Mistress Theria, she grudgingly consented. I don't say it's not irregular, but, well, it's tomorrow and next day for your silence. Is the child eaten? When you stopped her, she was eating, Theria made answer. So Theria stayed. Astroniki gazed at her, and slow tears began to pour down sideways from eyes upon her pillow. What use is it to be better? She said fatally. Whenever I am better, they come again, and oh, they put me in the smoke, and then it begins. What begin? questioned Theria. Oh, the ecstasy of the tripod, she whispered, frightened. But Astroniki, I am Pythia, too. Did you not know that? I am going to the tripod in your stead. Then you will grow well. Again, the little cause caught her, but in a sort of protection. No, no, not you. Yes, said Theria, nodding confidently. I am strong. Me, it will not hurt. Think not of the tripod, little one. There, there, you will not weep any more. And presently, beyond hope, the tired little priestess, with her hands clasped in Theria's strong ones, fell asleep. End of chapter 23「When Theria awoke next morning, she did not at first remember where she was. For the first time in her life, she opened her eyes upon a room not her own. Then she noted over in the corner a woman dressed in the yellow robe of the temple. As Theria turned her awakened face, the woman solemnly advanced, holding aloft two golden vessels. She offered one a cup of water. Theria knew that this water was from the sacred spring Casotis, 
which bubbled forth near the temple. Apollo himself had troubled that spring. That was the reason it bubbled. His touch was upon it still. There you drank in fear, while the priestess murmured, Apollon, Apollon. Would the ecstasy fall at once? It sometimes did fall upon the Pythia after this single draft. Silence followed while the priestess searched Theria's face. Theria paled, knowing well what she searched for. Then the priestess presented the second vessel, in which were leaves of laurel. These Theria was required to chew. How bitter they tasted, intensely so in her hungry state. She rose from her couch, swayed as she stood. Without a word, the priestess caught her and nodded her head in satisfaction. It was the beginning of what the priest wished for. How strangely Theria's fingers tingled, and as she stepped, how heavy were her feet. She tried not to be terrified, but she was a healthy young thing. She dreaded the supernatural. The old priestess dressed her. You must make sacrifice at the altar now, she said. She led Theria out of the house and into the glory of an amethystine morning. They came out upon the lofty temple platform, and the whole precinct lay below. Little pillared temples, bathing their feet in the low-level rays of light, brazen statues, golden tripods flashing like struck symbols in the dawn. The white sacred way was drawn clear as with the swift finger of the god up zigzag through his own treasuries. A trumpet sounded, it cut the pure air, a flashing shaft of sound, then echoed, echoed from cliff to cliff into utter clarity and sweetness, a note from Elysium. Theria stretched forth her hands in enthusiasm of love. Every vestige of her dizziness disappeared. But this way is the altar, corrected the dame, and led her to it. Here Theria performed long rites, offerings of barley and wine, long silent prayers. Then she was led back into her room. Do not move from here, said the priestess. Be silent. Try to think of nothing. So she left her. Never would Theria forget that day, the interminable hours, the slow change of the slant sunlight in the court, the trying to pray, succeeding at last with upsoaring faith, sleeping, the awakening to realize that it was still only morning, then again the waiting, waiting. The third and last morning Theria was so weak that she longed to cry, long as she never supposed she could long for Balte to come to her. Balte surely could make her well. Today, as yesterday, she must preserve through all the hours the holy silence. Again came the old priestess and dressed her. Then a procession of priestesses led Theria down to the Castilian spring where they gave her the sacred purifying bath. The shock of the cold water restored her. She realized with a start that now, if ever, she must seize the will of the god. She began to struggle with petitions. When she entered her room again, it seemed to reel round and round her head. Surely this meant that Apollo was approaching nearer, nearer. The face of the god with solemn eyes and wide-flung hair became suddenly so vivid before her that she could not tell whether it was an image in her mind or the real presence of the god. Her home, her father... At Etienne were all infinitely far away. Numbly, she realized that she was passing into the ecstatic state. Once again, it was morning, the morning of the oracle. Theria's mind awoke crystal clear, drenched through and through with hope. She smiled so happily at the old priestess when she came in that the dame bent and kissed her. Then since this was against custom, the woman was quite shocked at what she had done. Now the hour of the oracle was come. Dreamily, Theria was conscious of being led into the temple, knew that her hair was hanging loose, the sacred veil and crown upon her head. Ah, the dear, dear temple! There were the splendid golden eagles, the navel stone, first of Delphi's treasures. Pindar's chair, which she had kissed, and over yonder the Athenian consultants waiting with awed faces. 
Oh, the god would help them. She was sure now, sure. Suddenly the priestesses kindled to exceeding brightness, the eternal flame on the altar, put into it many branches of dry laurel. The cella was filled with smoke, especially the space behind the altar, where, within temporary screens, the priestesses waved the half-extinguished laurel branches. The priests pushed Theria into this enclosure. How sweet was the smell of the smoke! So smelled the little altar at home. The, oh, it was choking her. She started forth from the screen. They pushed her back again. She began to struggle and to gasp. They held her, oh, fatal consequence. Their roughness made her angry. Weak as she was, she fought them back. It was almost unknown that the Pythia should have such strength at this stage of the ritual. At last they brought her forth, her eyes streaming, her nose also, her lungs burning as with fire. Down the rough-hewn steps they led her into the dim holy of holies. Bedrock was the floor, and in its midst the narrow opening of a cave. Over the blackness of this abyss stood, solemn, tall, and terrible, the brazen tripod. From the blackness below would rise the breath of the god. In awe-stricken silence, the priests and Athenian consultants, again lifting on high their branches of supplication, filed into the small, dank place. They filled it quite and ranged themselves with religious care. Theria saw everything, the golden statue of Apollo, the special laurel tree in its tub, and there was her father looking as she had never seen him, his face set, white as chalk. She must not fail him. All the life of her dear Hellas hung upon her now. Great Apollon, Akeratos, the priest president, was lifting her up to the high seat of the tripod. Now she must shake the laurel tree, for in the laurel was the life of the god. Yes, she was shaking it. The consultant stood waiting, waiting. Suddenly she had a queer sort of panic. She had been expecting forgetfulness so intensely for so many hours. Now instead of forgetfulness, everything became horribly clear. All memories, all thoughts, home, Etienne, nonsense rhymes which Balte used to sing to her. Great pain. She must not laugh. That would be sacrilege. And oh, they were waiting. They were shifting their feet. The Athenians stole glances at each other. Their eyes were despair. How her father was gazing at her. Oh, if she could only pray. A moment more and they would take her down from the tripod. She had failed. Flashingly, a temptation crossed Theria. A temptation as old as magic, as old as priestcraft, or the first mumbling worship of primitive man. She would make the oracle, make it herself better than for Athens to go unanswered. The god, he might strike her with his arrows. Nay, he would instantly destroy her. Better that than let Athens go unanswered. She stiffened straight as a reed on her tripod and flung her hands on high, cupping the palms as if to receive a gift. Never had the Athenians seen anything more beautiful Athena, their own virgin goddess, might in some divine appearing be of this likeness. And her voice, the intense, meaningful voice of the singer, Apollon, Apollon, Apollon emos, ha, i do, i do, ships, ships, sea, sea. How fatally clear she remembered all her father's words, all that he had told her of the Athenian policy. Sails, galleys of the glancing sails, to Salamis, ye Athenians, fight at Salamis. Oh, more ships, strange, strange ships locked in the land, down, down, down. She was keen as a hawk. She saw her father start with horror. He was remembering his inadvertent talk with her. She must not be too exact. She must not let him suspect what she was doing. She began to mumble. Balte's nonsense rhymes would do while she was gathering thought. Her message must not be too hopeful. 
Now she had it. She broke forth into hexameter verse. Once in a long while the Pythia did this, and it was considered more exact. The priests could not remake it. Pallas cannot prevail to appease great Zeus in Olympus. Though she with words very many, and wiles close woven entreat him, but I will tell thee this truth, and clinch it with steel adamantine, that when all else shall be taken, all that the boundary of Cecrops holdeth within, a bulwark of wood, this Zeus will grant to Athena the goddess, sole to remain a defense to you and your children. Salamis, thou divine, thou shalt cause the sons of women to perish. She began to sway, holding her hands still above her, repeating, Salamis, thou the divine, then mumbling at nothing. Surely now the god would strike her. This greatest of all sins upon her, he must strike her. She crouched as if avoiding a blow. Then she achieved her one Pythian act. She really fainted quite away. End of chapter 24「Section 25 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Schnedeker. Bitter Consequences. Day after day, Nick Ander came to the Pythian house to inquire after his daughter. She's recovered, they told him. She eats once more, but there is upon her the apathy that follows the utterance. What does she do? Gazes for hours at nothing, was the reply. The usual thing, though it's not usual that the apathy came so soon. She's gone but once to the tripod. Aristonike now, not so strong a girl was she, but she went many a time under the ecstasy before this apathy attacked her. Nicander went home with heavy heart. He dared not tell Melanto his anxiety. Melanto's way was to increase trouble by bewailing it, and Terio was but one of his deep anxieties. His two sons these days seemed to have constant business in which they gave Nicander no part. This was natural for Lycopron. He was wild and loose living. It would be a sorry day for him if he had to tell his father all his doings. But of late he and Dryas had become very intimate. From morning to night they were together. Even when in other company, Nicander saw glances pass between them. Lycophron was the worst possible example for a soft, gentle boy like Dryas. Yet Nicander did not like to break the brotherly tie. He still loved his eldest son. Meanwhile, of course, Theria's ailment was far different from what Nicander supposed. It was no exhaustion of nerves from indulging in trance and supernatural sight. It was agony of mind. Apollo had not killed her. This was her chief grievance. The mighty immortal had allowed her to contemn his shrine, to deceive his questioners. Yet he did nothing, and continued to do nothing. What sort of a god was he? And the Athenians had gone joyously home with their oracle. So the old temple dame had told her. They were treasuring it as the word of the god. They were acting upon it. The whole city was moved in effort to understand and fulfill the sacred words, Theria's words. She laughed hysterically. She could talk to no one of what she'd done. The oracle must remain to help the Athenians as best it could. And what of all the oracles, age-long, multitudinous, the pride and wonder of her childhood? Were they all like this? Fraud and deception? This thought beat down Theria's spirit as with strokes of a sledgehammer. No, no, no she would say aloud. Those oracles had helped the poor. They had punished the wrongdoer. They had founded colonies and controlled states. And surely Aristonike had genuinely felt the god possession. Had it not wrecked her body and mind? But the doubt remained, tormenting all the golden preciousness of all the reverences of her life. The precinct, the beloved precinct itself, where men brought grateful gifts to the god. What a mockery! Were these wistful worshippers all deceived? Did Apollo sit in Olympus and laugh at them? And Theria was wretchedly lonely, hour long, hour long, with nothing to do, not even spinning. The home faces, home voices, not a thousand paces distant, were all to her as far as the pillars of Heracles. Farther, farther, for it is conceivable that loved ones might return thence. 
but her dear ones could not come to her. And while she sat mid the windowless walls, there happened, without her knowledge, the most glorious single deed of Greece. Sparta was ever grudging. She did not much care to bar the Persians out of all Greece. She would have preferred to meet them on the borders of her own Laconia. If all her sister states would then perish, why should Sparta care? But one Spartan cared supremely to keep them out of Greece, her king, Leonidas. So Leonidas, with the few soldiers which the ephors grudgingly allowed him, marched for Thermopylae. Nicander, Lycophron, Dryas, Aetion, all the men of Delphi, saw one day the file of bronze-clad soldiers coming up the Delphi road, led by the twinkling flame of their sacred fire. They came with set faces under their helmets, their new polished shields glancing in the sun. They paused only to do honour to Apollo, then moved onward, up the Parnassian road. Three hundred men and a few timid allies to meet a million Persians at the narrow pass. Those who saw them never forgot them, nor has the world forgot. But Theria, within her walls, knew nothing of these things. Theria had come upon a new dilemma. The day of Oracle came round again. Aristonike was too ill for the tripod. Theria must serve again. Of course she would not deceive again. Indeed, she had no knowledge with which to deceive. Besides, she had determined that she would never again speak upon the tripod. She wanted to cry out against it, to tell the world what a mummery it was. Yet in spite of all this, she was compelled to undergo the preparatory rites. She had to fast, chew the laurel, pass through the smoke. When she did not go into the trance, they tried her over and over again until she was well nigh dead. I knew she could not do it, she heard old Touche saying in the court. What mazes me is that she went under the first time. She's not the kind for a pythoness. Well, then, they would cast her aside, and for Theria they could not do so too soon. Then her life would be spent in the Pythia house. She thought of her lover and of the rich life that might have been hers, even of the glorious children that her father had spoken of. But now she would be but a useless vessel, cast aside. Theria had no joy in her helpful Athenian oracle. Her whole world was overshadowed because her god was gone. One evening she was sitting in her room, gazing into space as Tuhye had described it, when the old slave who had tried to wait on her that first day brought her her supper. Now Theria had never received this woman. Tuhye had been obliged to send her a young girl, whom finally, because Theria needed such service, she accepted. Now why did the old slave come again? Doubtless Tuhye had sent her merely as an annoyance. Tuhye disliked the new pythoness. How dare you come here again, Theria said to the old slave. I will not see you. I, she rose to her feet. But the old slave, trembling much, set aside the supper tray and threw off her cloak. Balte! Theria cried, and with outstretched arms ran to Balte's bosom. Be quiet. There, there, my darling, don't cry so. Blessed, blessed, my little bird, whispered Balte, stroke in the dark hair. And Theria gradually brought herself into control, but her heart seemed breaking with joy. Balte, Balte, I never thought I could be so glad again. I never thought... And just for seeing old Balte's face, said the slave proudly, here, eat your supper. You're that thin and white. They talked in whispers, or rather in low, even tones, for Balte well knew that whispers are most conspicuous of all sounds. How did you get to me, Balte? How? In Apollo's name. Even the divine name seemed strange to Theria now. Been trying ever since that old chimera took me away from you. What's she to be taking care of my darling? Yes, go on. I couldn't get in. The slaves were that particular. Then I went to Lycopron and I begged him. I says, give me money to get to my darling. She's dying for the sight of a home face. How do you know that, says he? You know yourself, I says. Could she feel any other way? Then his eyes grew soft-like, and he gave me not silver, but gold. Bribe him, Balta, and get in, says he, laughing. You know the way he does. There's no slave in the world, but we'll take a bribe. When that's gone, come to me for more. Good, dear Lycophron, said Theria, loving him tenderly. She leaned closer. Already her face was changed by this touch of home. She asked lovingly after father and mother, even each slave of the household. Tell me, Balte, she said at last, then stopped. It was the first time she had ever spoken this name to anyone. Did he ever come again, Aetion, who met me in the lane? 
Shame upon you. Do you think I'd be bringing you love messages? You, a priestess of Apollo? Daria hid her face, shivering. No, no. Oh, Balte, I would not want messages. How can you think that of me? And I did not mean to ask. Poor child. Only her own sense of right would uphold her now. She had no longer any fear of the god. When Balte rose to go, Theria threw her arms about her. You'll come again? Promise that you'll come again? Surely will I. Oh, there, I'm almost forgetting a message like Afron sent you. It's an oracle, says he, laughing. I can give oracles as well as anyone. You tell Theria. Keep up heart. Argos has become Delphi for her sake. It's a queer message, that. Argos has become Delphi, she repeated, puzzled. Argos. Argos. Could it be the Argive? Theria began to laugh softly, her eyes full of tears, clinging to Balte and kissing her. Darling old Balte, she said. Darling dear old Balte. He said you'd like it, said the old slave, nodding her head. Oh, dangerous message. Like Ephron did not look ahead. He meant to be kind. End of section 25. Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Chapter 26 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedeker. Pray to the Winds. Next week happened what Theria most feared. An important oracle was required. Theria learned by chance that it was important. Old Touche, in her excitement over it, forgot how loudly she was speaking in the court. This time, an oracle they must have, she was asserting. It is a matter of state. The new Pythoness can't get it. I wonder what they'll do with her anyway. Theria was in despair. Should she refuse to try? Feign illness? Then a new Pythia would sit upon the tripod to babble at nothing or to give some dread discouraging word. Nicander had placed Theria in the Pythia house, counting upon her prayerful help. Should she step down and leave him without that help? Or was it her duty to go upon the tripod and feign again for Helas' sake? But gods in Olympus! She did not know the question, nor who was asking it. She could not deceive if she would. She would refuse to try. Upon this decision, Theria found relief for her troubled mind. No more should they starve her and push her through the smoke. She could rest. She no longer cared for anything but to be left alone. That evening, like a light among shadows, came old Balti again. Theria's first question concerned her father. Master is sad. Very sad, the old nurse told her, but so is everyone sad. It's like a storm gathering on Parnassus, those Persians coming, and everybody is afraid like as when they hear thunder and the darkness comes closer. Oh, darling, if I could take you out of this house and keep you in the fastness of the mountain, there it will be safe, only there. Again, the danger brought to Theria its dark and solemn peace. Poor Balti, she said. How could I live in the mountain with Delphi destroyed? Could I be a peasant all my days? You could never be a peasant, said old Balti proudly, and you would always have one slave. Old Balti will last long. Dear Balti, she answered and kissed her. Balti was a helot from Sparta, and some high Spartan blood ran in her veins. But Balte had more to tell. Yesterday came a runner. Poor lad, he was sore spent. Your father brought him in from the high road and gave him wine and made the slaves rub him well. Then he sent him on his way to Sparta with another runner to help in case he fall. Whence came the runner? asked Theria. From Leonidas at Thermopylae. He was to beg the Spartans to come quickly and help. Those laggard Spartans, cried Theria. Why do they not go to help their king without his begging and summoning? 
Leonidas is already fighting the Persians, he and his Spartans, said Balti proudly. So few against so many. Only three hundred Spartans and a few allies. If the Persians beat, they'll be coming straight here, straight to Delphi. But is there no one to help Leonidas? No one at all? The Athenians be helping, so they say. The Athenians' ships, Missy. But the Persian ships be twenty to one. Oh, dearie, if only a sea storm would fall upon the Persians. Medon keeps wishing for a storm. Medon was a sailor long ago, and he knows the ways of ships. He says the Athenian ships would be safe in the Euboean Strait, where they are now. But the Persians be outside around some rocky points up there. A storm would wreck them, sure. Daria suddenly awakened to the fact that her heart was overflowing with interest, just as she used to do when she was pent up at home and could do nothing, would beat her hands together, agonized because she could do nothing. Now that some power was in those hands, would she abandon it? She trod not. Oh, if she only knew the question before the oracle. But she couldn't no wise find this out. Then she must give her oracle as best she might, not knowing the question, trusting that it must in some way concern the fate of Greece. She would pray for that storm, which was to help the Athenian ships. Balti's word showed her the way. Theria might doubt the voice of her golden god. She might almost doubt the existence of Apollo. But the things of nature, the sea, the mountains, the winds, these she could see or feel. These to her were persons, clear-imaged, well-known, and having much power. They were gods nearer to men, in whom all men must believe. To these, Tharia still could pray. When the day came, she once more mounted the faithful tripod. This, then, was the oracle which Eleutheria the Pythonis gave to Hellas. O oh, ye who were born in the bright air, driving the ships as thistles in the harvest, shepherds of clouds piping to white flocks so loud a tune, children of Thrace, all hail. Boreas, thine are the whirlwind-footed steeds. Sapphirus, thine are the tossing locks and head full-winged. Euros, thine are the rounded cheeks piping no visible flute. Notos, Thine are the blessings and cursings. All hail. Men of Delphi, men in terrible need, men upon whom is descending a host like the sands of the sea, pray to the winds. And ye, men of Athens, men of the swift-moving galleys, men of the long oars smiting the hoary ocean, pray to the winds. And pray most of all to your brother by marriage, because of Arithia, daughter of mighty Erechtheus, pray to the winds. That oracle is famous. Never in all the history of Delphi was an oracle received in such dire need. Never a one to which the Delphians themselves was more precious. For it was the Delphians themselves who had asked the question, and to whose hearts the oracle gave courage and hope. They sent messengers at once carrying the precious words of courage northward to the little ships of Artemisium and to the little band of heroes at Thermopylae, and eastward to Athens, crying, Apollo, the son of Leto, is on our side. He bids us pray to the winds. End of chapter 26 Read by S.K. Belt, Minneapolis, 24th September, 2022「Section 27 of the Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Schnedeker. The Messengers. Aristonike was dying. No more did she notice even the linnet, Theria's gift, which sang so sweetly in the solemn house. A fever burned through all her limbs. As evening came on, old Touche was fain to take her out of the close house and lay her in front of the door on the high temple platform. And because the little maid would not go without Theria, Theria came also. 
They two sat, Thierry and Duquet, on either side of the couch. Little do the young consider thoughts of the old. Daria did not guess that Tuche hated her because Aristonike loved. The little Pythia was Tuche's nursling, and Tuche was cut to the heart to have her turn to another in her last hours. But Theria, holding the hot little hand, had thoughts afar off. Her soul was in bitterness because she had again deceived her god. That was yesterday, and she was yet weak from the ordeal. She wondered if Aetheon would cease to love her if he knew what she had done. Certainly her father would not love her, nor would any of her kin. Far below lay the sheer abyss of Pleistos Valley. Nearer at hand, Delphi itself nestled into the gigantic half-circle at the mountain's base. Precinct and town seemed floating in a violet mist, for the day was nearly done. But this was the hour of the Phaedriades, the glory of the cliffs. Theria turned and looked above to where they stood facing the west. The setting sun poured his light direct upon these high embattling walls, turning them to gold, to beryl, to amethyst. They gave forth light again as with a shout, a clashing of golden symbols and a prayer. They hushed the spirit of the gazing priestess. As the reflected light retired upward with the sinking of the sun, one spot on the cliff held the glitter. It was the famous votive chariot of Gelon, a chariot of polished bronze. It stood on a high ledge of the cliff, its four bronze steeds prancing with that lightness of poise, just learned by Greek craftsmen. In the car stood the naked chariot victor, and just behind him the charioteer holding the reins, his living eyes watchful of his steeds. But to Theria it seemed that he was driving them over the ledge, was driving them into the sheer abyss, and that he did not care. Would the gods so drive her Delphi to destruction? Would Ate, doomed fate, tread Delphi down? Whose feet are delicate because she steps upon the heads of men, and on whom she steps she bows to the dust? Ah, the Persians were so near. At Thermopylae, were they victorious? If so, they could march directly upon Delphi. They were not one week's time away. The doom of Delphi pressed so close, so sure. Even the temple guardsman seemed to feel it as he paced his beat. Now he walked slowly, dignified in his armor. Now he hastened with nervous steps to and fro. Aristonike woke, complaining. The thirst, the thirst, Tuche, bring water, not warm water, cold, fresh from the spring. Tuche rose up, flattered that her dear one had asked this of her, and went upon the errand. No sooner had she disappeared than the guard halted short in his beat, looked about him, then almost ran towards the Pythia house. He touched Theria's shoulder and she rose with a cry. It seemed as though her thoughts had suddenly become visible, for there, beneath the helmet, was the face of Aetheon. Pale white he was, then flushed with unbidden joy as he touched her. Eleutheria, he whispered, I had to come, your oracle to the winds. The Delphians have sent it to Artemisium, and the fleet, and also to Athens. It is precious beyond words, for it will hearten men to victory. Nay, the winds themselves will answer it, for what god could resist so insistent a prayer? Yes, she whispered, wondering that he should come to tell her this. But your brothers, O oh, beloved, it is no happy tidings I bring you. Your brothers are in league with the Persians. They are with the Persian spies. They have gone after our Delphian messengers to kill them on the road. Oh, Aetheon, no, no, she interrupted him in low voice. Not my Lycopron, not my Dryas. Yes, it is true. I saw them start, Lycopron towards Thermopylae and Dryas towards Athens. If it became known in Delphi, it will mean the ruin of Nicander's house. But your father will have to know in order to stop them. He would not believe me. But you, he will believe, because you are Pythia. Send for him at once, Theria. Tell him to dispatch swift horsemen to save the oracle for Greece. I go now on instant business. He paused for a moment, gazing into her face. Hera be thanked that I've seen thee. O oh, thou peer of gods, thou sister of the dawn. He bent and kissed the edge of her sleeve. He dared no more. She was priestess of Apollo. Then he was gone. Before she could answer or think of answer, he was gone. He knew that to linger might likely be her death. Theria's thoughts whirled like a falling star. She must send for her father. Yet her father could not have speech with her. Aetion did not know this, not being Delphian. 
and even if Nakundra could have speech, would Touche send for him? Touche refused regularly her every request, and Theria could not give reason for this request without betraying her brothers. Meanwhile, Lycophron and Dryas were hastening to their doom and to the doom of Hellas, for Theria ardently believed now that the prayer to the winds would avail. What could she do? Like a sword stroke came the thought. Run home yourself, Theria. Now, while Touche yet lingers in the house, there's no time to lose. Aristonike was sleeping again. Theria snatched a dark hemation, which lay for cover on the couch, and wrapping herself, head and all, ran to the protection of the temple colonnade. Along this she hurried. The columns would conceal her. Soon an angle of the cella would intervene. Then she reached the sacred way and walked not too fast so as to avoid a question. Her weakness from yesterday's ordeal was instantly gone. She only prayed that Nicander might be at home, that his action might be swift, and now for the high road, now for the familiar street, now for the dearest house which she had thought never to see again. Madon tottered to his feet at sight of her. More natural would it have been to see the ghost of his little mistress than herself. Is father within? she asked, but did not stay for answer. She sped into the aula, and, oh, thanks be to Kairos, Nicander was there. He, too, looked upon her as upon a dire spirit. Only madness could have brought her, but more terrible than his wildest conjecture were her words. Father, father, it is bitter news I bring. Lycophron, Dryas, they have medized and are fled with Persian spies. They are gone to hold back the oracle message from all the Hellens. Nicander sprang up, seizing her wrist, searching her face. Child, what madness! They're not gone away! Oh, are they in the house now? She almost sobbed with relief. I saw them both only an hour ago. Oh, but within the hour they are gone far, dry as to Athens, like Cofron to Thermopylae. Father, search the house. Send after them, quick, quick! She seized both his shoulders, shaking them as if to waken him to the sorrow. Where did you get this information? Nicander was pitiful of her strange mistake. I cannot tell you. It came. It came. Her eyes looked so strange and glittering, her whole aspect so bordering on delirium or even ecstasy that Nicander touched her gently. Was it by some prophetic power? Vision? Theria was so upwrought that she spoke out her first instinctive thought. No! No prophecy. Do not speak of prophecy. I am not deceiving. This is real, real. The words escaped the door of her lips. She was aghast at the net of lies closing about her. Of course, if she should tell her father it was prophecy, he would believe. But she would not lie to him, not even. She did not know that as she thought these things, guilt stood manifest in her face. Nicander caught her arm roughly, asking the thing he did not want to know the thing he had been suspecting for many days. Theria, your Athenian oracle, great Zeus in Olympus, have you deceived in all your oracles? She sank in a heap on the floor. Father, father, the need, it was such bitter need, and no ecstasy would come. The Athenians, the, the, her weeping choked her speech. Nicander was too horrified to answer. With hand before his eyes, he kept repeating, Great heaven! Great heaven! Suddenly he lifted his head again. If the oracle is not from the god, why in Zeus's name this pother about it? The words of a girl. Father, but it is important. The Athenians will offer true sacrifice to the winds. They will be hopeful in their prayers, in their fighting. The oracle gladdens the fighters. But Nicander's mind had never left his son's. Theria, who told you this vile tale about your brothers? he asked. I cannot tell you. I, if it were from some good source, you would tell me. Theria dragged herself up to her knees. It was a good source, O oh, father, the truest, the best, the kindest. Poor Theria, even to speak of her lover, set her white face aflame. But Nicander was pushing farther. Theria, I begin to believe what the slaves have been telling in the household, that you have a lover. Now do not lie to me. Your lover brought you this news. Theria was utterly broken down. She could only moan. But he told me the truth. He told me in order to save them. He told me because he loves my house and you, and he wants to save us from ruin. Great Payan! 
What a heap of sins on one girl's head. She is deceived on the tripod not once but twice. She has a lover, she a priestess of Apollo. Now she has fled the Pythia house, which she ought never to have left, to bring a monstrous lie against her brothers. To Nicander the shock of all this was terrible beyond belief, but worst of all he feared that the vile tale about his sons was true. Oh, if he could crush that fear out of his mind, it must not be true. It could not. He paced up and down the room, beating his hands together, weeping, sobbing, as only those can who but once in a lifetime give way to grief. My children all against me. But no, it cannot be true. Ruin for them. Ruin for me. It cannot be. No. Theria crept weakly to her feet and followed him, but as she touched him, he reeled from her. Don't touch me, he cried. Suddenly his agony was transformed to anger. You, you tell that tale, oh, how easily. It is not true. Leave me, I am beside myself. Your sins are more than I can bear, and now you add yet more. You will ruin my sons. Father, father, she pleaded. My poor wicked Theria, what place is there for you anywhere? Not at home here, not in the Pythia house. Oh, I know not what to do for you. No, I will never believe that story. Leave me before I go mad. He was so beside himself that he did not notice when she shrank away from him and staggered out of the door. Indeed, he continued to speak in the same words. Leave me. I will not believe you. Leave me. Suddenly she touched his arm again, or so he thought. He uncovered his face to find Medon standing before him, Medon with eyes astream with tears. Master, master, I knew that if the little mistress appeared it was some terrible thing. Master, I know what she's told you. You called so bitter loud upon your sons. I know, I know. Leave me, Medon, said Nicander angrily. He was still pacing up and down, but Medon did not leave. Master, I had not the courage to tell you, but I can follow the little mistress telling, like a frondryas, oh, you must haste to save them. Nicander stopped his pacing and gazed into Medon's face as though he comprehended not a word of what the old man was saying. Medon piteously went on. Lycophron and Dryas thought I could not hear, but I heard them talking. Oh, I heard too well, and the men who have been with them, they are spies, master. The slaves have long been whispering that those men were Persian spies. Today I was very anxious, all day I've watched, and this afternoon I followed Lycophron to where he had swift horses waiting, and those men were there. I do not know where they were going, but it was on some wicked errand. For when Master Lycophron saw me, he caught me. He threatened to kill me if I told. The men wanted to kill me at once. Oh, Master, haste, haste, there's no time to lose. Yes, yes, said Nicander, dazed into bitter quietness. Yes, madame, thank you. He stood quite still while his thoughts raced, and he ran out of the house to summon youths of the nearest kin who owned the swiftest horses. End of section 27, read by Sandra. Chapter 28 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Powerless Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker An Outcast on Parnassus Theria stood still in front of the house. She was stunned, as one must be when life turns a sharp corner and shows undreamed-of paths of dread. No place in the Pythia house, no place at home anywhere. Her father's words were true. She did not feel sad nor terrified. She did not feel at all. She looked down the twilight road towards Kira, the port. No, in Kira they would find her and kill her publicly. She must not die that way. The Pleistos Glen was also out of the question. The hills, her true hiding place, was the hills. She turned swiftly into the little lane and threaded its shadows to the cliff. A steep climb brought her to a height above the house roofs. Here at once she was in the wilds, on a slant hillside where grew laurel, 
wild olive and the hemlock. Here the twilight was slivered by the rising moon, the same full round under which the Thermopylae soldiers were keeping their heroic guards. Here the laurels were threaded by a slender path, surely the one made by Aetion's feet coming to her. She knelt down and kissed it. The Greeks were lovers of the earth, and not seldom did they kiss it for their love. Oh, gods, if she could but hide herself completely, then Aetion would never know her sins and would continue to love her. She tried to make haste, but her whole body ached with weariness, as though she were very old. The repeated fastings had told, even on her strong body. She won past the higher terraces of the hill and found the so-called Cacascala, bad stairs indeed, steps partly hewn out of the rock and winding up Parnassus' mountain until they were lost in cloud. These she began to climb. No thought was hers to see the glory about her, the abyss of glens black with fir and cedar, the heights which soared and melted into infinity, the starry sky, a grandeur hardly to be born. Varia only knew that she was very lonely, that the grandeur was terrible. She seemed very small and childlike in that vastness, stumbling along ever slower, stopping sometimes with laboring breath, then pushing on again higher, higher. In an upland meadow, she passed a herd of cows, small, wild things which fled trampling at her approach. She thought vaguely of the cattle of Apollo, which he kept on Parnassus, and which of yore the baby Hermes had stolen. Of course, these could be no other cows. She shuddered at the supernatural creatures. Now she came to a fir wood, black like a cloak. The mottled moonlight sifted in at the edge, pricking out of fern break and rock, but within it was ebony. In such a place might the Bacantes well go mad in worship of their god. With a sob, she entered it, for the fear of being found was greater than her fear of the haunted place. Theria lay down to rest among the mosses. Even her double terror could not contend against her utter exhaustion. At once, she fell asleep. She awoke in the dawn, shivering with cold, hungry beyond telling. The fear with which she had gone to sleep, the fear of being found, met her at the door of waking. It made her get up, and though she ached in every bone to push onward, upward into safer hiding. Sometimes she came to a bare stretch across which she stumbled in haste, for surely in such a place they would see her and would catch her and drag her back and doubtless bury her alive. In this thought she forgot even her old grief for the loss of her god. Indeed, she half believed that this present fate of hers was Apollo's punishment, which he had delayed so long. Now again she must cross a bare upland. The sun was high, and burning as it can burn only on such heights. She started across in the fearsome, blinding glare, the sweat pouring from every member. Curiously enough, in the midst of the sunlight, she saw moving along in front of her a shaft of golden light. When she entered a shadow of jutting cliff, the golden light endured in the shadow. If she paused, it paused. It was quiet as if a dream pervaded it. It seemed to smile, as do those faces that peep from bushes or caves, which smile and afterward destroy. Faria shrank back. It shrank with her, no evading it that way. A terror seized her. She wrung her hands. Should she run back to the forest? No, there it would only gain power. She tried to remember a charm against spirits which Balta had taught her, but she had no memory left. Now a lofty cliff blocked her path. Against this cliff, facing her, the light stopped and stayed very tall and stately. It quivered, growing brighter to a focus, and suddenly, out from it, as from a sheath, stepped a youth, tall as benefits an immortal, and of beauty tender as the dawn. Golden were his tresses, golden his flowing vesture, golden his sandaled feet which did not touch the ground. 
but the quiver girt upon his shoulder was silver white, silver also the bent bow in his hand. Should she not know him, she who had known him so well? Up went her hands in worship, up higher yet her worshipping heart. Thou hast come to kill me, she whispered. Blessed art thou, glorious child of Leto. Not lightly shall thy dear oracle be flouted and thy worshippers deceived. Apollo did not gaze upon Tharia, else she would forthwith have died. But just above her he gazed, delicately smiling, and as he smiled he toyed with his silver bow. Already was the shaft set on the string, and along that arrow back and forth ran the white fire, which whensoever it reached the tip, broke into flame. Now he nodded his head and spoke aloud. Faria, daughter of Delphi, be gone from my tripod. No priestess of mine art thou. No voice of Apollo can enter thy mind close guarded with reason. Be gone, be gone. Faria cowered before that voice, crouching to the earth. But the gods spoke on, almost tenderly, as to a frightened child. Nay, cower not, my maiden. My bow shall not hurt thee. Nay, for I love thee. Hast thou not sung at my bidding hymns for my glory, songs which I to thy spirit breathed and created? Suddenly, the god threw back his golden head and laughed and with his laughter the cliffs echoed as with stricken lyres and heavenly flutings. He was laughing at Tharia. He spoke again. Thou poor child of a mortal wouldst compel good fortune for Helas. Steal it from gods unwilling? Good luck, but I love thy courage. But now, behold, little one, wilt thou grant me to speak in Delphi? Ha, thou adviser of gods, thou helper of gods in trouble, without thee Apollo shall succor, without thee give aid to his people. I shall care for my own. Again he laughed, a merry, loving mockery. Oh, the dear joyous god, the dear son of Leto, Phoebus of the bright hair, had he not always spoken at Delphi since his glorious mother bore him upon Delos? And Tharia had doubted, her heart filled with a very agony of faith and joy. But now the god was looking again at his bow. Perhaps he had changed his mind and would destroy her after all. Even so, Tharia had no regret to die. But he spoke thus. See now, child of Nicander, whither my arrows are destined. He turned, lifted his bow, and shot the flaming shaft toward the north. It flew with a peal like a lightning bolt when the bolt falls so nigh that it quenches the thunder. It soared white and blinding over the peak of Parnassos and fell crashing beyond. But with the noise of the arrow, Tharia fell prone on the earth and knew nothing more. End of chapter 28 Read by S.K. Felt Minneapolis, 24th of September, 2022
These men called themselves Athenians, but Aetion believed that they were really Ionians and that they were in Delphi for no good purpose. As for the men themselves, they were inclined to consort with Aetion as an Argive because of the secret league of Argos with Persia. And while they did not talk with him of their projects, they were less careful in his presence than they might otherwise have been. Aetion, meanwhile, being ardent for the Hellenic cause, had kept quiet watch of the disguised Ionians, and later of Nicander's sons as well. He had hitherto found nothing worthy of note, but today a chance word of Dryas's had given him a clue. Then, by careful watching, he had learned that couriers bearing the oracle were to be intercepted. Dryas had a boyish devotion to Aetion, first because of Aetion's beauty and also because of his prowess in wrestling and fast running, combined gifts which easily made a hero in Greece. And Aetion, touched by the boy's love for him, had wished many a day to save Dryas from his treacherous companions. This he had not dared to attempt, because the weak boy would have babbled and all Aetion's chance to watch the Ionians be lost. But now Aetion thought he had a chance to save Dryas. Lycophron had gone to cut off the Thermopylae messengers because he was hard in hand with Persia. Dryas had gone with those who were intercepting the message to Athens because of weakness and fear. Aetion, therefore, the instant he had given word to Tharia, hastened to get a horse to pursue Dryas. Horses were few in Delphi where they were of so little use. He returned to the great temple where workmen painting the crimson columns had left their paint. Here he smeared a red gash upon his knee and stained the breast of his cloak. Like Odysseus, Aetion was a man of many devices. Then mounting, he hurried from Delphi along the Athens road. He trusted much to the swiftness of his horse. The spies must go at the pace of their worst steed, nor would they feel any special need of haste. So Aetion hoped to overtake them. The highway was very clear under the bright moon. It was a mountain road and mountain rough, but the Argives were lovers of horses, and Aetion had not forgotten his early skill. Sometimes he held tight rein and rode with careful slowness. Again, whenever the stretch was good, he dug heels into the flanks of his horse and galloped hard. What man, when at a gallop, has not dreamed of his beloved? And Aetion had just seen Tharia's face again beyond all hope. So thin and changed it was, in its frailness almost like a child's, and very pitiful. And oh, that little cry of joy when she saw him. That sounded again and again in his mind and mingled with the fragrance of the mountain road. So he passed the town of Daulis. Some distance beyond Daulis, he saw the men he was pursuing. As soon as he neared them, he began to cry out to them, cries of suffering and distress. He saw them stop. He dashed into their midst. For the sake of the gods, save me, save me, he cried. What is it? What is it? Ionians were always quick of sympathy. Robbers said upon me, I was going to Orchomenos on a mission. You fellows can guess what kind it was. But, oh, stop the blood. See it trails in the road. At this, Dryas dashed up. Aetion, he exclaimed, going pale. Great Zeus, dear fellow. Aetion displayed his horrible red knee and leg, and as he did so, reeled in Dryas's arms. Help me, he pleaded. Don't leave me. Then Aetion lay in the road with closed eyes and heard them talking. We ought not to stop at all. You know that. We've got to stop, said Dryas's voice, half weeping. I, for one, will not let him lie here to die. But we can't leave you here, Dryas. We need you in Athens. Who will introduce us to Themistocles? I won't leave him. You've got to wait. Some of them drew aside, discussing the matter in low tones. Aetion strained his ear to hear. He heard a scornful laugh. <laughs> Suppose we do leave Dryas here. Will he join us in Athens? By the gods he will. Wasn't he beside himself to come? This was true. Poor Dryas was hoping to get shipped from Athens and save himself in the islands. He was terrified at the certain impending destruction of Delphi. He had ever pleaded to accompany the party. 
Very well, Dryas, they said at last. You can stay. We'll send you to help. You can leave Aetian at Daulis, then follow quickly, do you hear? So they cantered away. Dryas started off for water, but Aetian called him back again, allowing himself to revive. Get me on my horse, he faltered. I must get to Daulis if I can. Dear Aetion, dear, dear fellow, said the affectionate Dryas. They remounted, and soon the distance was doubling between Tharia's brother and the killers of his soul. At the edge of Daulis, Aetion drove his horse close so as to touch Dryas's arm. Dryas, he said in a low voice, do you want to do that vile deed? Dryas started violently, and Aetion caught his wrist. Aetion could throw Dryas at a wrestle like a child. What deed? Dryas asked between chattering teeth. You know very well what deed. Will you let your father and your mother die without lifting your hand to help, while you save yourself, a renegade, a Persian serf? Let me go! Let me go! cried Dryas wildly. Yes, I shall let you go. I will not bring you back against your will. That would be folly. But think. Perhaps your father already knows this. If so, he longs to die. Think of the shame, Dryas. Dryas began to breathe as if weeping. Think of the glory of fighting for Delphi, went on Aetion's low voice. The rich glory, and if you will fight, I will make you my brother at arms. Yes, even knowing what I know, you are a skillful fighter, Dryas. You will not fail in the fight. Suddenly, the sobbing breath stopped, and Dryas sat up straight and urged his horse forward. Quick, quick, he said, before they come back after me. Then he reined in the gallop. Aetion, forgive me, your wound, he said. My wound is red paint, said Aetion, laughing. Thus I was wounded for your sake. And, and you came out for my sake? At this, Dryas began to weep. Indeed. They passed Daulis and hurried on under the setting moon. Dryas was silent now, only urging his horse so fast that Aetion had to check him for fear of accident. In the dark, they met a party of men hurrying toward Athens as if mad. Aetion knew what they were, and Dryas guessed, and he hid his face in his cloak as they rushed by. They were Nicander's kinsmen, riding to intercept those who would withhold the good oracle from Athens. Toward dawn, the two riders neared Delphi, and at the familiar road sites, Dryas lifted his face, saying to himself, Safe! Safe! Safe? asked Aetion, where the Persians will certainly come to harry and destroy. Yes, safe, answered Dryas. Safe from worse than the Persians and with Greek affection he reached for Aetion's hand and kissed it. End of chapter 29 Read by S.K. Veldt Minneapolis, 24th of September, 2022
Here Etienne, whom both had forgotten, stepped forward and touched Dryas's shoulder. They abducted him, Nicander, he said clearly. It was only by a ruse that I saved him. Oh, if you could have seen the joy in the boy's face when I got him free. I see the joy in his face now, said Nicander. Nicander believed, because he so wanted to believe. Tell your father how I fooled them, urged Etienne, and Dryas, between trembling and laughter, told the story of Etienne's red paint wound. But before he'd finished, Nicander rose, took Etienne's hand, and drew him to an embrace. Oh, you good youth, he said. I can never thank you, never fully thank you. No kinsman shall be so dear as you. Now the only shadow on Nicander's joy was his anxiety for Lycophron. Dear gods, where might his son be now? Even if Delphi survived the onslaught of the Persians, this sorrow would remain. Nicander could never speak his son Lycophron's name. A slave brought their breakfast, and as they ate the figs and bread and milk, they began to talk seriously of Delphi's plans of escape. Many citizens had already carried their household treasures up the mountain to the Korakin cave, and the priests were now urging a further questioning of the god, if perchance even yet he might reveal to them some way to save the holy place. Dryas entered into the plans with an interest and fearlessness which caused his father to look at him ever and again. What had happened to Dryas? What brave-minded god was thus changing his son? Such was their conversation when a temple slave came running in at the door past Midon, saying breathlessly, The Pythoness, your daughter, is nowhere in the Pythia house. Is she here, Nicander? Nicander hid his eyes confusedly a moment. Yes, he said. Yes, she is here. I had forgotten. I will bring her back myself and explain. Tell that to Tuche. Dryas, dear lad, go you and fetch your sister. The slave added with embarrassment, "'And, master, I was to tell you that Tuke is very angry. They wish to begin the rites at once. Consultants are waiting, and the priests are there. Aristonike is too ill to go upon the tripod, and they have no Pythia.' "'Oh, unkind gods!' breathed Nicander. His heart had ached every time his daughter was set upon the terrible high seat of the god. Now how much more would it ache, knowing how she had deceived? She must not go there again.' must never again give an oracle. She was no fit subject for the ecstasy. He must find some chance to tell her this. He must command her to resist the trance, no matter what rites were practised. But, oh, what a terrible fate for the poor child! Back to the Pythia house. Of course she must go back. He started to meet her before she could come downstairs. But here Dryas returned with an amazed face, and Melanto was with him, running down into the forbidden aula because of her anxiety. "'How could you think Theria was in the house?' asked Dryas. "'She has not been here. She is nowhere here,' urged Melanto. Again Nicander paused, confused. "'What had he said to the child? What harsh words?' "'He'd not meant them. Of course he had not meant them. But surely she had not gone forth from the house.' Melanto was bringing in old Medon, who knew all who came and went. "'What is it? What?' asked the poor deaf man. "'Yes, little mistress was here, but she went away, back to the Pythia house, yesterday evening, early. Very sad she looked and staggered as she went. So at last they knew that Teria was abroad. Nicander's face hardened with bitter anxiety. "'Come, Dryas,' he said, "'we must find her at once.' Dryas turned to Etion. "'Dearest Etion, will you help us?' "'As for Etion, through what a range of feeling had he been carried in these moments? First, joy like an unbidden melody, because his beloved was in the house, then strong joy, because he might see her as she passed, then horror at her disappearance. Why had she gone? What had Nicander done to make her run away? What cruel thing had he said? But there was no time even to be angry. Theria must be found, and that quickly, before the Persians could arrive. Atheon looked at Nicander, begging for a boon. "'If I might help to find her,' he ventured, "'but let me go my own way while you go another. "'We must search everywhere at once.' Nicander read his unspoken fear. "'Women must not be abroad when the Persians were in the country. "'There was not an instant to lose.' "'Nicander, I am presumptuous to give advice,' said Aetion, "'but send also messengers to the port. "'I beg you do that.' It seemed to Nicander that he was sending messengers to the four quarters of the earth for his vanished children. He answered hurriedly, Dear Etion, you are wise. I can hardly think out this thing. 
He was too occupied to notice Etienne's emotion. Dryas had meantime fetched a fresh cheaton for his friend. You cannot go forth in that stained cloak, he told him. Dear Etienne, how excited you are. How like a kinsman you care for us. We'll find her in half an hour. She ran away once before, you know. I know exactly where she's run to. Etienne was so angry that he dared not answer Dryas. How little the shallow fellow knew of his sister's character and ways. Etienne was glad when they all left the house. How foolish they were, running hither and yon without thought. In Etienne's Argus were many shepherds, and when a sheep was lost they did not go forth in this wise, but first thought about the paths and the simple sheep reasoning, and then went and found. This flight of Therius was of course connected with the message which Etienne had himself given to her. She had not sent for her father, but true heart that she was, she had brought the news herself. But why had she fled forth like this? He took Medon into the street. Tell me, Medon, was Nicander angry with his daughter? Oh, master, how should I know? But Etienne saw at once that Medon did know, and did not rest until he got the truth of him. Then he went back into the house and called Balte. Balte, he said, take with you two men slaves and go up on Parnassus by the far eastern path and look for your mistress. But master, surely she would not go there. Wolves are there. She would not stop for wolves, said Etienne sharply, and Balte saw his eyes fill with tears. If you reach to the Corician cave, Balte, and yet do not find her, then come down by the hither path, and I will meet you at the top of the bad steps. Give me a flask of wine and my sword there. Then Etienne fairly ran out and threw the lane up the slender path he knew so well. On the hard rocky earth he could find no trace of her, but still he climbed on his heart aching for the dear lonely child who had fled from unkindness and injustice. Oh, how could Nicander have let forth upon her gentle head the wrath that should have gone to his sons? Where was his fatherly tenderness? How could he, in the first place, have put her away in the Pythia house, that cruelty, that fearlessness, tales of which were rife in the precinct? How could Nicander have placed her there to be a barren maid, she who was so full of life, so fit to be the mother of children? As Etienne mounted, his anger mounted with him. He longed intensely to take her away from cruelty and neglect, and to give her henceforth only tenderness and the visionary love that was his. He climbed up the Kakash Gala, past the wood in which Theria had hidden overnight, on up into the pathless heights beyond her, into despair of finding her alive. A mountain bear padded past him and broke its way into the thicket to hide. Oh, Artemis! Protector of maidens, help the little maid who is now in thy care alone. By some instinct, for Etienne could no longer reason, he turned back. He descended to the Kakaskala. He entered the wood, and there, on the jagged branch, found some torn yellow shreds of dress. Then, as in a fever, he ran hither and yon, searching, found now a broken twig, now a footprint. He began to call, Theria! Theria! He lost time here, for he was so sure she would stay hiding in the wood. But at the last some god led him out upon the upland, where he caught a glimpse of a fluttering yellow garment on the ground. He ran to it, and at last saw her, slender and prone, her hair lying in soft dark billows upon the rock and hiding her face. With a sob he knelt, lifting her in his arms and tenderly put back her locks. Then he saw her death whiteness and the terrible gash upon her forehead where she had hit the rock in her fall. He was too wild at first to help her, kissing her and calling her, feeling her cold hands holding his lips against hers to make sure if any breath was there. But when she responded not at all, Etienne grew more careful. He brought out the wine but could not give it between the set lips. Then he gathered her in his arms to carry her up to a spring which he remembered in the heights. He was too frightened now to feel any emotion. He only knew that he was carrying Theria away from Delphi, away from the bitterness and mishandling. It was right that he should do so. She belonged to him, to nobody else in all the world. Away in some colony overseas they could be truly wedded and live the years. He even forgot her appalling priesthood and the sacrilege of loving such a one. Meanwhile, perhaps she was dying in his arms. In the upper slope among the firs he found his spring. He laid the dear burden on the ground, bathed her white face, bathed the wound and poured the wine into it. At last life like a visible prayer came back into her face and the colour of life was there. Then indeed did Eros, the tall youth, earliest of all the gods, 
send power into Etienne's heart, filling it with a strange uplifting worship, that invisible power with which the son of chaos holds the cosmos together, Eros the mighty one. Now Theria opened her eyes. They were like black lakes and lonely as the stars. Theria, darling, darling Theria, no harm shall come to you now. Theria, but she looked straight into his face without a spark of recognition. It is I, Etienne, he said, taking her face between his hands. Kiss me, my maiden. Apollon, she murmured. Apollon. She did not close her eyes again, but kept them fixed upon Etienne's face in a way that froze his spirit. Etienne was not skilled in Apollo's ways. He knew nothing of mantic power, by which men with their natural eyes see things unseen. He could only recognize that Theria's spirit was farther from the his than the farthest planet. Apollon, she said again. She was in that far serenity that knows not time nor change, the indifference that comes of too great knowledge from the gods. Of a certainty she was going to die, and that very soon. Aetion sprang to his feet. Fool, fool that he was to bring his darling where she could get no help from leech or magic. If she died here, it would be he who had killed her. The fear of Apollo now came over him. Apollo would blast them both if he took her away for his own. Again he lifted Theria in his arms and carried her back toward the path where he hoped Balte might meet him. Balte did not appear at the head of the Kakash Gala, but presently came Delphic citizens bearing their household treasures to hide in the hills. These, seeing the dying maiden, helped him gladly. Did the Persians hurt her? Are they already come? they asked, terrified. No, said Etienne. The maid was lost and fell upon a rock. They gave their litter on which they'd carried their burdens, and upon this Etienne and the slave of the Delphians bore her down toward her old bitter fate again, toward the priesthood and the torture. If she should live at all, she would not live long in that Pythia house. Etienne's heart was dead within him as he made the slow descent. End of chapter 30, read by Sandra. Chapter 31 of The Perilous Seeds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Vera for The Perilous Seeds by Caroline Dale Snedeker. Chapter 31 Nicander's Nearest of Kin. Meanwhile, Nicander, Andrius of the Easy Confidence, came to the temple of Athena, four thoughts where this time no Theria was to be found. Dryas looked into his father's grieving face. Theria ought to be ashamed of herself, he said stoutly, to give you such trouble now. Be silent, Dryas, said his father sternly. You know nothing about your sister or her reason for this. Try to find her. Try. Father, I'm sorry, said the wandering Dryas, taking his father's hand. I want you to search now in the slave quarter, said Nicander hurriedly. I will go to the precinct whence I will send messengers to Daulus. Wearily, Nicander climbed the precinct hill. His memory was playing him curious tricks. His harsh words, which at first he could in no wise recall, now came back deadly clear. No place in the Pythia house. No place for you at the home hearth. Bringer of wild tales. Great Zeus. He had been God maddened. Blind. The girl had risked her life and reputation to save her brothers from disgrace. Theria was always doing the unexpected. Poor child, always bringing down wrath upon her own head, and, as he now saw it, doing something either interesting or noble. What an ecander she was! How true in every instinct to her ancient race! While these thoughts beset him, Nicanto was hastening from treasury to treasury. 
hastening through the hidden paths and secret places of the precincts. Each familiar statue, tripod, each quiet, chapel-like treasury room fused him with a thought of her intense love of everything in Delphi. Her very deceptions on the tripod had been only from her too great love for Delphi and for Greece. And her lover, poor little daughter, if he had but kept closer to her in daily life. Ah, she had tried so wistfully to keep close to him. She would have told him of this lover long ago. Why had he not warned his child when he was making her a priestess? He had put her in the perilous seat of the tripod without one thought of her. He had left her aidless and lonely. He was to blame, to blame. Near the great temple, Dryas met him again, saying that his search had been fruitless, asking where now to go. Nicander caught his son's hand convulsively. Go nowhere, he pleaded. Stay with me. But even as he clung to his boy, he thought how impossible it would be for Theria to do what Dryas had done. No spies could have dragged her away on such an errand. And ho, oh, dear Peon, she would not have companioned with them at all, nor left her father lonely through these terrible days. She would have entered with him into every struggle for Delphi's honor, if her father had only allowed her. How wistful she was when she met him, returning from council. What a sly little puss in her questioning, finding out his problems which he did not mean to tell. Nicander smiled, but in his smiling found himself blinded with tears. Dryas was sure that it was anxiety, for like of Ron, which unmanned his father thus. Long after nightfall, the two came home again. The slaves brought supper, and all unwilling, they sat down to eat. Then footsteps were heard in the doorway. Ision and the slave with Theria, white on her litter. Nicander ran to her, lifting her in his arms as though she were a child, calling her in daring names, weeping with relief. He laid her on a couch in the aula while they brought the torches. But one look at Theria's face, and wide open eyes sobered him. Theria, Theria, he called to her, terrible silence. Oh, Nicander, don't you see that she is dying? cried Etion, broken-hearted. Nicander rose solemnly to his feet. She has beheld a god he said. She is yet in the vision. He returned to Edion. Has she spoken any word? She called upon Apollo thrice, but since then the silence. Oh, Nicander, what does it mean? Nicander bowed his head. Knowing what he knew of Theria's sacrilege, he fully believed the state to be a doom from Phoebus himself. He believed that she would die. And when he lifted his head, trying to speak, Etion's anger melted before the anguish in his face. Nicander, as a worshipper of Apollo, had recognized at once the mantic ecstasy. He knew also the accepted means of breaking the ecstatic state. He had balta, Bethyria, in warm water and gently rub her body. He himself brought his lyre and sitting at the bedside played strong clear music in the Doric mode. Then, fearing that he might have omitted some act, he went out and fetched in the priests to look at her. They gazed awestruck. Yes, you're doing all you can, they said. The maid is certainly in a vision but she is far gone toward Hades. So Nicander resumed his post, sitting there, patiently playing. He 
he was the more convinced that she would die even his anxiety for like a frown faded before this unlooked for sorrow nikander's two sons were only by some physical chance his children this girl was a child of his mind and heart she loved what he loved hated what he hated she was his nearest of kin his own why had he not known it before at last as serious wide open eyes half closed he tried to believe she slept so he lay down on a couch near at hand while the old slave walter watched it was full morning when walter woke him caramanao and agis are in the andron to speak with you these were the young kinsmen whom nikander had sent in pursuit of like a frown nikander rose and went to hear what he must hear the two young men waited solemnly it was midnight nikander when we came up with the spies on the north road said young caramanor gently they gave battle so quick that we had just time to fend ourselves even though we so outnumbered them and like a frog even though we called and kept calling to him to come over to our side that we had only come to save him like a frog laughed us to scorn and oh nikander he fought splendidly fiercely like a wild boar and so he fell two of the spies fell the rest fled to the hills he was fearless always said nikander in a low voice the young man put his arm pityingly over his uncle's shoulder he could not know that just now nikander felt only relief in the death of his son we took an oath among us we kinsmen said caramanor all of us an oath not to tell this thing we will say that he fell in a skirmish with the persians men are too troubled now to think his absence will not be marked our words will be believed if any of us after the persian onslaught be left alive for beliefs or doubtings can we do anything further for you nikander no said nikander quietly may the son of leto bless you for saving my son's honor i must go now and tell his mother dryas who had been playing the liar at theoria's bedside had stopped playing when his father withdrew he sat awestruck waiting presently melanthos death while for like a frown sounded through the house oh look balte whispered dryas through his tears poor theoria does not even hear it balte bent over her in her sailing she hears it well enough she answered sadly she hears but she is too far to care end of chapter 31「32 of the perilous seat」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Vera for The Perilous Seat by Caroline Dale Snedeker. Chapter 32 Terrible News from Thermopylae. Theria lay on her couch without change, except to grow weaker each day. Balta had her own remedies. She brought a sieve and suspended it from the ceiling. Then she whirled it, reciting all the magic she knew and all the cures. At whatever cure the sieve came to rest that one she tried but alas it did no good nikander in spite of urgent business with the priests spent hour upon hour beside his daughter 
sometimes he himself wondered at his strength of love for a mere girl he sat dreaming over her learning her with a new intimate vision which led him further every hour often and again as he looked across to where melantho sat he would say wife we have not understood this little one of ours and now it is too late and melantho would come around the couch and timidly kiss her husband's forehead nikander after his first keen gratitude to etion was too beaten about by the winds of fate to think of him etion however came every day he was very shy very guarded in his inquiries after the delphic priestess his friendship for thrice and thrice devotion to him were ample excuse for his coming then on the fourth day of theria's illness delphi rocked with news as at times it rocked with actual earthquakes the heralds from the north came running crying the news with spent voices Thermopylae is taken. Thermopylae is taken by the Persians. Then, after they took breath again from their long run, the Spartans are beaten back. The noble three hundred are killed every man. Leonidas is killed. All, all is lost. The Persians stole through over the mountain and attacked us from the rear. Thus they took the pass. They are free in Hellas now to do their will upon you. Yes, they are marching hither. They are already in the land of Daulis. They are not forty miles away. The trembling Delphians were mute with horror, but the fleet pursued Nicander. Was the fleet also destroyed? Upon this, the heralds had better news to tell. Oh, the fleet! Wonderful! The gods themselves! Never was known such a storm. Three days it lasted. Oh, Delphians! Rain, torrents of rain, now in midsummer when we never have rain. Wind! Oh, such wind that it strewed the Persian ships in heaps along the shore. Windrows of ships and drowned Persians, but our ships, the Athenians, were safe in the Euboean Strait. Not one was lost in the storm, and very few by battle. Well said, your oracle. Pray to the winds. Nicander, his heart swelling with joy and pride, began to see dimly that miracles can happen in spite of sacrilege and in other than accepted ways. The Athenians, he asked, are they hopeful? Oh, hopeful, heartened by the God's help and the storm's help. Of course, the Persian and Ionian ships still outnumber them. But the Athenians say that some God is on their side. They are ready to fight again. They are hastening back to Athenian waters for the fighting. But Delphi had no such hope. Delphi was all confusion. She had no real army, even though she was an independent state. She had only her temple guard. This guard had been sufficient in ordinary times. For all Hellas revered Apollo's temple. No Hellenic state would dare plunder Apollo's shrine. But now, those hordes of barbarians who knew not the god. From these, the Delphians well knew what to expect. They hurriedly left the heralds. Everywhere now were seen men with their families, their slaves, carrying burdens, some hurrying up toward the mountain some hurrying down toward the port of Kirha. But the braver citizens stayed with white faces to consult the oracle once more. Nicander, hastening homeward, found these and the priests already at his door. You must give us back the Pythia, Nicander. 
spoke Cobon angrily. The oracle must be consulted at once. Who ever heard of a Pythia being taken home again? Nicander pushed through the crowd and stood with his back to the closed door. You may not take her, he said. She is dying. She would die before she reached the tripod. She might not. You know very well, Nicander, that on the edge of death, the Pythia often prophesies best. Timon took Nicander's arm. I'm sorry, cousin, he said, but you know that what Gobon says is true. This is no time for a man to think of his own household. She might save the very shrine. She cannot save it, said Nicander stubbornly. She has not spoken for four days. She is beyond all speech. Aristonike is not so ill as she. He closed his eyes for a moment, trying to decide what he might and might not tell. My daughter has no gift of ecstasy, he ventured. No oracles come to her at all. Nicander, what lies? You know the very best of the oracles have been through her. Aristonica broke in another priest. Aristonica prophecies nothing but ill. They seized Nicander, held him struggling, while priests and citizens broke upon the door and rushed into the house. Dries, Dries, help me! Nicander shouted, but if Dries was there, he did not appear. Nicander heard Balte shriek as the priest caught up her nurse ceiling. Forth they rushed again, his daughter, white as death, in a stalwart priest's arm. So they hurried up the road toward the temple. Then Nicander, from his house, saw temple slaves running to meet the priest, saw them all stop together. They crowded in confusion. Then, from the confusion, came the same temple slaves, and to Nicander's amazement, they were bearing Theria in their arms, bringing her home again. The priests and citizens ran onward, frantically up to the temple. Nicander wrested himself free and ran to meet the slaves. They gave her carefully into his arms. She is dead. Already dead? he whispered. No, no, master, they assured him. He did not pass to find out what had happened, but hurried back with Theria to her couch, where on a sudden he could do nothing but weep and wring his hands. Balta had to compose both her patient and him, assuring him over and over again that no harm had been done. It was Dryas who later, hurrying home from the precinct, told Nicander what had happened. Aristonica, he announced, passed into ecstasy suddenly, without any rites, and prophesied wonderful things. They carried her to the tripod even while she prophesied. The crowd of priests, coming from our house, reached the adytum, just in time to hear her cry out. The God will care for his own. Then she fell forward into old Ekarato's arms and was dead. Nicander shuddered. Poor child, he said. Poor, poor little girl. But, father, think what that means, said Thrice. The God will care for his own. Nicander put his hand on Thrice's shoulder. Yes, yes, my son, you are right. But had anyone asked a question, how did it happen? But father, don't you know that Akaridos himself has been asking a question for days? He is so old, I suppose he knows the oracle better than any of us. He says that in his youth, this method was tried and answer received beyond all hope. But what did he do? 
asked the dazed Nicander. He made sacrifice right in front of the Pythia house, not as usual on the great altar. The question which he was to ask was, What shall we do to save the treasures of the god? Shall we hide them in the hills? But he repeated not this question at all. But instead, the while he was sacrificing, he kept repeating to himself the answer which he desired. Thinking only of this answer, the god will care for his own. The sacred things must not be touched by mortal hands. The god will care for his own. And sure enough, within the house, locked within it indeed, Aristonic awoke from sleep with a low cry and began to say those very words. Touch not the sacred things. The god will care for his own. So, when Tushe came running out to tell him, Acheridos brought Aristonic forth to the tripod. Dryas passed, taking a long breath. And now, all the Delphians say there is no need to stay to defend our Delphi. We may all flee to the mountains while the god alone fights for us. We of the household also must make haste to go. It was almost a pleading look which poor Dryas bent upon his father. You can go if you will, Dryas. For my part, I shall not leave the shrine. Again, Dryas took a long breath. His cheek paled and he looked down. Then he said, I might have known you would answer that. I shall stay with you. End of chapter 32「Section 33 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Schnedeker At A. Tien's Call What Dryas reported was true. The Delphians were deserting their town, whether from great faith or great fear, who could say? Their temple guard could not be called an army. It seemed as vain to wait for the Persian as to wait for the on-sweep of a flood at the breaking of a dam. The dam had broken at Thermopylae, and a flood was coming. Men sent their wives and children across the gulf to Corinth, and thence to Achaia, and when there were no more boats, others sent them to Amphissa in Locris. The men of Delphi hurried up into Mount Parnassus, to the Corician cave and to other fastnesses known only to themselves. Only about sixty people were left in Delphi, and of course the armed temple guard. Nicander sought out Melanto. Dear wife, he said, I have chartered a little boat to take you and your own special slaves to Corinth. It'll be a long journey for you, but do not be afraid. You'll be safe in Achaia. And Theria, she asked. Would God I could send her, said Nicander brokenly but she is too ill to be moved. She's weaker than ever since that terrible experience with the priests. Even were she strong enough, the priests would not allow her to go. The Pythia is not allowed to go away. He looked up, wondering at Malanto's silence. Malanto was a timid creature and the most submissive wife in the world. Am I like the cakes of cheese that they carry up to the cave? she asked huskily. Cakes of cheese? asked Nicander blankly. Am I, goods and chattels, not even so much alive as the dogs of Delphi? The dogs stay. Great Payan! Malanta was angry. Nicander had never seen her angry in his life. She stamped her foot. I will not go, she cried. I'll turn over the boat and swamp it if you put me in it. I will not go when, when all my dear ones stay. Then she melted with streaming tears. Poor Malanto! After this little outburst, she would have done anything Nicander required. But Nicander took her in his arms, loving her as he never thought to do. My dear Malanto, he said, I begin to think I am the stupidest man in Delphi. Of course you shall stay. It was no easy matter to care for two helpless women at such a time. But Nicander was glad that Malanto was to stay. 
As for Balte, nations might rise or fall. She had one care only, to watch her nursling. And now Balte was busy with new plans. She had long ago given up her sieve and taken it back to the kitchen where she gave it a kick of scorn. Daria was steadily growing weaker, but her eyes, as Balte studied them, looked not quite so glassy, not quite so blank as at first. Sometimes Balte actually saw in them a great sadness. When anyone came into the door, Teria's eyes would slowly, painfully direct themselves thither, seeming to search, and when the search was made, this deep sadness or disappointment would settle upon her face, and once, instead of relapsing into blankness after their pitiful searching, the dark eyes closed and tears stole down between the lids. What did her child want? Balte asked herself this question. Ask Teria every question she knew. For while Nicander could not bring himself to speak to that strange blank face of Teria, Balte talked and asked and crooned as any nurse crooned to her baby. Though to all her asking Balte received no reply, yet at last she thought she knew her darling's wish. The next day she met Nicander in the outer aula. Master, she said, I know now what little mistress wants. Great heaven, has she spoken? asked Nicander. No, master, but her eyes speak to me. They do not to me, said Nicander sorrowfully. Oh, master, you must not be wroth with little mistress if I tell you that she loves that good youth that found her on the mountain. Don't you blame her for it. She's a human child, and Aetian loves her so dearly. She wants to see him, master. She wants to see him. Poor Balte, you cannot know that. Balte told what she had seen. You forget, said Nicander, that your little mistress is priestess. It would be absolutely improper. She's going soon where there's no proper nor unproper, retorted Balte in her broadest Doric. And if she goes, what harm to gear this wee bit of joy beforehand? And if she dies for lack of it, then it's ye will be her murderer. Balte was determined to supplicate her master with the unrefusable supplication if she could get consent no other way. But at this moment came Aetion, all excited over what the priests had done. It's ye I'm talking, a young man, announced Balte. The master here says no, but the little mistress is pining away for a sight of ye. She is, thought. Is she better? Did she ask? Oh, Nicander, pleaded Aetion. Balte is dreaming. Go back to your little mistress, Balte. But Balte stood her ground. If the lad calls her, she'll answer him. Mark ye that. Will she answer? Do you really believe she will answer? asked Aetion his lips quivering with the memory of Theria's unanswering silence on the mountain. Oh, love, Aleto, stop asking. Come, said Balte. And Nicander suddenly consented. Etienne came in with awe as one comes into a death chamber. He knelt by her couch, laid his brown trembling hands over her two white ones, and leaning close called her once and again. Then an amazing thing happened. There passed slowly from off the dark lakes of eyes something as if it were a shadow, leaving them sweet and sensible, leaving in them an ardent, dreamy look. Then the dream gave place to lovely awakening, which was Theria's self, a surprised, outreaching love. Her lips framed a word, Aetion. Aetion forgot all about him. He gathered her close, kissing her, calling her, and now she spoke quite aloud, calling him in return with names and epithets as dear. You have not forgotten me, he was saying. Oh, I thought you had forgotten. Never, never. I could not forget you in Atron, was her murmured answer. Speak to me, me also, my daughter, pleaded Nicander. Yes, father, dear, dear father, came her answer. No trace of fear or unaffection for all his angry words which had sent her away. She reached out her arms to him like a returning child. Balte clapped her hands with loud sobs and shoutings. She too must kiss and rejoice over her little one. Balte, said Nicander solemnly, may the gods in my age give me such wisdom as yours. For my part I shall never question yours again. So now, dear Balte, go and fetch Malanto. Malanto came, and Dryas. One would have thought to hear the rejoicings in the house that no Persians were anywhere in Greece. Then presently Balte was for sending them all away. 
They must not tire her, darling. Theria clung to her lover's hands. Will you come again, Aetion, she pleaded. Say you will come again. Nicander doubtfully opened his lips, but Balte waved a warning finger. Indeed he will, my darling, she said with authority. Oh, Balte will see that he does. And Aetion, leaping up, kissed Balte's withered cheek, at which Theria's first sweet laugh was heard. End of section 33, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. Chapter 34 of The Perilous Seat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Schnedeker Chapter 34 Aetion and Nicander Nicander and Aetion went out hand in hand, as was the custom of Greek men who loved each other. Dear youth, what can I say to you? spoke Nicander. You've returned to me my two children, my son and now my daughter. I love your daughter. I love your daughter, spoke out Aetion passionately. Now you know it. I want her for my wife. Would you could have her, was Nicander's answer. But can I not? questioned the unreasonable youth. My dear boy, you know she is priestess. I wish Apollo had killed me before I made her priestess. Aetion clenched his hands. She shall not go back to the Pythia house. She's too splendid, too free-minded. She shall certainly never go upon the tripod, responded Nicander. I will promise you that. Aetion paced the room in bitter distress. How could you make her priestess, he said, forgetting all kindness. How could you take away her last chance for action and noble living? You don't deserve to be Theria's father. Indeed, I do not, was Nicander's sorrowful rejoinder. He laid quieting hands on the youth. We are in dark days, Aetion. Perhaps not one of us will be alive tomorrow. Let us not grieve over what may not in any case come to pass. The hope would be so much, said Aetion with sudden tears. Aetion's fortunate beauty made each emotion of his appealing, whether bowing the head in grief or lifting it with a sudden smile. Nicander loved him for his grief, and, forgetting his own bitter share in it, set about earnestly to calm him. My dear boy, he said, in the coming battle you will forget this love for a maid. It will be unimportant in the light of great deeds. Men love other men with such devotion and companioning, but hardly a maid. But this is Theria, said Aetion, childishly. Yes, mused the father proudly, it is Theria. Do you know, went on Aetion in a low voice, I thought she was a goddess the first time I saw her. I really did. It was in the precinct of Athena. I was weeping loud with misery because my work of four years was brought to naught, and I was pushed back into slavery, for I had been long in bondage. And Theria came leaping down the hill in the morning light. She spoke to me. Oh, such wonderful kindness, to which I had long been a stranger. Then afterward, O Nicander, she saved me, braving all sorts of punishment. She saved me. Could a man have done more than that? Is it any wonder that I love her? Nicander felt it his duty to dissuade the youth from a love so hopeless, but he suddenly had no word to say. That love seemed so sweet and right and pure. He was proud that this daughter of his had called it forth. The youth went on. We of Argos are worshippers of Hera. There is a saying among us that the souls who follow Hera desire a love of royal quality. Hera cherishes the lawful union of man and woman. Nicander's head bowed lower. He'd forgotten this further obstacle that Aetion was a metic. The union was impossible from every side, impossible. With grieving face, Nicander turned and left Aetion where he stood. End of chapter 34 Read by Sandra. Chapter 35 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. April 23, 2022. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Theria tells her vision. 
The candor's care was now to save as much of his household treasure as might be. Before this time, his anxiety over his children had so beset him that he cared little whether anything else was saved or not. But now he set slaves to packing the family records of the old Nicander drinking vessels of gold and silver and the stores of corn, oil, and wine. Theria's storeroom soon bore a changed aspect. Then the most faithful slaves he sent with these things up into the mountain to the Corican cave. But even with this business, Nicander found time to go ever and again to Theria's bedside to stop, perhaps, for a single caress or word or question. Theria was sitting up in her couch and keeping poor Balte busy running for this and that to occupy her. Father, she said, holding up her five fingers brightly as he came toward her, this is the fifth time you have come to me I have counted. Bless your heart, child. Why do you count my visits? Because they are my treasures, she answered. I used to see you only twice in the day, and the time between was so long and stupid. The candor bent and kissed her, not quite able to speak. He determined that this daughter should never again lack his companionship. Then a swift stab of memory reminded him how soon she must be returned to the Pythia house, where he could see her not at all. He sat down beside her. Balte, seeing that he was there to watch in her stead, hurried off on some errand. Balte was no sooner gone than Theria bent near him. Father, she said in awed tones, I was not ill. I was held in dumbness by what I saw in the mountain. Yes, daughter, he responded. The god crossed my path. Phoebus, Apollo, I saw him. Even though Nicander had guessed this, he was startled at her telling. Oh, father, so living, beautiful he was, with the dawn in his face and power shining from all of him. All the statues in the precinct should be broken. They are not my god. We must leave them, said her father gently, for those of us who cannot see. First, she went on, I saw only a golden light upon my path, which followed me and frightened me. Even as she spoke, her eyes grew starry, and her father caught her shoulder, shaking her. No, do not tell me, child, be still. The dumbness may come again. No, it will not, she smiled. Apollo promised. Great heaven, did he speak? Yes, yes. Then she told as near as she remembered the words of the message. Oracle, it could hardly be called, as it was a revelation for her alone. Theria, daughter of Delphi, be gone from my temple. My bow shall not hurt thee. Nay, for I love thee. I shall be able without thee. I shall care for my own. And how the god had turned and shot his terrible shaft away from her over Mount Parnassus toward the north. Nicander was uplifted, overwhelmed. He went hastily and fetched tablet and stylus and wrote it down for the temple records. He was hopeful, fairly trembling, with what he guessed this message might mean for his daughter's future. Theria herself thought only of the god's forgiveness. Apollo said that he loved me, she repeated. He said it, and he laughed at me because I wanted him to slay me. What would the priests think of this message of the god? Nicander hardly dared hope that they would put upon it the interpretation which he so desired. No Pythia had ever been freed from priesthood. Indeed, if he told the vision, must it not bring them to a knowledge of her false oracle? the punishment of which would be death. His face grew set with thought, but yes, he would risk even that fate in the hope of what the god's message might do for her. He kissed his child and hurried out to find Timon and the other priests. How changed already were the streets, empty of folk. The houses closed and locked or left open in the haste of flight, showing the vacant rooms. He found Timon in the precinct, but Timon was wholly indifferent to Theria's part of the god's message. 
It was the hurtling shaft of Phoebus which interested him. It was the shot toward Parnassus, you say? That is a good omen, he asserted. The candor could not be sure, but he soon saw that the priests were too beset now with their fears and instant business to consider Theria's status as priestess, the matter so dear to his heart. A party of Phokian peasants, said Timon, came into town this morning, fleeing from the Persians. Their tidings are horrible. The armies have overrun all the land of Phokis. They are killing men, outraging women, burning towns. Drymos is burned, Sharadra, Amphikia, Neon, Alatia, and many more. They have burnt the temple of Apollo at Abai. Do you not think, Nicander, that that may mean perhaps that they are headed the other way toward Athens and will pass us by? For Abai was on the eastern road. I do not, said Nicander. If they burnt the god's temple at Abai, they will not spare his temple at Delphi. The Persian prisoners are telling that Xerxes, the king, knows more exactly what is treasured in our temples than he knows the treasures of his own place. He will not spare Delphi. I have sent my wife, daughters, and slaves to Achaia, said Timon. If I am killed and you spared Nicander, will you send them word? Something in Nicander's face stopped him. I am sorry, he added, that you may not send Thary away. No priest would allow it. The oracle without a Pythia at such a time as this. My wife is staying too, replied Nicander, with not without pride. Then I advise you to bring all up within the precinct walls as soon as possible, urged his kinsman. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rucker. April 23, 2022, Westford, Massachusetts. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Refuge in the Precinct. In Delphi, where all was danger, the precinct was perhaps the most dangerous place. Yet Nicander, with his faith, did not think this, nor would any other Greek think it. He hurried home and sought Melantho. We must go up to the precinct at once, he said. Make ready as soon as you can. In an hour's time, they were all gathered with the slaves in the men's aula. Bundles of clothes and little treasures were in their hands. Some of the slaves were weeping, but the family stood in that awed silence which precedes departure. Theria seemed even yet but distantly touched by the world's alarms. The calm of the vision mood was still upon her. The candor believed that she would never wholly recede from this, but would always retain the serenity of mind which marks one who has beheld a god. Etienne came in asking for Dryas, but seeing Theria there in her cloak, of course, forgot all else. Theria was shy, but Etienne took her in his arms quite frankly and kissed her. Nicander looked upon them with an aching heart, thinking of how many a hedge shut out happiness from these two. Meanwhile, Dryas was pacing nervously to and fro under the balcony. Nicander averted his eyes. He could not bear that his son should be in the pangs of personal fear. But Etienne went directly to Dryas. Dryas, he said, would it not be well for you to take a last survey of all the rooms to see that nothing is left? Do it quickly, for all is ready. Dryas hurried off with just the sense of relief which Etienne had meant to afford him. And as Etienne once more stood at Theria's side, Nicander said to him, I want you, Etienne, to be with us in the precinct as a son of the house. A son could not be more dear. Dryas returned. I've been through the rooms, he said brightly. There's nothing worthwhile but this old thing in the storeroom. It was like a Franz old lyre which Theria had used all these years. Oh, yes, yes, I want it, 
said Theria, taking it in her arms. Are we all ready now? asked Nicander. Theria began to look around. Her face flushed, then paled. Then she asked the question which Nicander had been dreading. Where is Lycophron, father? Why isn't he with us? Nicander put his arm about her and led her away from the others. Oh, she said in a frightened voice, I remember now. Father, did he go clean away, away from us? My dear child, he is dead, said Nicander without tears. Then he told her of the kind oath of the kinsman. There you too must keep that secret. But she only clung to him, sobbing. Etienne came to comfort her, and before long she was able to go with them out toward the precinct. It was natural that the few remaining Delphians should cling as close as possible to the great temple. The candor saw to his regret that the only obvious refuge for Theria was the Pythia house. It was the only building besides the temple itself upon the temple platform. Into the old prison place she must go. But Melantha went in with her, and there was also an old blind woman too feeble for fight, and a young mother born on a litter with her hour-old child. The candor was allowed to go in and out as the one upon whom all depended, and in front of the house at Etienne and Dryas kept guard. The great danger had broken down all conventions. Before nightfall, Nicander took Melantho and Theria out through the small gate of the precinct wall, which was just back of the Pythia house. He gave Theria the gate key. He then led them up a little path amid the talus of the cliff to where there was a tomb against the hillside. Nicander had caused a narrow hole to be made in the side of the tomb where a thick laurel bush would hide it. The door of the tomb itself presented a sealed front. Hither Nicander had brought provisions, and here, so nearby and yet secure, he told Theria she must come with her mother should the Persians enter the precinct. As they turned back toward the Pythia house, he gave Theria a small, sharp dagger. You will not use it too soon, I know, for you are brave. You will know the moment of it comes. It is for both of you. With a strange sense that all this was quite a usual thing to do, they came back through the gate. At twilight, Nicander, passing Theria's door, saw her with her head down, weeping quietly. He came and sat beside her, questioning her. It is like a fron, she said through her tears. Oh, father, I loved him. He was so good to me. Now Nicander's grief for Lycophron had been bitter and lonely. He could hardly share it with Dryas, and Melantha knew nothing of the truth. So the grief haunted him like a hovering Erinus. We must remind ourselves that it is best as it is, he said dryly. Yes, best for him, but I miss his goodness. No matter who is kind to me, I shall miss his kindness. Was he so kind to you? said Nicander, for there in the house, as so often happens, the father had not guessed the bond between these youngsters. Yes, always he would stop and tell me the news I was hungry to know. He would spend time upon me when no one else thought of me, and father, when I was here dying of loneliness, like a fron, sent Balte to me. I know it was disobedient, but it was also kind. He gave Balte money to use for bribes so she could get in. And, as if that were not enough, he sent me messages, just the ones that he knew I wanted most. He had a heart of gold. Suddenly Nicander bowed his head low in a passion of weeping. The unexpected praise, the unexpected bringing back of his son into the sweetness of the family life, broke him down completely. Theria threw her arms about him, frightened at her thoughtlessness. Oh, father, I should have thought of you before I said it, she faltered. Dear child, you have given me something that I thought was forever lost, he answered. He went out readier for the hard tomorrow than he had deemed possible. End of chapter 36
Section 37 of The Perilous Seat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. The Perilous Seat by Carolyn Dale Snedecker. Book 4. The God Will Take Care for His Own. The Persian Comes. The night was deepening. Aetion and Dryas, fully armed, stood guard together on the temple platform, not far from the Pythia house. Nicander, at their insistence, had gone within the house. He was sleeping, worn out by anxieties for children and state. Do you think, spoke Dryas in a low voice, that even now the host may go on toward Athens and leave us out of their march? It is possible, returned Aetion. The Persians have no time to lose in the direction of Athens. Their marching to Abai is a good sign for Delphi. Meanwhile, Delphi was armed for the Medes' immediate coming. Most of the precinct guards were stationed at the great gate. The small gates facing the highway had a few men each, but the gates in the back wall were entirely without guard, a pitiful preparation truly for the coming of a hundred myriads of men. It was a showing forth of the Delphians' despair. The best they could do was so far short of adequate defense that this seemed nor less nor more. Suddenly, as the two friends stood there in the night, they saw a glow break on the far heights east of the Pleistos Valley, very red and brightening, brightening. Look, said Dryas, between lips which hardly parted. Etion, that light up there! One of the old temple guardsmen approached. That will be up Dollis way, he said. They've set fire to Dollis. Neither Dryas nor Aetion made comment. They knew only too well what it meant. The Persians were heading for Delphi and were now not two hours away. Dryas hurriedly sent a slave to fetch wine. Don't do that, advised Aetion. The wine will help you now, but later it will weaken your arm. Dryas clapped his hands together in pitiful misery. Why don't you hate me? Kick me out for the dog I am. Why did you ever try to save me? Hush, hush, said Aetion. He laid his hand on Dryas' arm. Your father must not hear you. Why, Aetion, your hand is cold as ice. Of course it is, foolish boy. Do you suppose other men are made of wood, and only you feel what must be hid? Oh, Etienne, forgive me, forgive me, pleaded the emotional Dryas. This inaction now, this waiting, said Etienne soberly, is the hardest part of the battle. I have not been in battles myself, but old soldiers tell me so. Think, Dryas, you have father, mother, sister to protect. I have no one I can call my own, and no city. Father would give you Theria, whispered Dryas, if he could get her free. And oh, Aetion, I know he feels that Delphi is your city. I feel that Delphi is your city. All night long, Dryas had been assailed by a horrible picture of his own death. His highly developed imagination swept the thing through him like a reality. It was a spear thrust in his side, keen and fatal, the grinning face of a Persian triumphing over him. Dryas tried to think other thoughts, but this thing returned again and again, sometimes with an actual pain where the weapon was thrust in. Dryas could have conquered it, but for the fear-producing chant which old Akeratos kept up near the great altar. All night long, the old prophet moved to and fro, making sacrifices, trying omens of all sorts, seeing portents where none were, an eerie, aged figure in the starlight, with his white beard wagging and his hands lifted on high. Dawn began to break in the slow, beautiful way, as if the day were to be all gentleness instead of the most dreadful day these hills had ever known. At full morning, Nicander came out refreshed to share with Dryas and Aetion the morning meal. He was in armor, for Nicander was yet in full fighting strength. They were eating in silence when Dryas, with a cry, jumped to his feet. 
Look, look, he said, there on the uppermost road, the road from Dallas winding down the distant mountains among the crags was several times visible and lost again ere it reached Delphi. Now, on its highest farthest stretch, the Delphians saw moving spots, like groups of ants carrying ant burdens. Even as the Delphians were gazing, the spots became a solid mass which filled the road from end to end of its visible stretch. They could not tell now that the mass was moving. Simply, the road at that point was curiously black. Dryas's cry brought Theria from the house. She noted the looks and gestures of the men, then stole over to Eetion's side. The others were too intent to notice what she did. What is it? she asked. He pointed out the black stretch of distant road, and she knew by the horror in his face what it meant. Etion was not a natural soldier. Only training and Hellas' love had made him such. But now, with Theria beside him, the horror in his face changed to iron resolve. Theria hardly recognized him as he turned toward her. Theria, there is no chance for Delphi now, he whispered. Your father has told me of your hiding place. I shall keep as near to it as I may, but the gods only know whither the battle would thrust me. If I escape, I'll come to you. I'll speak outside a password, Hera Basilia, because Hera is my goddess at home. Yes, she whispered, clinging to his hand. But Adon, Pan will care for his own. He could not but catch the hope which lived with her the peace which her vision had left upon her. He bent and kissed her, almost believing that they should both be saved. Only Dryas saw him do it. Dryas, whom Aetion had forgot in this moment of snatched joy. Dryas, whose struggle had now grown so intense that it seemed every moment he must break away. The hills were still there to hide in, so near, so possible a refuge. Was it worth standing there to be slaughtered? This was no battling for Delphi. This was foolishness. They were, all of them, fools, fools, fools. Now Nicander came to him. Son, he said reassuringly, I am thankful you are here. Dryas did not answer, for at this moment a low exclamation broke from all the little group at once. The Persians had emerged on the lower road. Al could be caught the moving color of their garments, flashes of bronze as shields glanced the light, and now a moving bulk of shivering glitter as a host of upright spears advanced. Nearer, nearer, well seen now at the foot of Delphi's own cliffs, well seen at the foot of Phedriades well seen below in the precinct of Athena forethought in Delphi village. Pointed caps, huge wicker shields, tall lances, these were the Medes themselves. Behind them, a curious barbarian folk in hooded mantles, and, oh dear Pion, what are these? Men black as ebony, clad in skins of leopard and lion, carrying bows twice as tall as themselves. Some have woolly heads, others have heads not human at all but horse heads, with upright ears and flowing manes. Behind these come tribes and tribes and tribes, greedy, pitiless, devouring. Look far up the mountain road, Every visible loop is filled back to where it is lost in distance. O oh, Apollon, surely you have forgotten. Son of Leto, you are far off this day, joying among your Olympians. Our Delphi is naught to you. What happened now can hardly be believed, but it is recorded by the father of history, and later writers bear testimony to it. This had happened time and time again in the past to the hurt of Delphi. Why not happen this once to her help? Herodotus says it did happen. Etion Dryas Theria Nicander heard groan as if the earth, Ogi herself, had spoken. 
a little bird singing in the laurel bush nearby stopped its song and leaped aloft with frightened cries. Then, like a wave on the sea beach, the temple platform beneath their feet pitched forward. They saw the wave motion run onward upon the earth, down the glen, and to the farther hillside where the forest received it shivering. The Delphian group on the platform stumbled wildly forward. Ol Akeratos fell flat before his altar. The altar itself shook, and the great temple rocked as if about to begin an elephantine dance. The earth movement was distinct outward from Parnassus toward the valley. The area, looking up at Phadriades, saw the cliffs nodding solemnly to each other as if to say, I, so be it. Then huge rocks flew hurtling from their summits high overhead and down upon the road, down crashing upon the moving Persian host. There was a great and bitter cry, death, terror, confusion. The Persian army fled this way and that, forward toward the village, downward into the forethought precinct, where the avenging rocks of Delphi followed them. Everywhere the mountains sent up clouds and clouds of dust. In the distance, upon the distant armies, poured down avalanches of earth and rolling stones and dust, more dust. Of the little group on the temple platform, Dryas was the first to get upon his feet. Hail Pian! Alala! Alala! He shouted the old Dorian war cry, and waiting not for Aetion nor his father, charged down the sacred way. His spear was forward ready, his shield weightless upon his arm. His hair streamed from his helmet upon the wind. He was light-footed as a god. So might Achilles have swept into battle after his days of wrath. Aetion and Nicander with a score of temple guards, leaped after him. The great gates had already been flung open by the earth's motion. Aye, aye, look up, look up, behold our avenging god. It was old Akeratus shouting in a frenzy which Theria had to obey. Her upward glance caught the bronze votive chariot of Gelon just as it toppled from its lofty eyrie in the cliffside. Down it came, chariot, horses, victor and charioteer, banging on jutting rock and crag with grand clangor, a divine and shattering noise. And there happened to the Persians yet greater portents, says the historian, two men in full armor and of stature more than human followed them slaying and pursuing. Meanwhile, Dryas, in the midst of battle, knew only that he was struggling amid a sea of men. Persian warriors, who, in spite of their terror of the supernatural happenings, fought the pursuing Delphians desperately and tried thus to preserve their fleeing hordes. Dryas dealt blow after blow, stroke after stroke. Better yet, he received wounds uncaring, and with every wound, every stroke, the gods gave him manhood and courage. Surely, after tasting so sweet a thing as courage, he could not ever go back to cowardice. Then the candor in him grew to full stature in these moments. Oh, heaven! Aetion had fallen! Dryas rushed to him, holding over him the shield while he fought. More wounds were here. Then, Pion be praised, Aetion struggled to his feet. Where were they now? Out beyond Delphi, a mile out on the Daulis road. And the Persians, Assyrians, Arabians, Ethiopians in full retreat. Oh, what was Dryas doing now? Struggling, shouting, brandishing his arms in foolish wildness, while Aetion and Nicander adjured him to keep still that all was past. End of chapter 37